Theodoric the Goth, the Barbarian Champion of Civilization, by Thomas Hodgkin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theodoric the Goth by Thomas Hodgkin Preface In the following pages I have endeavoured to portray the life and character of one of the most striking figures in the history of the early Middle Ages, Theodoric the Ostrogoth, the plan of the series for which this volume has been prepared does not admit of minute discussion of the authorities on which the history rests in my case the omission is of the less consequence as i have treated the subject more fully in my larger work italy and her invaders and as also the chief authorities are fully enumerated in that book which is or ought to be in the library of every educated englishman and american gibbon's history of the decline and fall of the roman empire the fifth and sixth centuries do not supply us with many materials for pictorial illustrations and i do not know where to look for authentic and contemporary representations of the civil or military life of theodoric and his subjects we have however a large and interesting store of nearly contemporary works of art at ravenna illustrating the ecclesiastical life of the period and of these the engraver has made considerable use the statue of theodoric at innsbruck a representation of which is included with the illustrations possesses of course no historical value but is interesting as showing how deeply the memory of theodoric's great deeds had impressed itself on the mind of the middle ages and here i will venture on a word of personal reminiscence the figure of theodoric the ostrogoth has been an interesting and attractive one to me from the days of my boyhood i well remember walking with a friend on a little hill then silent and lonely now covered with houses looking down on london and discussing european politics with the earnest interest which young debaters bring to such a theme the time was in those dark days which followed the revolutions of eighteen forty eight when it seemed as if the life of the european nations would be crushed out under the heel of returned and triumphant despotism for italy especially after the defeat of novara there seemed no hope we talked of mazzini cavour garibaldi and discussed the possibility which then seemed so infinitely remote that there might one day be a free and united italy we both agreed that the vision was a beautiful one but was there any hope of it ever becoming a reality my friend thought there was not and argued from the fact of italy's divided condition in the past that she must always be divided in the future i who was on the side of hope felt the weakness of my position and was driven backward through the centuries till at length i took refuge in the reign of theodoric surely under the ostrogothic king italy had been united strong and prosperous my precedent was a remote one but it was admitted and it did a little help my cause since that conversation more than forty years have passed the beautiful land is now united free and mighty and a new generation has arisen which though aware of the fact that she was not always thus has but a faint conception how much blood and how many tears what thousands of broken hearts and broken lives went to the winning of italy's freedom i too with fuller knowledge of her early history am bound to confess that her unity even under theodoric was not so complete as i then imagined it but still as i have more than once stated in the following pages i look upon his reign as a time full of seeds of promise for italy and the world if only those seeds might have had time to germinate and ripen into harvest closer study has only confirmed me in the opinion that the ostrogothic kingdom was one of the great might have beens of history thomas hodgkin newcastle on tyne january twenty fifth eighteen ninety one end of preface introduction to theodoric the goth by thomas hodgkin this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction theodoric the ostrogoth is one of those men who did great deeds and filled a large space in the eyes of their contemporaries but who 
not through their own fault but from the fact that the stage of the world was not yet ready for their appearance have failed to occupy the very first rank among the founders of empires and the moulders of the fortunes of the human race he was born into the world at a time when the roman empire in the west was staggering blindly to ruin under the crushing blows inflicted upon it by two generations of barbarian conquerors that empire had been for more than six centuries indisputably the strongest power in europe and had gathered into its bosom all that was best in the civilization of the nations that were settled round the mediterranean sea rome had given her laws to all these peoples had at any rate in the west made their roads fostered the growth of their cities taught them her language administered justice kept back the barbarians of the frontier and for great spaces of time preserved the roman peace throughout their habitations doubtless there was another side to this picture heavy taxation corrupt judges national aspirations repressed free peasants sinking down into hopeless bondage still it cannot be denied that during a considerable part of its existence the roman empire brought at least to the western half of europe material prosperity and enjoyment of life which it had not known before and which it often looked back to with vain regrets when the great empire had fallen into ruins but now in the middle of the fifth century when theodoric was born amid the rude splendour of an ostrogothic palace the unquestioned ascendancy of rome over the nations of europe was a thing of the past there were still two men one at the old rome by the tiber and the other at the new rome by the bosphorus who called themselves august pious and happy who wore the diadem and the purple shoes of diocletian and professed to be joint lords of the universe before the eastern augustus and his successors there did in truth lie a long future of dominion and once or twice they were to recover no inconsiderable portion of the broad lands which had formerly been the heritage of the roman people but the roman empire at rome was stricken with an incurable malady the three sieges and the final sack of rome by alaric four ten revealed to the world that she was no longer roma invicta and from that time forward every chief of teutonic or sclavonic barbarians who wandered with his tribe over the wasted plains between the danube and the adriatic might cherish the secret hope that he too would one day be drawn in triumph up the capitolian hill through the cowed ranks of the slavish citizens of rome and that he might be lodged on the palatine in one of the sumptuous palaces which had been built long ago for the lords of the world thus there was everywhere unrest and as it were a prolonged moral earthquake the old order of things was destroyed and none could forecast the shape of the new order of things that would succeed to it something similar has been the state of europe ever since the great french revolution only that her barbarians threaten her now from within not from without the social state which had been in existence for centuries and which had come to be accepted as if it were one of the great ordinances of nature is either menaced or is actually broken up and how the new democracy will rearrange itself in the seats of the old civilization the wisest statesman cannot foretell but to any shepherd of his people barbarian or roman who looked with foreseeing eye and understanding heart over the europe of the fifth century the duty of the hour was manifest the great fabric of the roman empire must not be allowed to go to pieces in hopeless ruin if not under roman augusti under barbarian kings bearing one title or another the organization of the empire must be preserved the barbarians who had entered it often it must be confessed merely for plunder were remaining in it to rule and they could not rule by their own unguided instincts their institutions which had answered well enough for a half civilized people leading their simple primitive life in the clearings of the forest of germany were quite unfitted for the complicated relations of the urban and social life of the mediterranean lands there is one passage which has been quoted almost to weariness but which it seems necessary to quote again in order to show how an enlightened barbarian chief looked upon the problem with which he found himself confronted as an invader of the empire atolphus brother-in-law and successor of alaric the first capturer of rome was intimate with a certain citizen of narbonne 
a grave wise and religious person who had served with distinction under theodosius and often remarked to him that in the first ardour of his youth he had longed to obliterate the roman name and turn all the roman lands into an empire which should be and should be called the empire of the goths so that what used to be commonly known as romania should now be gothia and that he atolphus should be in the world what caesar augustus had been but now that he had proved by long experience that the goths on account of their unbridled barbarism could not be induced to obey the laws and yet that on the other hand there must be laws since without them the commonwealth would cease to be a commonwealth he had chosen for his part at any rate that he would seek the glory of renewing and increasing the roman name by the arms of his gothic followers and would be remembered by posterity as the restorer of rome since he could not be its changer this conversation will be found to express the thoughts of theodoric the ostrogoth as well as those of atolphus the visigoth theodoric also in his hot youth was the enemy of the roman name and did his best to overturn the roman state but he too saw that a nobler career was open to him as the preserver of the priceless blessings of roman civilization and he spent his life in the endeavour to induce the goths to copy those laws without which a commonwealth ceases to be a commonwealth in this great and noble design he failed as has already been said because the times were not ripe for it because a continuation of adverse events which we should call persistent ill luck if we did not believe in an overruling providence blighted and blasted his infant state before it had time to root itself firmly in the soil none the less however does theodoric deserve credit for having seen what was the need of the empire and preeminently of italy and for having done his best to supply that need the great work in which he failed was accomplished three centuries later by charles the frank who has won for himself that place in the first rank of world moulders which theodoric has missed but we may fairly say that theodoric's design were as noble and as statesmanlike as those of the great emperor charles and that if they had been crowned with the success which they deserved three centuries of needless barbarism and misery would have been spared to europe End of introduction. Chapter One of Theodoric the Goth by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One Theodoric's Ancestors. Towards the end of the second century of the Christian era, a great confederacy of Teutonic nations occupied those vast plains in the south of Russia, which are now and have been for more than a thousand years the homes of Slavonic peoples these nations were the ostrogoths the visigoths and the gepidae approximately we may say that the ostrogoths or east goths dwelt from the don to the Dnieper, the visigoths or west goths from the Dnieper to the pruth and the gepidae to the north of both in the district which has since been known as little russia these three nations were as has been said teutons and they belonged to that division of the teutonic race which is called low german that is to say that they were more nearly allied to the frisians the dutch and to our own saxon forefathers than they were to the ancestors of the modern swabian barbarian and austrian they worshipped odin and thunor they wrote scanty records of their race in runic characters they were probably chiefly a pastoral folk but may have begun to practice agriculture in the rich cornlands of the ukraine they were essentially a monarchic people following their kings whom they believed to be sprung from the seed of gods loyally to the field and shedding their blood with readiness at their command but their monarchy was of the early teutonic type always more or less limited by the deliberations of the great armed assembly of the nation which in some tribes at least was called the folk mote or the folk thing and there were no strict rules of hereditary succession the crown being elective but limited in practice to the members of one ruling and heaven descended family this family sprung from the seed of gods but ruling by the popular will over the ostrogothic people was known as the family of the amols it is true that the divine and exclusive prerogatives of the family have been somewhat magnified by the minstrels who sang in the courts of their descendants for there are manifest traces of kings ruling over the ostrogothic people who are not included in the amal genealogy still as far as we can peer through the obscurity of the early history of the people 
we may safely say that there was no other family of higher position than the Amals, and that gradually all that consciousness of national life and determination to cherish national unity, which among the Germanic peoples was inseparably connected with the institution of royalty, centred round the race of the divine Amala. The following is the pedigree of this royal clan, as given by the historian of the Goths, and with those epithets which the secretary of Theodoric attached to the names of some of the ancestors of his lord. Gapt, possibly equivalent to Gort, the eponymous hero of the Gothic nation, was the father of Hummel, who was the father of Orgis, who was the father of Amal the Fortunate, who was the father of Hisana the Man of Iron, who was the father of Ostrogotha the Patient, who was the father of Hunawil, who was the father of Athal the Mild, who was the father of Achilf and Odwulf. Achilf was the father of Ancilla, Edilf, Vultwulf, and Hermanric. Hermanric was the father of Hunimund the Beautiful, who was the father of Thorismund the Chaste. Vultwulf was the father of Valaravans, who was the father of Vinithar the Just, who was the father of Vidaric, who was the father of Vandalar, who was the father of Valamir the Faithful, Thudamir the Affectionate, and Vidamir. Thudamir was the father of Theodoric. These fifteen generations, which should carry back the Amal ancestry 450 years, or almost precisely to the Christian era, seem to have marked the utmost limit to which the memory of the Gothic heralds, aided by the songs of the Gothic minstrels, could reach. The forms of many of the names, the initial Vala and Thuda, the terminal Wulf, Mir and Mund, will at once be recognised as purely Teutonic, recalling many similar names in the royal lines of the Franks, the Visigoths and the Vandals and the West Saxons. In the great loosely knit confederacy which has been described as filling the regions of southern Russia in the third and fourth centuries of our era, the predominant power seems to have been held by the Ostrogothic nation. In the third century, when a succession of weak, ephemeral emperors ruled and all but ruined the Roman state, the Goths swarmed forth in their myriads, both by sea and land, to ravage the coast of the Euxine and the Aegean, to cross the passes of the Balkans, to make their desolating presence felt at Ephesus and at Athens. Two great emperors of Illyrian origin, Claudius and Aurelian, succeeded, at a fearful cost of life, in repelling the invasion and driving back the human torrent. But it was impossible to recover from the barbarians Trajan's province of Dacia, which they had overrun, and the emperors wisely compromised the dispute by abandoning to the Goths and their allies all the territory north of the Danube. This abandoned province was chiefly occupied by the Visigoths, the western members of the confederacy, who, for the century from 275 to 375, were the neighbours, generally the allies, by fitful impulses the enemies of Rome. With Constantine the Great especially, the Visigoths came powerfully in contact, first as invaders, then as allies, foderati, bound to furnish a certain number of auxiliaries to serve under the eagles of the empire. Meanwhile, the Ostrogoths, with their faces turned for the time northward instead of southward, were battling daily with the nations of Finnish or Sclavonic stock that dwelt by the upper waters of the Dnieper, the Don, and the Volga, and were extending their dominion over the greater part of what we now call Russia in Europe. The lord of this wide but most loosely compacted kingdom in the middle of the fourth century was a certain Hamanric, whom his flatterers, with some slight knowledge of the names held in the highest repute among their southern neighbours, likened to Alexander the Great for the magnitude of his conquests. However shadowy some of these conquests may appear in the light of modern criticism, there can be little doubt that the Visigoths owned his overlordship, and that when Constantius and Julian were reigning in Constantinople, the greatest name over a wide extent of territory north of the Black Sea was that of Hermanric the Ostrogoth. When this warrior was in extreme old age, a terrible disaster befell his nation and himself. It was probably about the year 374 that a horde of Asiatic savages made their appearance in the southeastern corner of his dominions, having, so it is said, crossed the Sea of Azov in its shallowest part by a ford. These men rode upon little ponies of great speed and endurance, each of which seemed to be incorporated with its rider, 
so perfect was the understanding between the horseman who spent his days and nights in the saddle and the steed which he bestrode little black restless eyes gleamed beneath their low foreheads and matted hair no beard or whisker adorned their uncouth yellow faces the turanian type in its ugliest form was displayed by these mongolian sons of the wilderness they bore a name destined to be of disastrous and yet also indirectly of most beneficent import in the history of the world for these are the true shatterers of the roman empire they were the terrible huns before the impact of this strange and new enemy the empire of hermanric an empire which rested probably rather on the reputation of warlike prowess than on any great inherent strength military or political went down with a terrible crash dissimilar as are the times and the circumstances we are reminded of the collapse of the military systems of austria and prussia under the onset of the ragged jacobins of france shivering and shoeless but full of demonic energy when we read of the humiliating discomfiture of this stately ostrogothic monarchy doubtless possessing an ordered hierarchy of nobles free warriors and slaves by the squalid hard-faring and so to say democratic savages from asia the death of hermanric which was evidently due to the hunnish victory is assigned by the gothic historian to a cause less humiliating to the national vanity the king of the rosomones a perfidious nation had taken the opportunity of the appearance of the savage invaders to renounce his allegiance perhaps to desert his master treacherously on the field of battle the enraged hermanric unable to vent his fury on the king himself caused his wife swanhilda to be torn asunder by wild horses to whom she was tied by the hands and feet her brothers sarus and amius avenged her cruel death by a spear thrust which wounded the aged monarch but did not kill him outright then came the crisis of the invasion of the huns under their king balamba the visigoths who had some cause of complaint against hermanric left him to fight his battle without their aid and the old king in sore pain with his wound and deeply mortified by the incursion of the huns breathed out his life in the one hundred and tenth year of his age all of which is probably a judicious veiling of the fact that the great hermanric was defeated by the hunnish invaders and in his despair laid violent hands on himself the huge and savage horde rolled on over the wide plains of russia the ostrogothic resistance was at an end and soon the invaders were on the banks of the Dniester, threatening the kindred nation of the visigoths antheric judge as he was called of the visigoths a brave old soldier but not a very skilful general was soon outmanoeuvred by these wild nomads from the desert who crossed the rivers by unexpected fords and by rapid night marches turned the flank of his most carefully chosen positions the line of the Dniester was abandoned the line of the proof was lost it was plain that the visigoths like their eastern brethren if they remained in the land must bow their heads beneath the hunnish yoke to avoid so degrading a necessity and if they must lose their independence to lose it to the stately emperors of rome rather than to the chief of a filthy tartar horde the great majority of the visigothic nation flocked southward through the region which is now called wallachia and standing on the northern shore of the danube prayed for admission within the province of mosia and the empire of rome in three seventy six an evil hour for himself valens the then reigning emperor of the east granted this petition and received into his dominions the visigothic fugitives a great and warlike nation without taking any proper precautions on the one hand that they should be disarmed on the other that they should be supplied with food for their present necessities and enabled for the future to become peaceful cultivators of the soil the inevitable result followed before many months had elapsed the visigoths were in arms against the empire and under the leadership of their hereditary chiefs were wandering up and down through the provinces of mosia and thrace wresting from the terror-stricken provincials not only the food which the parsimony of valens had failed to supply them with but the treasures which centuries of peace had stored up in villa and unwalled town in three seventy eight they achieved a brilliant and perhaps unexpected triumph defeating a large army commanded by the roman emperor valens in person in a pitched battle near adrianople valens himself perished on the field of battle and his unburied corpse disappeared among the embers of a thracian hut which had been set fire to by the barbarians that fatal day august the ninth 
378 was admitted to be more disastrous for rome than any which had befallen her since the terrible defeat of cannae and from it we may fitly date the beginning of that long process of dissolution lasting in a certain sense more than a thousand years which we would call the fall of the roman empire in this long tragedy the part of chief actor fell during the first act to the visigothic nation with their doings we have here no special concern it is enough to say that for one generation they remained in the lands south of the danube first warring against rome then by the wise policy of their conqueror theodosius incorporated in her armies under the title of foderati and serving her in the main with zeal and fidelity in 395 a visigothic chief alaric by name of the god-descended seed of balthai was raised upon the shield by the warriors of his tribe and hailed as their king his elevation seems to have been understood as a defiance to the empire and a reassertion of the old national freedom which had prevailed on the other side of the danube at any rate the rest of his life was spent either in hostility to the empire or in a pretence of friendship almost more menacing than hostility he began by invading greece and penetrated far south into the peloponnesus he then took up a position in the province of illyricum probably in the countries now known as bosnia and servia from which he could threaten the eastern or western empire at pleasure finally with the beginning of the fifth century after christ he descended into italy and though at first successful only in ravage in the second invasion he penetrated to the very heart of the empire his three sieges of rome ending in the awful event of the capture and sack of the eternal city in 410 are events in the history of the world with which every student is familiar only it may be remarked that the word awful which is here used designedly is not meant to imply that the loss of life was unusually large or the cruelty of the captors outrageous in both respects alaric and his goths would compare favourably with some generals and some armies making much higher pretensions to civilization nor is it meant that the destruction of public buildings of the city was extensive there can be little doubt that paris on the day after the suppression of the commune in eighteen seventy one presented a far greater appearance of desolation and ruin than rome in four ten when she lay trembling in the hand of alaric but the bare fact that rome herself the roma eternia the roma invicta of a thousand coins of a hundred emperors rome whose name for centuries on the shores of the mediterranean had been synonymous with world-wide dominion should herself be taken sacked dishonoured by the presence of a flaxen-haired barbarian conqueror from the north was one of those events apparently so contrary to the very course of nature itself that the nations which heard the tidings many of them old and bitter enemies of rome now her subjects and her friends held their breath with awe at the terrible recital alaric died shortly after his sack of rome and after a few years of aimless fighting his nation quitted italy disappearing over the northwestern alpine boundary to win for themselves new settlements by the banks of the garonne and the ebro their leader was that atolphus whose truly statesmanlike reflections on the unwisdom of destroying the roman empire and the necessity of incorporating the barbarians with its polity have already been quoted there in the southwestern corner of gaul and the northern regions of spain we must for the present leave the western branch of the great gothic nationality while our narrative returns to its eastern representatives end of chapter one chapter two of theodoric the goth by thomas hodgkin this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the might of attila for eighty years the power of the ostrogoths suffered eclipse under the shadow of hunnish barbarism as to this period we have very little historical information that is of any value we hear of resistance to the hunnish supremacy vainly attempted and sullenly abandoned the son and the grandson of hermanric figure as the shadowy heroes of this vain resistance after the death of the latter king thorismund a strange story is told us of the nation mourning his decease for forty years during all which time they refused to elect any other king to replace him whom they had lost 
there can be little doubt that this legend veils the prosaic fact that the nation depressed and dispirited under the yoke of the conquering huns had not energy or patriotism enough to choose a king since almost invariably among the teutons of that age kingship and national unity flourished or faded together at length towards the middle of the fifth century after christ the darkness is partially dispelled and we find the ostrogothic nation owning the sovereignty of three brothers sprung from the amal race but not direct descendants of hermanric whose names are valamir thudamir and vidamir beautiful it was says the gothic historian to behold the mutual affection of these three brothers when the admirable thudamir served like a common soldier under the orders of valamir when valamir adorned him with the crown at the same time that he conveyed to him his orders when vidamir gladly rendered his services to both of his brothers thudamir the second in this royal brotherhood was the father of our hero theodoric the three ostrogothic brethren kings towards their own countrymen were subjects almost we might say servants of the wide ruling king of the huns who was now no longer one of those forgotten chiefs by whom the conquering tribe had first been led into europe but attila a name of fear to his contemporaries and long remembered in the roman world he with his brother blader mounted the barbarian throne in the year four thirty three and after twelve years the death of blader who was perhaps murdered by the order of his brother left attila sole wielder of the forces which made him the terror of the world he dwelt in rude magnificence in a village not far from the danube and his own special dominions seem to have pretty nearly corresponded with the modern kingdom of hungary but he held in leash a vast confederacy of nations teutonic sclavonic and what we now call turanian whose territories stretched from the rhine to the caucasus and he is said to have made the isles of the ocean which expression probably denotes the islands and peninsulas of scandinavia subject to his sway neither however over the ostrogoths nor over any of the other subject nations included in this vast dominion are we to think of attila's rule as an organized all permeating assimilating influence such as was the rule of a roman emperor it was rather the influence of one great robber chief over his freebooting companions the kings of the ostrogoths and gepidae came at certain times to share the revelries of their lord in his great log palace on the danubian plain they received his orders to put their subjects in array when he would ride forth to war and woe was unto them if they failed to stand by his side on the day of battle but these things being done they probably ruled their own peoples with little interference from their overlord the teutonic members of the confederacy notably the ostrogoths and the kindred tribe of gepidae seem to have exercised upon the court and the councils of attila an influence not unlike that wielded by german statesmen at the court of russia during the last century the huns during their eighty years of contact with europe had lost a little of that utter savageness which they brought with them from the tartar deserts if they were not yet in any sense civilized they could in some degree appreciate the higher civilization of their teutonic subjects a pagan himself with scarcely any religion except some rude cult of the sword of the war god attila seems never to have interfered in the slightest degree with the religious practices of the gepidae or the ostrogoths the large majority of whom were by this time christians holding the Aryan form of faith and not only did he not discourage the finer civilization which he saw prevailing among these german subjects of his but he seems to have had statesmanship enough to value and respect a culture which he did not share and especially to have prized the temperate wisdom of their chiefs when they helped him to array his great host of barbarians for war against the empire from his position in central europe attila like alaric before him was able to threaten either the eastern or the western empire at pleasure for almost ten years four forty to four fifty he seemed to be bent on picking a quarrel with theodosius the second the feeble and unwarlike prince who reigned at constantinople he laid waste the provinces south of the danube with his desolating raids he worried the imperial court with incessant embassies each more exacting and greedy than the last for the favour of the rude hunnish envoy had to be purchased by large gifts from the imperial treasury he himself insisted on the payment of yearly stipendia by the emperor he constantly demanded that these payments should be doubled he openly stated that they were nothing else than tribute and that the roman augustus who paid them was his slave 
These practices were continued until, in the year 450, the gentle Theodosius died. He was succeeded by his sister Pulcheria and her husband Marcion, who soon gave a manlier tone to the councils of the Eastern Empire. Attila marked the change and turned his harassing attentions to the western state, with which he had always a sufficient number of pretexts for war ready for use. In fact, he had made up his mind for war, and no concessions, however humiliating on the part of Valentinian III, the then Emperor of the West, would have availed to stay his progress. Not Italy, however, to some extent protected by the barrier of the Alps, but the rich cities and comparatively unwasted plains of Gaul attracted the royal freebooter. Having summoned his vast and heterogeneous army from every quarter of central and northeastern Europe, and surrounded himself by a crowd of subject kings, the captains of his host, he set forward in the spring of 451 for the lands of the Rhine. The trees which his soldiers felled in the great Hercynian forest of central Germany were fashioned into rude rafts or canoes, on which they crossed the Rhine, and soon the terrible Hun and his horde of many nations' spoilers were passing over the regions which we now call Belgium and Lorraine in a desolating stream. The Huns, not only barbarians, but heathens, seem in this invasion to have been animated by an especial hatred to Christianity. Many a fair church of Gallia Belgica was laid in ashes. Many a priest was slain before the altar, whose sanctity was vain for his protection. The real cruelties thus committed are wildly exaggerated by the mythical fancy of the Middle Ages, and upon the slenderest foundations of historical fact arose stately edifices of fable, like the story of the Cornish princess Ursula, who, with her eleven thousand virgin companions, was fabled to have suffered death at the hands of the Huns in the city of Cologne. The barbarian tide was at length arrested by the strong walls of Orléans, whose stubborn defence saved all that part of Gaul which lies within the protecting curve of the Loire from the horrors of their invasion. At midsummer, Attila and his host were retiring from the untaken city and beginning their retreat towards the Rhine, a retreat which they were not to accomplish unhindered. The extremity of danger from these utterly savage foes had welded together the old empire and the new Gothic kingdom, the civilised and the half-civilised power, in one great confederacy for the defence of all that was worth saving in human society. The tidings of the approach of the Gothic king had hastened the departure of Attila from the environs of Orléans, and, perhaps about a fortnight later, the allied armies of Romans and Goths came up with the retreating Huns in the Catalonian plains, not far from the city of Troyes. The general of the imperial army was Aetius, the general and king of the Visigoths was Theodoric, a namesake of our hero. Both were capable and valiant soldiers. On the other side, conspicuous among the subject kings who formed the staff of Attila were the three Ostrogothic brethren and Adoric, king of the Gepidae. The loyalty of Valamir, the firm grasp with which he kept his master's secrets, and Adoric's resourcefulness in council were especially prized by Attila. And he truly had need of all their help, for, though it is difficult to ascertain with any degree of accuracy the numbers actually engaged, 162,000 are said to have fallen on both sides, it is clear that this was a collision of nations rather than of armies and that it required greater skill than any that the rude Hunnish leader possessed to win the victory for his enormous host. After a battle ruthless, manifold, gigantic, obstinate, such as antiquity never described when she told of warlike deeds, such as no man who missed the sight of that marvel might ever hope to have another chance of beholding, night fell upon the virtually defeated Huns. The Gothic king had lost his life, but Attila had lost the victory. All night long, the Huns kept up a barbarous dissonance to prevent the enemy from attacking them, but their king's thoughts were of suicide. He had prepared a huge funeral pyre, on which, if the enemy next day successfully attacked his camp, he was determined to slay himself amid the kindled flames, in order that neither living nor dead the mighty Attila might fall into the hands of his enemies. These desperate expedients, however, were not required. The death of Theodoric, the caution of Aetius, some jealousy perhaps between the roman and the goth some anxiety on the part of the eldest gothic prince as to the succession to his father's throne all these causes combined to procure for attila a safe but closely watched return into his own land the battle of the catalonian plains 
usually but not quite correctly called the battle of chalons was a memorable event in the history of the gothic race of europe and of the world it was a sad necessity which on this occasion arrayed the two great branches of the gothic people the visigoths under theodoric and the ostrogoths under Wolimir, in fratricidal strife against each other for europe the alliance between roman and goth between the grandson of theodosius emperor of rome and the successor of alaric the besieger of rome was of priceless value and showed that the great and statesmanlike thought of atolphus was ripening in the minds of those who came after him for the world yes even for us in the nineteenth century and for the great undiscovered continents beyond the sea the repulse of the squalid and unprogressive Turanian from the seats of the old historic civilization was essential to the preservation of whatever makes human life worth living had attila conquered on the catalonian plains an endless succession of genghis khans and tamerlanes would probably have swept over the desolated plains of europe paris and florence would have been even as kiva and bokhara and the island of britain would not yet have attained to the degree of civilization reached by the peninsula of korea in the year after the fruitless invasion of gaul attila crossed the julian alps and entered italy intending doubtless to rival the fame of alaric by his capture of rome an operation which would have been attended with infinitely greater ruin to the seven hilled city's pride than any which he had sustained at the hands of the visigothic leader but the huns unskilful in siege work were long detained before the walls of aquileia that great and flourishing frontier city hitherto deemed impregnable which gathered in the wealth of the venetian province and guarded the north-eastern approaches to italy at length by a sudden assault they made themselves masters of the city which they destroyed with utter destruction putting all the inhabitants to the sword and then wrapping in fire and smoke the stately palaces the wharves the mint the forum the theatres of the fourth city of italy the terror of this brutal destruction took from the other cities of venetia all heart for resistance to the terrible invader from concordia altino padua crowds of trembling fugitives walked waded or sailed with their hastily gathered and most precious possessions to the islands surrounded by shallow lagoons which fringed the adriatic coast near the mouths of the brenta and the adige there at torcello burano rialto malamocco and their sister islets they laid the humble foundations of that which was one day to be the gorgeous and wide-ruling republic of venice attila meanwhile marched on through the valley of the po ravaging and plundering but a little slackening in the work of mere destruction as the remembrance of the stubborn defence of aquileia faded from his memory entering milan as conqueror and seeing there a picture representing the emperors of the romans sitting on golden thrones and the scythian barbarians crouching at their feet he sought out a milanese painter and bade the trembling artist represent him attila sitting on the throne and the two roman emperors staggering under sacks full of gold coin which they bore upon their shoulders and pouring out their precious contents at his feet this little incident helps us to understand the next strange act in the drama of attila's invasion to enjoy the luxury of humbling the great empire and of trampling on the pride of her statesmen seems to have been the sweetest pleasure of his life this mere gratification of his pride the pride of an upstart barbarian at the expense of the inheritors of a mighty name and the representatives of venerable traditions was the object which took him into italy rather than any carefully prepared scheme of world-wide conquest accordingly when that august body the senate of rome sent a consul a prefect and more than all a pope the majestic and fitly named leo to plead humbly in the name of the roman people for peace and to promise acquiescence at some future day in the most unreasonable of his demands attila granted the ambassadors an interview by the banks of the mincio listened with haughty tranquillity to their petition allowed himself to be soothed and as it were magnetized by the words and gestures of the venerable pontiff accepted the rich presents which were doubtless laid at his feet and turning his face homewards recrossed the julian alps leaving the apennines untraversed and rome unvisited even in the act of granting peace attila used words which showed that it would be only a truce and that if there were any failure to abide by any one of his conditions he would return and work yet greater mischief to italy than any which he had yet suffered at his hands but he had missed the fateful moment 
and the delight of standing on the conquered palatine and seeing the smoke ascend from the ruined city of the world was never to be his in the year after his invasion of italy he died suddenly at night apparently the victim of the drunken debauch with which the polygamous barbarian had celebrated the latest addition to the numerous company of his wives with attila's death the might of the hunnish empire was broken the great robber camp needed the ascendancy of one strong chief robber to hold it together and that ascendancy no one of the multitudinous sons who emerged from the chambers of his harem was able to exert unable to agree as to the succession of the throne they talked of dividing the hunnish dominions between them and in the discussions which ensued they showed too plainly that they looked upon the subject nations as their slaves to be partitioned as a large house of such domestics would be partitioned among the heirs of their dead master the pride of the teutons was touched and they determined to strike a blow for the recovery of their lost freedom Adaric, king of the Gepidae, so long the trusty counsellor of Attila, was prime mover in the revolt against his sons. A battle was fought by the banks of the river Ndau, between the Huns, with those subject allies who still remained faithful to them, and the revolted nations. Among these revolted nations there can be but little doubt that the Ostrogoths held a high place, though the matter is not so clearly stated as we should have expected by the Gothic historian and even on his showing the glory of the struggle for independence was mainly Adaric's. After a terrible battle, the Gepidae were victorious, and Elac, eldest son of Attila, with, it is said, thirty thousand of his soldiers, lay dead upon the field. He had wrought a great slaughter of his enemies, and so glorious was his end, says Jordanes, that his father might well have envied him his manner of dying. The Battle of Nadau, whatever may have been the share of the ostrogoths in the actual fighting certainly brought them freedom from this time the great hunnish empire was at an end and there was a general resettlement of territory among the nations which had been subject to its yoke while the huns themselves abandoning their former habitations moved for the most part down the danube and became the humble servants of the eastern empire the Gepidae, perhaps marching southward, occupied the great Hungarian plains on the left bank of the Danube, which had been the home of Attila and his Huns, and the Ostrogoths, going westwards, perhaps with some dim notion of following their Visigothic kindred, took up their abode in that which had once been the Roman province of Pannonia, now doubtless known to be hopelessly lost to the empire. Pannonia, the new home of the Ostrogoths, was the name of a region rectangular in shape, about two hundred miles from north to south and one hundred and sixty miles from east to west whose northern and eastern sides were washed by the river danube and whose north-eastern corner was formed by the sudden bend to the south which that river makes a little above budapest this region includes vienna and the eastern part of the archduchy of austria graz and the eastern part of the duchy of styria but is chiefly composed of the great corn-growing plain of western hungary and contains the two considerable lakes of balaton and new sideless sea here then the three ostrogothic brethren took up their abode and of this province they made a kind of rude partition between them while still treating it as one kingdom of which valamir was the head the precise details of this division of territory cannot now be recovered nor are they of much importance as the settlement was of short duration we can only say that valamir and thudemir occupied the two ends of the territory and vidamir dwelt between them what is most interesting to us is the fact that thudemir's territory included lake balaton or platon sea and that his palace may very possibly have stood upon the shores of that noble piece of water which is forty-seven miles in length and varies from three to nine miles in width to the neighbourhood of this lake in the absence of more precise information we may with some probability assign the birthplace and the childish home of theodoric end of chapter two chapter three of theodoric the goth by thomas hodgkin this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three theodoric's boyhood the ostrogoths had yet one or two battles to fight before they were quite rid of their old masters the sons of attila still talked of them as deserters and fugitive slaves 
and a day came when Valamir found himself compelled to face a sudden inroad of the Huns. He had few men with him, and being taken unawares, he had no time to summon his brethren to his aid. But he held his own bravely. The warriors of his nation had time to gather round him, and at last, after he had long wearied the enemy with his defensive tactics, he made a sudden onset, destroyed the greater part of the Hunnish army, and sent the rest scattered in hopeless flight far into the deserts of Scythia. Valamir at once sent tidings of the victory to his brother Thudamir. The messenger arrived at an opportune moment, for on that very day Ereleva, the unwedded wife of Thudamir, had given birth to a man-child. This infant, born on such an auspicious day and looked upon as a pledge of happy fortunes for the Ostrogothic nation, was named Theodorix, the people ruler a name which Latin historians, influenced perhaps by the analogy of Theodosius, changed into Theodoricus, and which will here be spoken of under the well-known form Theodoric. It will be observed that I have spoken of Ereleva as the unwedded wife of Thudomir. The Gothic historian calls her his concubine, but this word of reproach hardly does justice to her position. In many of the Teutonic nations, as among the Norsemen of a later century, there seems to have been a certain laxity as to the marriage rite, which was nevertheless coincident with a high and pure morality. It has been suggested that the severe conditions imposed by the church on divorces may have had something to do with the peculiar marital usages of the Teutonic and Norse chieftains. Reasons of state might require Thudomir the Ostrogoth or William Longsword the Norman to ally himself some day with a powerful king's daughter, and therefore he would not go through the marriage rite with the woman, really and truly his wife, but generally his inferior in social position, who meanwhile governed his house and bore him children. If the separation never came, and the powerful king's daughter never had to be wooed, she who was wife in all but name retained her position unquestioned till her death, and her children succeeded without dispute to the inheritance of their father. The nearest approach to an illustration which the social usages of modern Europe afford is probably furnished by the morganatic marriages of modern German royalties and serenities, and we might say that Theodoric was the offspring of such a union. Notwithstanding the want of strict legitimacy in his position, I do not remember any occasion on which the taunt of bastard birth was thrown in his teeth, even by the bitterest of his foes. It would be satisfactory if we could fix with exactness the great Ostrogoth's birth year, but though several circumstances point to 454 as a probable date, we are not able to define it with greater precision. The next event of which we are informed in the history of the Ostrogothic nation, a war with the Eastern Empire, was one destined to exert a most important influence on the life of the kingly child. The Ostrogoths settling in Pannonia, one of the provinces of the Roman Empire, were in theory allies and auxiliary soldiers of the Emperor. Similar arrangements had been made with the Visigoths in Spain, with the Vandals in that very province of Pannonia, probably with many other barbarian tribes in many other provinces. There was sometimes more, sometimes less, actual truth in the theoretical relations thus established, and it was one which in the nature of things was not likely long to endure, but for the time, so long as the imperial treasury was tolerably full and the barbarian allies tolerably amenable to control, the arrangement suited both parties. In the case before us, the position of the Ostrogoths in Pannonia was legalized by the alliance, and such portions of the political machinery of the empire as might still remain were thereby placed at their disposal. The emperor, on the other hand, was able to boast of a province recovered for the empire which was now guarded by the broadswords of his loyal Ostrogoths against the more savage nations outside, who were ever trying to enter the charmed circle of the Roman state. But, as the Ostrogothic Fodorati were his soldiers, there was evidently a necessity that he must send them pay, and this pay, which was called wages when the empire was strong, and tribute when it was weak, consisted, partly at any rate, of heavy chests of imperial aurei, sent as strenai or new year's presents to the barbarian king and his chief nobles now about the year 461 the emperor leo successor of the brave soldier marcion whether from a special emptiness in the imperial treasury or from some other cause omitted to send the accustomed strenai to the ostrogothic brother kings much disturbed at the failure of the aurei to appear 
they sent envoys to constantinople who returned with tidings which filled the three palaces of pannonia with the clamour of angry men not only were the strenai withheld and likely to be still withheld but there was another goth a low-born pretender not of amal blood who was boasting the title of fodoratus of the empire and enjoying the strenai which ought to come only to amal kings and their nobles this man who was destined to cross the path of our theodoric through many weary years was named like him theodoric and was surnamed strabo the squinter from his devious vision and son of triarius from his parentage he was a brother-in-law or nephew of a certain aspar a successful barbarian who had mounted high in the imperial service and had placed two emperors on the throne it was doubtless through his kinsman's influence that the squinting adventurer had obtained a position in the court of the roman augustus so disproportioned to his birth and so outrageous to every loyal ostrogoth when the news of these insults to the lineage of the amals reached pannonia the three brothers in fury snatched up their arms and laid waste almost the whole province of illyricum then the emperor changed his mind and desired to renew the old friendship he sent an embassy bearing the arrears of the past due strenai those which were then again falling due and a promise that all future strenai should be punctually paid only as a hostage for the observance of peace he desired that theudemir's little son theodoric then just entering his eighth year should be sent to constantinople the fact that this request or demand was made by the ostensibly beaten side may make us doubt whether the humiliation of the empire was so complete as the preceding sentences translated from the words of the gothic historian would lead us to suppose theudemir was reluctant to part with his first-born son even to the great roman emperor but his brother valamir earnestly besought him not to interpose any hindrance to the establishment of a firm peace between the romans and goths he yielded therefore and the little lad carried away by the returning ambassadors to constantinople soon earned the favour of the emperor by his handsome face and his winning ways thus was the young ostrogoth brought from his home in pannonia by the banks of lonely lake balaton to the new rome the busy and stately city by the bosphorus the city which was now more truly than her worn and faded mother by the tiber the lady of kingdoms the mistress of the world of the constantinople which the boyish eyes of theodoric beheld scarcely a vestige now remains for the traveller to gaze upon let us try therefore to find a contemporary description these are the words in which the visit of the gothic chief athanaric to that city about eighty years previously is described by jordanes entering the royal city and marvelling thereat lo now i behold said he what i often heard of without believing the glory of so great a city then turning his eyes this way and that beholding the situation of the city and the concourse of the ships now he marvels at the long perspective of lofty walls then he sees the multitudes of various nations like the wave gushing forth from one fountain which has been fed by diverse springs then he beholds the marshalled ranks of the soldiery a god said he without doubt a god upon earth is the emperor of this realm and whoso lifts his hand against him that man's blood be on his own head still can we behold the situation of the city that unrivalled situation which no map can adequately explain but which the traveller gazes upon from the deck of his vessel as he rounds seraglio point and the sight of which seems to bind together in one two continents of space and twenty-five centuries of time on his right hand asia with her camels on his left europe with her railroads behind him are the sea of marmora and the dardanelles with their memories of lysander and egos potami of hero leander and byron with the throne of xerxes and the tomb of achilles and farther back still the island studded archipelago the true cradle of the greek nation immediately in front of him is the golden horn now bridged and with populous cities on both its banks but the farther shore of which where Perra and galata now stand was probably covered with fields and gardens when theodoric beheld it there also in front of him but a little to the right comes rushing down the impetuous bosphorus that river which is also an arm of the sea lined now with the marble palaces of bankrupt sultans it was once a lonely and desolate strait 
on whose farther shore the hapless io transformed into a heifer sought refuge from her heaven-sent tormentor up through its difficult windings pressed the adventurous mariners of miletus in those early voyages which opened up the euxine to the greeks as the voyage of columbus opened up the atlantic to the spaniards it is impossible now to survey the beautiful panorama without thinking of that great inland sea which as we all know begins but a few miles to the north of the place where we are standing and whose cloudy shores are perhaps concealing in their recesses the future lords of constantinople we look towards that point of the compass and think of sebastopol the great lords of thudomir's court who brought the young theodoric to his new patron may have looked northwards too remembering the sagas about the mighty hermanric who dwelt where now the russians dwell and the fateful march of the terrible huns across the shallows of the sea of azov the great physical features of the scene are of course unchanged but almost everything else how changed by four centuries and a half of ottoman domination the first view of stamboul with its mosques its minarets its latticed houses its stream of manifold life both civilized and barbarous flowing through the streets is delightful to the traveller but if he be more of an archaeologist than an artist and seeks to reproduce before his mind's eye something of the constantinople of the caesars rather than the stamboul of the sultans he will experience a bitter disappointment in finding how little of the former is left he may still see indeed the landward walls of the city and a most interesting historical relic they are they stretch for about four miles from the sea of marmara to the golden horn it is still comparatively speaking all city inside of them all country on the outside there is a double line of walls with towers at frequent intervals some square some octagonal and deep fosses running along beside the walls now in spring often bright green with growing corn these walls and towers seen stretching uphill and down dale are a very notable feature in the landscape and ruinous and dismantled as they are after fourteen centuries of siege of earthquake and of neglect they still help us vividly to imagine what they must have looked like when the young theodoric beheld them little more than ten years after their erection of the gates some six or seven in number two are especially interesting to us the first is the tep capu canon gate or porta sancti romani this was the weakest part of the fortifications of constantinople the heel of achilles as it has been well called and here the last roman emperor of the east constantine palaeologus died bravely in the breach for the cause of christianity and civilization the other gate is the porta aurea a fine triple gateway the central arch of which rests on two corinthian pilasters through this gateway the nearest representative of the capitoline hill at rome the eastern emperors rode in triumphant procession when a new augustus had to be proclaimed or when an enemy of the republic had been defeated it is possible that theodoric may have seen anthemius the emperor whom constantinople gave to rome ride forth through this gate 467 to take possession of the western throne possible too that the great but unsuccessful expedition planned by the joint forces of the east and west against the vandals of africa may have had its ignominious failure hidden from the people for a time by a triumphal procession through the golden gate in the following year 468 this gate is now walled up and tradition says that the order for its closure was given by mohammed the conqueror immediately after his entry into the city through fear of an old turkish prophecy which declared that through this gate the next conquerors should enter constantinople of the palace of the emperor into which the young goth was ushered by the eunuch chamberlain no vestige probably now remains the seraglio has replaced the palatian and is itself now abandoned to loneliness and decay being only the recipient of one annual visit from the sultan when he goes in state to kiss the cloak of mohammed the great mosque of saint sophia on the right is a genuine and glorious monument of imperial constantinople but not of constantinople as theodoric saw it the basilica in which he probably listened with childish bewilderment to many a sermon for or against the decrees of the council of chalcedon was burnt down sixty years after his visit in the great insurrection of the nika and the noble edifice in which ten thousand mussulmans now assemble to listen to the reading of the koran while above them the arabic names of the companions of the prophet replace the mosaics of the evangelists is itself the work of the great emperor justinian the destroyer of the state which theodoric founded 
but almost between the church of saint sophia and the imperial palace lay in old times the great hippodrome centre of the popular life of the capital where the excited multitudes cheered with rapture or howled in execration at the victory of the blue or the green charioteer where many a time the elevation or the deposition of an emperor was accomplished by the acclamations of the same roaring throng of this hippodrome we still have a most interesting memorial in the atmeiden the place of horses which though with diminished area still preserves something of the form of the old racecourse and here to this day are two monuments on which the young hostage may have often gazed wondering at their form and meaning the obelisk of thothmes i already two thousand years old when constantinople was founded was reared in the hippodrome by order of the great emperor theodosius and some of the bar-reliefs on its pedestal still explain to us the mechanical devices by which it was lifted into position while in others theodosius his wife his sons and his colleague sit in solemn state but alas with grievously mutilated countenances near it is a spiral column of bronze which almost till our own day bore three serpents twined together whose heads long ago supported a golden tripod this bronze monument is none other than the votive offering to the temple of apollo at delphi presented by the confederated states of greece to celebrate the victory of plataea the golden tripod was melted down at the time of philip of macedon but the twisted serpents brought by constantine to adorn and hallow his new capital by the bosphorus bore and still bear the names written in archaic characters of all the hellenic states which took part in that great deliverance all these monuments are on the first of the seven hills on which constantinople is built on the second hill stands a strange and blackened pillar which once stood in the middle of the forum of constantine and this too was there in the days of theodoric it is called the burnt column because it has been more than once struck by lightning and is blackened with the smoke of the frequent fires which have consumed the wooden shanties at its base but there it stands as stands a lofty mind worn but unstooping to the baser crowd it was once one hundred and fifty feet high but is now one hundred and fifteen and it consists of six huge cylinders of porphyry one above another whose junction is veiled by sculptured laurel wreaths on its summit stood the statue of constantine with the garb and attributes of the grecian sun-god but having his head surrounded with the nails of the true cross brought from jerusalem to serve instead of the golden rays of far-darting apollo underneath the column was placed and remains probably to this day the palladium that mysterious image of Minever, which aeneas carried from troy to alba longa which his descendants removed to rome and which was now brought by constantine to his new capital so near to its first legendary home to be the pledge of abiding security to the city by the bosphorus these are the chief relics of constantinople in the fifth century which are still visible to the traveller i have described with some little detail the outward appearance of the city and its monuments because these would naturally be the objects which would most attract the attention of a child brought from such far different scenes into the midst of so stately a city but during the ten or eleven years that theodoric remained in honourable captivity at the court of leo while he was growing up from childhood to manhood it cannot be doubted that he gradually learned the deeper lessons which lay below the glory and the glitter of the great city's life and that the knowledge thus acquired in those years which are so powerful in moulding character had a mighty influence on all his subsequent career he saw here for the first time and by degrees he apprehended the results of that state of civilitas which in after years he was to be constantly recommending to his people sprung from a race of hunters and shepherds having slowly learned the arts of agriculture and then perhaps partly unlearned them under the overlordship of the nomad huns the ostrogoths at this time knew nothing of a city life a city was probably in their eyes little else than a hindrance to their freebooting raids a lair of enemies a place behind whose sheltering walls so hard to batter down cowards lurked in order to sally forth at a favourable moment and attack brave men in their rear at best it was a treasure-house which valiant goths if fortune favoured them might sack and plunder but fortune seldom did favour the children of gort in their assaults upon the fenced cities of the empire now however the lad theodoric began to perceive as the man atolphus had perceived before him that the city life upon which all the proverbs and the songs of his countrymen poured contempt had its advantages 
to the new rome came the incessant ships of alexandria bringing corn for the sustenance of her citizens long caravans journeyed over the highlands of asia minor loaded with the spices and jewels of india and the silks of china men of every conceivable asiatic country were drawn by the irresistible attraction of the hoped-for profit to the quays and the fora of byzantium the scattered homesteads of the ostrogothic farmers had no such wonderful power of drawing men over thousands of miles of land and sea to visit them then the bright and varied life of the imperial city could not fail to fill the boy's soul with pleasure and admiration the thrill of excitement in the hippodrome as the two charioteers green and blue rounded the spina neck and neck the tragedies acted in the theatre amid rapturous applause the strange beasts from every part of the roman world that roared and fought in the amphitheatre the delicious idleness of the baths the chattering and bargaining and banter of the forum all this made a day in beautiful constantinople very unlike a day in the solemn and somewhat rude palace by lake balaton as the boy grew to manhood the deep underlying cause of this difference perhaps became clearer to his mind he could see more or less plainly that the soul which held all this marvellous body of civilization together was reverence for law he visited perhaps some of the courts of law he may have seen the illustrious praetorian prefect clothed in imperial purple move majestically to the judgment seat amid the obsequious salutations of the dignified officials who in their various ranks and orders surrounded the hall the costly golden reed case the massive silver inkstand the silver bowl for the petitions of suitors all emblems of his office were placed solemnly before him and the pleadings began practised advocates arose to plead the case of plaintiff or defendant busy shorthand writers took notes of the proceedings at length in calm and measured words the prefect gave his judgment a judgment which was necessarily based on law which had to take account of the sayings of jurisconsults of the stored-up wisdom of twenty generations of men a judgment which notwithstanding the venality which was the curse of the empire was in most instances in accordance with truth and justice how different must theodoric often have thought in after years when he had returned to gothland how different was this settled and orderly procedure from the usage of the barbarians with them the blood feud the wild justice of revenge often prolonged from generation to generation had been long the chief writer of wrongs done and if this was now slowly giving place to judicial trial that trial was probably a coarse and almost lawless proceeding in which the head man of the district with a hundred assessors as ignorant as himself amid the wild cries of the opposed parties roughly fixed the amount of blood money to be paid by a murderer or decided at haphazard often with an obvious reference to the superior force of the command of one or other of the litigants some obscure dispute as to the ownership of a slave or the right to succeed to a dead man's inheritance law carefully thought out systematized and in the main softened and liberalized from generation to generation was the great gift of the roman empire to the world and by her strong and uniform and in the main just administration of this law that empire had kept and in the days of theodoric was still keeping her hold upon a hundred jarring nationalities what hope was there that the german intruders into the lands of the mediterranean could ever vie with this great achievement yet if they could not if it was out of their powers to reform and reinvigorate the shattered state if they could only destroy and not rebuild they would exert no abiding influence on the destinies of europe i do not say that all these thoughts passed at this time through the mind of theodoric but i have no doubt that the germs of them were sown by his residence in constantinople when he returned a young man of eighteen years and of noble presence to the palace of his father he had certainly some conception of what the greeks meant when he heard them talking about politeia some foreshadowing of what he himself would mean when in after days he should speak alike to his goth and roman subjects of the blessings of civilitas End of chapter three chapter four of theodoric the goth by thomas hodgkin this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the southward migration the young theodoric who was now in his nineteenth year 
was sent back by Leo to his father with large presents, and both the recovered son and the tokens of imperial favour brought joy to the heart of the father. There had been some changes in the Ostrogothic kingdom during the boy's absence. There had been vague and purposeless wars with the savage nations around them, Swabians, Sarmatians, Syri, besides one final encounter with their old lords, the Huns. These last, we are told, they had driven forth so hopelessly beaten from their territory that for a century from that time all that was left of the Hunnish nation trembled at the very name of the Goths. But in a battle with another people of far less renown, the barbarous Syri beyond the Danube, Valamir, while cheering on his men to the combat, was thrown from his horse and being pierced by the lances of the enemy was left dead on the field his death it is said was avenged most ruthlessly on the syri and thudomir the brother who was next to him in age became chief king of the ostrogoths scarcely had theodoric returned to his home when without communicating his purpose to his father he distinguished himself by a gallant deed of arms on the southeast of the ostrogothic kingdom in the country which we now call Servia, there reigned at this time a Sclavonic chief called Babai, who was full of pride and self-importance because of a victory which he had lately gained over the forces of the empire. Theodoric had probably heard at Constantinople the other side of this story. On his journey to the northwest he had passed through those regions and marked the pride of the insolent barbarian sympathy with the humiliated empire but far more the young warrior's desire at once to find a foeman worthy of his steel and to win laurels for himself wherewith he might surprise his father drove him into his new enterprise having collected some of his father's guardsmen and those of his people with whom he was personally popular or who were dependent upon him he thus mustered a little army of six thousand men with whom he crossed the danube falling suddenly upon king babai he defeated and slew him took his family prisoners and returned with large booty in slaves and the rude wealth of the barbarian to his surprised but joyful father the result of this expedition was the capture of the important frontier city of singidinum whose site is now occupied by belgrade a city which babai had wrested from the empire but which theodoric whatever may have been his inclination to favour constantinople did not deem it necessary to restore it to his late host this incident of the early manhood of theodoric is a good illustration of the teutonic custom which tacitus describes to us under the name of the comitatus a custom which was therefore at least four centuries old probably far older in the days of theodoric and which lasting on for several centuries longer undoubtedly influenced if it did not actually create the chivalry of the middle ages the custom was so important that it will be better to translate the very words of tacitus concerning it though they occur in one of the best-known passages of the germania the germans transact no business either of a public or private nature except with arms in their hands but it is not the practice for any one to begin the wearing of arms until the state has approved his ability to wield them when that is done in the great council of the nation one of the chiefs perhaps the father or some near relation of the candidate equips the youth with shield and spear this is with them like the toga virilis with us the first dignity bestowed on the young man before this he was looked upon as part of his father's household now he is a member of the state eminently noble birth or great merit on the part of their fathers assigns the dignity of a chief even to very young men they are admitted to the fellowship of other youths stronger than themselves and already tried in war nor do they blush to be seen among the henchmen there is a gradation in rank among the henchmen determined by the judgment of him whom they follow and there is a great emulation among the henchmen who shall have the highest place under the chief and among the chiefs who shall have the most numerous and the bravest henchmen this is their dignity this their strength to be ever surrounded by a band of chosen youths an honour in peace a defence in battle and not only in his own nation but among the surrounding states also each chief's name and glory are spread abroad according to the eminence of his train of henchmen in number and valour chiefs thus distinguished are in request for embassies are enriched with costly presents and often they decide a war by the mere terror of their name 
when they stand on the battlefield it is held a disgraceful thing for the chief to be surpassed in bravery by his henchmen for the henchmen not to equal the valour of their chief now too it will mark a man as infamous and a target for the scorn of men for all the rest of his life if he escapes alive from the battlefield where his chief needed his help to defend him the chief to guard his person to reckon up one's own brave deeds as enhancing his glory this is the henchman's one great oath of fealty the chiefs fight for victory the henchmen for their chief if the state in which they are born should be growing sluggish through ease and a long peace most of the noble young men seek of their own accord those nations which are then waging war both because a quiet life is hateful to these people and because they can more easily distinguish themselves in perilous times nor can they keep together a great train of henchmen except by war and the strong hand for it is from the generosity of their chief that each henchman expects that mighty war-horse which he would bestride that gory and victorious spear which he would brandish banquets too and all the rough but plentiful appliances of the feast are taken as part of the henchman's pay and the means of supplying all this prodigality must be sought by war and rapine you would not so easily persuade them to plough the fields and wait in patience for a year's harvest as to challenge an enemy and earn honourable wounds since to them it always seems a slow and lazy process to accumulate by the sweat of your brow what you might win at once by the shedding of blood these words of tacitus written in the year ninety eight after christ describe with wonderful exactness the state of ostrogothic society in the year four seventy two we are not expressly told of theodoric's assumption of the shield and spear in the great council of the nation but probably this ceremony immediately followed his return from constantinople then we see the gathering together of the band of henchmen the sudden march away from the peaceful land growing torpid through two or three years of warlessness the surprise of the sclavonic king the copious effusion of blood which was the preferred alternative to the sweat of the land tiller the return to the young chief's own land with spoils sufficient to support perhaps for many months the generosity expected by the henchmen there is one point however in which the description of the germans given by tacitus is probably not altogether applicable to the goths of the fifth century and that is their invincible preference for the life of the warrior over that of the agriculturist there are some indications that the germans when tacitus wrote had not long exchanged the nomadic life of a nation of shepherds and herdsmen such as was led by the earlier generations of the israelitish people for the settled life which alone is consistent with the purists of the tiller of the soil hence the roving instinct was still strong within them and this roving instinct easily allied itself with the thirst for battle and the love of the easy gains of the freebooter four centuries however of agriculture and of neighbourhood to the great civilised stable empire of rome had apparently wrought some change in the goths and in many of the other teutonic nations the work of agriculture was not now altogether odious in their eyes they knew something of the joys of the husbandman as well as of the joys of the warrior they began to feel something of that land hunger which is the passion of a young growing industrious people still however the songs of the minstrels the sagas of the bards the fiery impulses of the young princeps surrounded by his comitatus pointed to war as the only occupation worthy of freemen hence we can perceive a double current in the ambitions of these nations which often perplexes the historian now as it evidently then perplexed their mighty neighbour the roman augustus and the generals and lawyers who counselled him in his consistory sometimes the teutonic king is roused by some real or imagined insult the minstrels sing their battle songs the fiery henchmen gather round their chief the barbarian tide rolls over the frontier of the empire it seems as if it must be a duel to the death between civilization and its implacable foes then suddenly he sinks to ashes who was very fire before food not glory seems to be the supreme object of the teuton's ambition he begs for land for seed to sow in it for a legal settlement within the limits of the empire if only these necessary things are granted to him he promises and not without intending to keep his promise to be a peaceable subject yes and a staunch defender of the roman augustus 
had the imperial statesmen truly understood this strange duality of purpose in the minds of their barbarian visitors and had they set themselves loyally and patiently to foster the peaceful agricultural instincts of the teuton haply the roman empire might still be standing as it was the statesmen of the day men of temporary shifts and expedients living only as we say from hand to mouth saw in the changing moods of the germans only the faithlessness of barbarism which they met with the faithlessness of civilization and between the two the empire which no one really wished to destroy was destroyed even such a change it was which now came over the minds of the ostrogothic people there was dearth in pannonia partly perhaps the consequence of the frequent wars with the surrounding nations which had occurred during the twenty years of the ostrogothic settlement but even the cessation of those wars brought with it a loss of income to the warrior class as the gothic historian expresses it from the diminution of the spoils of the neighbouring nations the goths began to lack food and clothing and to those men to whom war had long furnished all their sustenance peace began to be odious and all the goths with loud shouts approached their king thudomir praying him to lead his army whither he would but lead it forth to war here again it can hardly be doubted that jordanes writing about the fifth century describes for us the same state of things as tacitus writing about the first and that this loudly shouted demand of the people for war was expressed in one of those national assemblies the folk motes or folk things of anglo-saxon and german history which formed such a real limitation to the power of the early teutonic kings concerning smaller matters says tacitus the chiefs deliberate concerning greater matters the whole nation but in such wise that even those things which are in the power of the commonalty are discussed in detail by the chiefs they come together unless any sudden and accidental emergency have arisen on fixed days determined by the new or full moon for these times they deem the most fortunate for the transaction of business an ill consequence flowing from their freedom is their want of punctuality in assembling often two or three days are spent in waiting for the loiterers when the crowd chooses they sit down arrayed in their armour and commence business silence is called for by the priests who have then the power even of keeping order by force then the king or one of the chiefs begins to speak and is listened to in right either of his age or his noble birth or his glory in the wars or his eloquence in any case he rather persuades rather than commands not power but weight of character procures the assent of his hearers if they mislike his sentiments they express their contempt for them by groans if they approve they clash their spears together applause thus expressed by arms is the greatest tribute that can be paid to a speaker before such an assembly of the nation in arms the question not of peace or war but of war with whom was debated it was decided that the empire should be the victim and that east and west alike should feel the heavy hand of the ostrogoths the lot was cast so said the national legend and it assigned to thudomir the harder but as it seemed more profitable task of warring against constantinople while his younger brother vidomir was to attack rome of vidomir's movements there is little to tell he died in italy not having apparently achieved any brilliant exploits and his son and namesake was easily persuaded to turn aside into gaul where he joined forces to those of the kindred visigoths and became absorbed in their flourishing kingdom this branch of the amal royalty henceforward bears no fruit in history more important at any rate in its ultimate consequences was the march of thudomir and his people into the dominions of the eastern caesar they crossed the save and by their warlike array terrified into acquiescence the sclavonic tribes which were settled in the neighbourhood of belgrade having pushed up the valley of the morava they captured the important city of nisus now niche the first city of illyricum here thudomir tarried for a space sending on his son with a large and eager comitatus farther up the valley of the morava they reached the head of that valley they crossed the watershed and the plain of Kosova and descended into the valley of the Vardar. Monastir in Macedonia, Larissa in Thessaly were taken and sacked, and a way having thus been made by these bold invaders into the heart of the empire, a message was sent to Thudomir inviting him to undertake the siege of Thessalonica. Leaving a few guards in Nisus, 
the old king moved southward with the bulk of his army and was soon standing with his men before the walls of the macedonian capital the patrician hilarianus held that city with a strong force but when he saw it regularly invested by the goths and an earthen rampart drawn all around it he lost heart and despairing of a successful resistance opened negotiations with the besiegers the result of these negotiations accompanied by handsome presents to the king was that thudomir abandoned the siege resumed the often adopted perhaps never wholly abandoned position of a foderatus or sworn auxiliary of the empire and received for himself and his people the unquestioned possession of six towns and the surrounding country by the northeast corner of the aegean where the vardar discharges itself into the thermaic gulf thus ingloriously thus unprofitably ended the expedition into romania which had been proposed amid such enthusiastic applause at the great council of the nation and pressed with such loud acclamations and such brandishing of defiant spears upon the perhaps reluctant thudomir the ostrogoths in four seventy two were an independent people practically supreme in pannonia those broad lands on the south and west of the danube rich in corn and wine the very kernel of the austrian monarchy of to-day were theirs in absolute possession any tie of nominal dependence which attached pannonia to the empire was so merely theoretical now that the hun had ruled and ravaged it for a good part of a century that it was not worth taking into consideration it was in fact rather an excuse for claiming stipendia from the emperor than a bond of real vassalage but now in four seventy four this great and proud nation crowded into a few cities of macedonia with obedient subjects of the empire all around them had practically no choice between the life of peaceful provincials on the one hand and that of freebooters on the other if they accepted the first they would lose year by year something of their old national character the teutonic speech the teutonic customs would gradually disappear and in one or two generations they would be scarcely distinguishable from any of the other oppressed patient tax exhausted populations of the great and weary empire on the other hand if they accepted which in fact they seem to have done the other alternative and became a mere horde of plunderers wandering up and down through the empire seeking what they might destroy they abandoned the hope of forming a settled and stable monarchy and doing injustice to the high qualities and capacities for civilization which were in them they would sink lower into the depths of barbarism and becoming like the hun like the hun they would one day perish certainly so far the tumultuous decision of the parliament on the shores of lake pelso was a false step in the nation's history End of chapter four Chapter 5 of Theodoric the Goth by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Storm and Stress. The imagination of a boy is healthy, and the mature imagination of a man is healthy, but there is a space of life between in which the soul is in a ferment, the character undecided, the way of life uncertain, the ambition thick sighted keats preface to endymion the sentence thus written by the sensitive young poet a child of london of the nineteenth century was eminently exemplified in the history of the martial chief of the ostrogoths the next fourteen years in the life of theodoric which will be described in this chapter were years of much useless endeavour of marches and countermarches of alliances formed and broken of vain animosities and vainer reconciliations years in which theodoric himself seems never to understand his own purpose whether it shall be under the shadow of the empire or upon the ruins of the empire that he will build up his throne take the map of what is now often called the balkan peninsula the region in which those fourteen years were passed look at the apparently purposeless way in which the mountain ranges of hymus rhodope and scardus cross intersect run parallel approach avoid one another look at the strange entanglement of passes and watersheds and tablelands which their systems display to us even such as the ranges among which he was manoeuvring perplexed purposeless and sterile was the early manhood of theodoric about four seventy four soon after the great southward migration 
Thudomir died at Cyrus in Macedonia, one of the new settlements of the Ostrogoths. When he was attacked by his fatal sickness, he called his people together and pointed to Theodoric as the heir of his royal dignity. Kingship, at this time among the Germanic nations, was not purely hereditary, the consent of the people being required even in the most ordinary and natural cases of succession, such as that of a first-born son, full-grown and a tried soldier, succeeding to an aged father. In such cases, however, that consent was almost invariably given. Theodoric, at any rate, succeeded without disputes to the doubtful and precarious position of king of the Ostrogoths. Almost at the same time, a change was being made by death in the wearer of the imperial diadem. In order to illustrate the widely different character of the Roman and the Gothic monarchies, it will be well to cease for a little time to follow the fortunes of Theodoric and to sketch the history of Leo, the dying emperor, and of Zeno, who succeeded him. Leo I, who reigned at Constantinople from 457 to 474, and who was therefore emperor during the whole time that Theodoric dwelt there as a hostage, was not, as far as we can ascertain, a man of any great abilities in peace or war, or originally of very exalted station. But he was curator or steward in the household of Aspar, the successful barbarian adventurer who has been already alluded to. As an Arian by religion and a barbarian, or the son of a barbarian by birth, Aspar could not himself assume the diadem, but he could give it to whom he would, and Leo the steward was the second of his dependents whom he had thus honoured. Once placed upon the throne, however, Leo showed himself less obsequious to his old master than was expected. The post of prefect of the city became vacant. Aspar suggested for the office a man who, like himself, was tainted with the heresy of Arius. At the moment Leo promised acquiescence, but immediately repented, and in the dead of night privately conferred the important office on a senator who professed the orthodox faith. Aspar, in a rage, laid a rough hand on the imperial purple, saying to Leo, Emperor, it is not fitting that one who wears this robe should tell lies. Leo answered, with some spirit, neither is it fitting that an emperor should be bound to do the bidding of any of his subjects and so injure the state. After this encounter, there were thirteen years of feud between kingmaker and king, between Aspar and Leo. At length, in 471, Aspar and his three valiant sons fell by the swords of the eunuchs of the palace. The foul and cowardly deed was perhaps marked by some circumstances of especial cruelty, which earned for Leo the title by which he was long after remembered in Constantinople, the Butcher. In order to strengthen himself against the adherents of Aspar, Leo cultivated the friendship of a set of wild, uncouth mountaineers, who at this time played the same part in Constantinople which the Swiss of the Middle Ages played in Italy. These were the Isaurians, men from the rugged highlands of Pisidia, whose lives had hitherto been chiefly spent either in robbing or in defending themselves from robbery. At their head was a man named Taras Icodissa, probably well-born, if a chieftain from the Isaurian highlands could be deemed to be well-born by the contemptuous citizens of Constantinople. No soldier, for we are told that even the picture of a battle frightened him, but a man whom the other Isaurians seem to have followed with clannish loyalty, like that which the Scottish Camerons showed even to the wily and unwarlike master of Levat. With Taras Icodissa, therefore, the Emperor Leo entered into a compact of mutual defence. The Isaurian dropped his uncouth name and assumed the classical and philosophical sounding name of Zeno. He received the hand of Ariadne, daughter of the Emperor, in marriage and as Leo had no male offspring, the little Leo, offspring of this marriage, and therefore grandson of the aged emperor, was, in this monarchy which from elective was ever becoming more strictly hereditary, generally accepted as his probable successor. As it had been planned, so it came to pass. Leo the Butcher died, 3rd of February, 474. The younger Leo, a child of seven years old, was hailed by senate and people as his successor. 
Zeno came at the head of a brilliant train of senators, soldiers, and magistrates to adore the new emperor, and the child, carefully instructed by his mother in the part which he had to play, placed on the bowed head of his father the imperial diadem. This act of association, as it was called, generally practised upon a son or nephew by a veteran emperor anxious to be relieved from some of the cares of reigning, required to be ratified by the acclamations of the soldiery. But no doubt these acclamations, which could generally be purchased by a sufficiently liberal donative, were not wanting on this occasion. Zeno, otherwise called Tarasicodissa the Isaurian, was now emperor, and nine months after, when his child partner died, he became sole ruler of the Roman world, except in so far as his dignity might be considered to be shared by the phantom emperors of the West, who at this time were dethroning and being dethroned with fatal rapidity at Rome and Ravenna. Thus mean and devious were the paths by which an adventurer could climb in the fifth century to that which was still looked upon as the pinnacle of earthly greatness. For however unworthy a man might feel himself to be, and however unworthy all his subjects might know him to be of the highest place in the empire, when once he had obtained it, his power was absolute, and the honours rendered to him were little less than divine. All laws were passed by his sacred providence, all officers, military and civil, received their authority from him. In the edicts which he put forth to the world, he spoke of himself as, My eternity, my mildness, my magnificence and of course these expressions, or, if it were possible, expressions more adulatory than these, were used by his subjects when they laid their petitions at the footstool of the sacred throne. He lived, withdrawn from vulgar eyes, in the innermost recesses of the palace, a sort of holy of holies behind the first and the second veil. A band of pages, in splendid dress, waited upon his bidding, thirty stately silentiarii, with helmets and brightly burnished cuirasses, marched backwards and forwards before the second veil, to see that no importunate petitioner disturbed the silence of the sacred cubicle. On the comparatively rare occasions when he showed himself to his subjects, he wore upon his head the diadem, a band of white linen in which blazed the most precious jewels of the empire. Hung round his shoulders and reaching down to his feet was that precious purple robe for the sake of which so many crimes were committed and which often proved itself a very garment of Nessus to him who dared to assume it without force sufficient to render his usurpation legitimate. On the feet of the emperor were buskins which, like the diadem, were studded with precious stones and, like the robe, were dyed with the imperial purple. Thus gorgeously arrayed, he took his place in the podium, the royal box in the amphitheatre, and from thence, while gazed upon by his subjects, gazed himself upon the savage beast fight, or in the hippodrome, with difficulty restraining his eagerness for the success of the blue or the green faction, gave the sign for the chariot races to begin or he sat surrounded by his court in the purple presence chamber to consult upon public affairs with his consistory, a sort of privy council composed of the great ministers of state. Conspicuous among these were the fifteen officers of highest rank, generals, judges, grand chamberlains, finance ministers, who had each the right to be addressed as illustrious. When any subject of the emperor, were it one of these illustrious ones himself, were it the son or brother of his predecessor, were it even a former patron, like Aspar, by whose favour he had been selected to wear the purple, was admitted to an audience of Augustus, that great name went as of right with the diadem. The etiquette of the court required that he should not merely bow nor kneel, but absolutely prostrate himself before the sacred majesty of the emperor, who, if in a gracious mood, then with outstretched hand raised him from the earth and permitted him to kiss his knee or the fringe of his imperial mantle. To this dizzy height of greatness, for such, however small, Marcion or Leo or Zeno may now seem to us by the lapse of centuries, it was felt to be by the contemporary generations. It was possible under the singular combination of election and inheritance which regulated the succession to the throne for almost any citizen of the empire, if not of barbarian blood or heretical creed, to aspire. Diocletian, the second founder of the empire, was the son of a slave. 
Justinian, an even greater name, was the nephew of a Macedonian peasant who with a sheepskin bag containing a week's store of biscuit, his only property, tramped down from his native highlands to seek his fortune in the capital. Zeno, as we have seen, though perhaps better born than either Diocletian or Justinian, was only a little Isaurian chieftain. Thus the possibilities open to aspiring ambition were great in the empire of the Caesars. As any male citizen of the United States, born between the St. Lawrence and the Rio Grande, may one day be installed in the White House as president, so any Roman and orthodox inhabitant of the empire, whether noble, citizen or peasant, might flatter himself with the hope that he too should one day wear the purple of Diocletian, be saluted as Augustus, and see prefects and masters of the soldiery prostrating themselves before his eternity. This was, in a sense, the better, the democratic side of the Roman monarchy. Power which was supposed to be conveyed by the will of the people, as expressed by the acclamations of the army, might be wielded by the arm of any member of that people. On the other hand, there was an evil in the habit thus engendered in men's minds, of humbling themselves before mere power without regard to the manner of its acquirement. When we compare the polity of Rome or Constantinople, where a century was a long time for the duration of a dynasty, with the far simpler polities of the Teutonic tribes which invaded the empire, almost all of whom had their royal houses, reaching back into and even beyond the dawn of national history, supposed to be sprung from the loins of the gods, and rendered illustrious by countless deeds of valour recorded in song or saga, we see at once that in these ruder states we are in presence of a principle which the empire knew not, but which medieval Europe knew and glorified, the principle of loyalty. This principle, the same that bound Bayard to the Valois and Montrose to the Stuart, has been, with all the follies and even crimes which it may have caused, an element of strength and cohesion in the states which have arisen on the ruins of the Roman Empire. The self-respecting but loving loyalty with which the Englishman of today cherishes the name of the descendant of Kerdic, of Alfred, and of Edward Plantagenet, who wields the sceptre of his country, is utterly unlike the slavish homage offered by the adoring courtiers of Byzantium to the pinchbeck divinity of Zeno Tarasicodissa. Raised as Zeno had been to the throne by a mere palace intrigue, and destitute as he was of any of the qualities of a great statesman or general, it is no wonder that his reign, which lasted for seventeen years, was continually disturbed by conspiracies and rebellions. In most of these rebellions his mother-in-law, Verena, widow of Leo, an ambitious and turbulent woman, played an important part. It was only a year after Zeno's accession to sole power by the death of his son, November 475, when he was surprised by the outbreak of a conspiracy hatched by his mother-in-law, the object of which was to place her brother Basiliscus on the throne. Zeno fled by night, still wearing the imperial robes which he had worn, sitting in the Hippodrome when the tidings reached him, and crossing the Bosphorus, was soon in the heart of Asia Minor, safe sheltered in his native Isauria. From thence, July 477, after nearly two years of exile, he was, by a strange turn of the wheel of fortune, restored to his throne. Religious bigotry, for Basiliscus did not belong to the party of strict orthodoxy, and domestic jealousies and perfidies all contributed to this result. Zeno, who had fled twenty months before from the Hippodrome, returned to the amphitheatre, and there, having commanded that the linen curtain should be drawn over the circus to exclude the two piercing rays of the July sun, gave the signal for the games to begin, while the populace shouted in Latin the regular official congratulations on his elevation and prayers for his continued triumph. Meanwhile, his fallen rival, less fortunate than Zeno himself in planning an escape, was crouching in the baptistery of the great church of St. Sophia, whither with his wife and children he had fled for refuge. After all the emblems of imperial dignity had been rudely stripped from them, Basiliscus was induced, by a promise from Zeno that their heads should be safe, to come forth with his family from the sacred asylum. The emperor kept the word of promise to the ear, since no executioner with drawn sword entered the chamber of his rival. Basiliscus and they that were with him were sent away to a remote fortress in Cappadocia. 
the gate of the fortress was built up a band of wild isaurians guarded the enclosure suffering no man to enter or to leave it and in that bleak stronghold before long the fallen emperor and empress with their children perished miserably of cold and hunger theodoric who was at this time settled with his people not on the shores of the aegean but in the region which we now call the Dobrutia, between the mouths of the danube and the black sea had zealously espoused the cause of the banished zeno and lent an effectual hand in the counter-revolution which restored him to the throne for his services in this crisis he was rewarded with the dignities of patrician and master of the soldiery high honours for a barbarian of twenty-four and probably about this time he was also adopted as filius in arma by the emperor what the precise nature of this adopted sonship in arms may have been we are not able to say it reminds us of the barbarian customs which in the course of centuries ripened into the medieval ceremony of knighthood and the whole transaction certainly sounds more ostrogothic than imperial zeno's own son and namesake the offspring of a first marriage before his union with ariadne was apparently dead before this time and possibly therefore the title of son thus conferred upon theodoric may have raised in his heart wild hopes that he too might one day be saluted as roman emperor any such hopes were probably doomed to inevitable disappointment any other dignity in the state the roman republic as it still called itself was practically within reach of a powerful barbarian but the diadem as has already been said could in this age of the world only be worn by one of pure roman that is non-barbarian blood at this time and for the next three years the position of our theodoric both towards the emperor and towards his own people was sorely embarrassed by the position and the claims of the other the squinting theodoric son of triarius whom we met with seventeen years ago and whose receipt of stipendia from the court of constantinople at the very time when their own were withheld raised the wrath of Volumir and Thudomir. This Theodoric, it will be remembered, was of unkingly, perhaps quite ignoble birth, had risen to greatness by clinging to the skirts of Aspar, and had, so far as the emperor's favour was concerned, fallen with his fall. Shortly before the death of Leo he had appeared in arms against the empire, taking one city and besieging another, and had forced the emperor to concede to him high rank in the army, that of general of the household troops a subsidy of eighty thousand pounds a year for himself and his people and lastly a remarkable stipulation that he should be absolute ruler of the goths and that the emperor should not receive any of them who were minded to revolt from him this strange article of the treaty shows us on the one hand how thoroughly fictitious and illegitimate was this theodoric's claim to kinship since assuredly neither alaric nor atolphus nor thudomir nor any of the genuine kings of the goths ever needed to bolster up their authority over their subjects by any such figment of an imperial concession and on the other hand as it coincides in date with the time of thudomir's and his theodoric's entrance into the empire it shows us the distracting influences to which a large number of the gothic settlers south of the danube settled there before thudomir's migration were exposed by that event there can be little doubt that the goths who were minded to revolt from the son of triarius and who were not to be received into favour by the emperor were ostrogoths still dimly conscious of the old tie which bound them to the glorious house of amala and more than half disposed to forsake the service of their squinting upstart chief in order to follow the banners of the young hero son of thudomir then came the death of leo zeno's accession and the insurrection of basiliscus in which the son of triarius took part against the isaurian emperor soon after this insurrection was ended and zeno was restored to his precarious throne there came an embassy from the foderati as they called themselves that is from the unattached goths who followed the triarian standard begging zeno to be reconciled to their lord and hinting that he was a truer friend to the empire than the petted and pampered son of thudomir after a consultation with the senate and people of rome in other words with the nobles of constantinople and the troops of the household zeno decided that to take both the theodorics into his pay would be too heavy a charge on the treasury that there was no reason for breaking with the young amal his ally 
and therefore that the request of his rival must be refused. Open war followed, consisting chiefly of devastating raids by the son of Triarius into the valleys of Mosia and Thrace. A message was sent to Theodoric the Amal, who was quietly dwelling with his people by the Danube. Why are you lingering in your home? Come forth and do great deeds worthy of a master of Roman soldiery. But if I take the field against the son of Triarius, was the answer, I fear that you will make peace with him behind my back. The emperor and senate bound themselves by solemn oaths that he should never be received back into favour, and an elaborate plan of campaign was arranged, according to which the Amal, marching with his host from Marcianople, Shumla, was to be met by one general with twelve thousand troops on the southern side of the Balkans, and by another with thirty thousand in the valley of the Hebrus, Maritza. But the Roman Empire, in its feeble and flaccid old age, seemed to have lost all capacity for making war. Theodoric the Amal performed his share of the compact, but when, with his weary army, encumbered with many women and children, he emerged from the passes of the Balkans, he found no imperial generals there to meet him, but instead Theodoric the Squinter, with a large army of Goths, encamped on an inaccessible hill. Neither chief gave the signal for combat. Perhaps both were restrained by a reluctance to urge the fratricidal strife, but there were daily skirmishes between the light-armoured horsemen at the foraging grounds and places for watering. Every day, too, the son of Triarius rode round the hostile camp, shouting forth reproaches against his rival, calling him a perjured boy, a madman, a traitor to his race, a fool who could not see whither the imperial plans were tending. The Romans would stand by and look quietly on while Goth wore out Goth in deadly strife. Murmurs from the Amal's troops showed that these words struck home. Next day, the son of Triarius climbed a hill overlooking the camp and again raised his voice in bitter defiance. Scoundrel, why are you leading so many of my kinsmen to destruction? Why have you made so many Gothic wives widows? What has become of that wealth and plenty which they had when they first took service with you? Then they had two or three horses apiece. Now, without horses and in the guise of slaves, they are wandering on foot through Thrace. But they are free-born men, surely, I, as free-born as you are, and they once measured out the gold coins of Byzantium with a bushel. When the host heard these words, all, both men and women, went to their leader Theodoric the Amal, and claimed from him with tumultuous cries that he should come to an accommodation with the son of Triarius. The proposal must have been hateful to the Amal. To throw away the laborious earned favour of the emperor, to denude himself of the splendid dignity of master of the soldiery, to leave the comfortable home-like fabric of imperial civilization and go out again into the barbarian wilderness with this insolent namesake who had just been denouncing him as a perjured boy, all this was gall and wormwood to the spirit of Theodoric. But he knew the conditions under which he held his sovereignty. King, as a recent French monarch expressed it, by the grace of God and the will of the people, and he did not attempt to strive against the decision of his tumultuary parliament. He met his elderly competitor, each standing on the opposite bank of a disparting stream, and after speech had, they agreed that they would wage no more war on one another, but would make common cause against Byzantium. The now confederated Theodorics sent an embassy to Zeno, bearing their common demands for territory, stipendia, and rations for their followers, and, in the case of Theodoric the Amal, charged with bitter complaints of the desertion which had exposed him to such dangers. The emperor replied with an accusation, which appears to have been wholly unfounded, that Theodoric himself had mediated treachery, and that this was the reason why the Roman generals had feared to join their forces to his. Still, the emperor was willing to receive him again into favour if he would relinquish his alliance with the son of Triarius, and in order to lure him back, the ambassadors were to offer him one thousand pounds weight of gold, forty thousand pounds, ten thousand of silver, thirty-five thousand pounds, a yearly revenue of ten thousand aurei, six thousand pounds, and the daughter of Olibrius, one of the noblest-born damsels of Byzantium, for his wife. But the Amal king, 
having stooped so low as to make an alliance with the son of Triarius, was not going to stoop lower by breaking it. The ambassadors returned to Constantinople with their purpose unaccomplished, and Zeno began seriously to prepare for the apparently inevitable war with all the Gothic foderati in his land, commanded by both the Theodorics. He summoned to the capital all the troops whom he could muster, and delivered to them a spirited oration, in which he exhorted them to be of good courage, declaring that he himself would go forth with them to war, and would share all their hardships and dangers. For nearly a hundred years, ever since the time of the great Theodosius, no eastern emperor had apparently conducted a campaign in person, and the announcement that this inactivity was to be ended, and that a Roman imperator was again, like the imperators of old time, to march with the legions and to withstand the shock of battle, roused the soldiers into extraordinary enthusiasm. The very men who, a little while before, had been bribing the officers to procure exemption from service, now offered larger sums of money in order to obtain an opportunity of distinguishing themselves under the eyes of the emperor. They pressed forward past the long wall which, at about sixty miles from Constantinople, crossed the narrow peninsula and defended the capital of the empire. They caught some of the forerunners of the Gothic host, the Ulans, if we may call them so, of Theodoric. Everything foreboded an encounter more serious and perhaps more triumphant than any that had been seen since the days of Theodosius. Then, as in a moment, all was changed. Zeno's old spirit of sloth and cowardice returned. He would not undergo the fatigue of the long marches through Thrace. He would not look upon the battlefield, the very pictures of which he found so terrible it was publicly announced that the emperor would not go forth to war the soldiers enraged began to gather in angry groups rebuking one another for their over patience in submitting to be ruled by such a coward how are we men and have we swords in our hands and shall we any longer bear with such disgraceful effeminacy by which the might of this great empire is sapped so that every barbarian who chooses may carve out a slice from it these clamours were rapidly growing seditious, and in a few days an anti-emperor would probably have been proclaimed. But Zeno, more afraid of his soldiers than even of the Goths, adroitly moved them into their widely scattered winter quarters, leaving the invaded provinces to take care of themselves for a little time, while he tried by his own natural weapons of bribery and intrigue to detach the other and older Theodoric from the new confederacy on this path he met with unmerited success the son of triarius who had lately been uttering such noble sentiments about gothic kinship and the folly of gothic warriors playing into the hands of their hereditary enemies the crafty courtiers of constantinople soon came to terms with the emperor and on receiving the command of two brigades of household troops his restoration to all the dignities which he had held under basiliscus the military office which his rival had forfeited and rations and allowances for thirteen thousand of his followers broke his alliance with theodoric the amal and entered the service of the emperor of new rome theodoric the amal who was now in his own despite an outlaw from the roman state burst in fierce wrath into macedonia into the region where he and his people had been first quartered five years before again he marched down the valley of the vardar he took Stobi, putting its garrison to the sword, and threatened the great city of Thessalonica. The citizens, fearing that Zeno would abandon them to the barbarians, broke out into open sedition, threw down the statues of the emperor, took the keys of the city from the prefect, and entrusted them to the safer keeping of their bishop. Zeno sent ambassadors reproaching the Amal for his ungrateful requital of the unexampled favours and dignities which had been conferred upon him, and inviting him to return to his old fidelity. Theodoric showed himself not unwilling to treat, sent ambassadors to Constantinople, and ordered his troops to refrain from murder and conflagration, and to take only the absolute necessaries of life from the provincials. He then quitted the precincts of Thessalonica, and moved westward to the city of Heraclea, Monastir, which lies at the foot of the great mountain range that separates Macedonia from Epirus. While talking of peace, he was already mediating a new and brilliant stroke of strategy, but he was for some time hindered from accomplishing it by the illness of his sister, 
who perhaps fatigued by the hardships of the march had fallen sick in the camp before heraclea this time of enforced delay was occupied by negotiations with the emperor but the emperor had really nothing to offer worth the ostrogoth's acceptance a settlement on the pantalian plain a bleak upland among the balkans about forty miles south of sardica sophia and a payment of two hundred pounds weight of gold eight thousand pounds as subsistence money for the people till they should have had time to till the land and reap their first harvest this was all that zeno offered to the chief who already in imagination saw the rich cities of the adriatic lying defenceless at his feet for during this time of inaction the amal had opened communications with a gothic landowner named sigismund who dwelt near dyrrachium durazzo and was a man of influence in the province of epirus and sigismund though nominally a loyal subject of the emperor was doing his best to sow fear and discouragement in the hearts of the citizens of dyrrachium and to prepare the way for the advent of his countrymen at length the gothic princess died and her brother the amal having vainly sought to put heraclea to ransom the citizens had retired to a strong fortress which commanded it burned the deserted city a deed more worthy of a barbarian than of one bred up in the roman commonwealth then with all his nation army he started off upon the great ignatian way which threading the rough passes of mount scardus leads from macedonia to epirus from the shores of the aegean to the shores of the adriatic his light horsemen went first to reconnoitre the path then followed theodoric himself with the first division of his army soas his second in command ordered the movements of the middle host last of all came the rear guard commanded by theodoric's brother thudimund and protecting the march of the women the cattle and the wagons it was a striking proof both of their leader's audacity and of his knowledge of the decay of martial spirit among the various garrisons that lined the ignatian way that he should have ventured with such a train into such a perilous country where at every turn were narrow defiles which a few brave men might have held against an army the amal and his host passed safely through the defiles of scardus and reached the fortress of lychidnus overlooking a lake now known as lake ocrida here theodoric met with his first repulse the fortress was immensely strong by nature was well stored with corn and had springing fountains of its own and the garrison were therefore not to be frightened into surrender accordingly leaving the fortress untaken theodoric with his first two divisions pushed rapidly across the second and lower range the candavian mountains leaving thudimund with the wagons and the women to follow more slowly in this arrangement there was probably an error of judgment which theodoric had occasion bitterly to regret for the moment however he was completely successful descending into the plain he took the towns of scampi elbasan and dyrrachium durazzo both of which probably owing to the discouraging counsels of sigismund seem to have been abandoned by their inhabitants great was the consternation at edessa a town about thirty miles west of thessalonica and the headquarters of the imperial troops when the news of this unexpected march of theodoric across the mountains was brought into the camp not only the general-in-chief sabinianus was quartered there but also a certain adamantius an official of the highest rank who had been charged by zeno with the conduct of the negotiations with theodoric and whose whole soul seems to have been set on the success of his mission he contrived to communicate with theodoric and advanced with sabinianus through the mountains as far as lychidnus in order to conduct the discussion at closer quarters propositions passed backwards and forwards as to the terms upon which a meeting could be arranged theodoric sent a gothic priest adamantius in reply offered to come in person to dyrrachium if soas and another gothic noble were sent as hostages for his safe return theodoric was willing to send the hostages if sabinianus would swear that they should return in safety this however for some reason or other the general surlily and stubbornly refused to do and adamantius saw the earnestly desired interview fading away into impossibility at length 
with courageous self-devotion he succeeded in finding a bypath across the mountains which brought him to a fort situated on a hill and strengthened by a deep ditch in sight of Dyrrhachium. from thence he sent messengers to theodoric earnestly soliciting a conference and the amal leaving his army in the plain rode with a few horsemen to the banks of the stream which separated him from adamantius's stronghold adamantius too to guard against a surprise placed his little band of soldiers in a circle round the hill and then descended to the stream and with none to listen to their speech commenced the long desired colloquy how adamantius may have opened his case we are not informed but the ostrogoth's reply is worth quoting word for word it was my choice to live altogether out of thrace far away towards scythia where i should disturb no one by my presence and yet should be ready to go forth thence to do the emperor's bidding but you having called me forth as if for war against the son of triarius first of all promised that the general of thrace should immediately join me with his forces he never appeared and then that claudius the steward of the goth money should meet me with the pay of the mercenaries him i never saw and thirdly you gave me guides for my journey but what sort of guides men who leaving untrodden all the easier roads into the enemy's country led me by a steep path and along the sharp edges of cliffs where had the enemy attacked us travelling as we were bound to do with horsemen and wagons and all the lumber of our camp it had been a marvel if i and all my folk had not been utterly destroyed hence i was forced to make such terms as i could with the foes and in fact i owe them many thanks that when you had betrayed and they might have consumed me they nevertheless spared my life adamantius went over the old story about the great benefits which the emperor had bestowed on theodoric the patriciate the mastership the rich presence and all the other evidences of his fatherly regard he attempted to answer the charges brought by theodoric but in this even the greek historian who records the dialogue thinks that he failed with more show of reason he complained of the march across the mountains and the dash into epirus while negotiations were proceeding with constantinople he recommended him to make peace with the empire while it was in his power and assuring him that he would never be allowed to lord it over the great cities of epirus nor to banish their citizens from thence to make room for his people again pressed him to accept the emperor's offer of dardania the pantalian plain where there was abundance of land beside that which was already inhabited a fair and fertile territory lacking cultivators which his people could till so providing themselves in abundance with all the necessaries of life theodoric refused with an oath to take his toil-worn people who had served him so faithfully at that time of year it was now perhaps autumn into dardania no they must all remain in epirus for the winter then if they could agree upon the rest of the terms he might be willing in spring to follow a guide sent by the emperor to lead them to their new abode but more than this he was ready to deposit his baggage and all his unwarlike folk in any city which the emperor might appoint to give his mother and his sister as hostages for his entire fidelity and then to advance at once with ten thousand of his bravest warriors into thrace as the emperor's ally with these men and the imperial armies now stationed in the illyrian provinces he would undertake to sweep thrace clear of all the goths who followed the son of triarius only he stipulated that in that case he should be clothed with his old dignity of master of the soldiery which had been taken from him and bestowed on his rival and that he should be received into the commonwealth and allowed to live as he evidently yearned to live as a roman citizen adamantius replied that he was not empowered to treat on such terms while theodoric remained in epirus but he would refer his proposal to the emperor and with this understanding they parted one from the other meanwhile important and for the goths disastrous events had been taking place in the candavian mountains over these the rear-guard of theodoric's army with the wagons and the baggage had been slowly making its way in a security which was no doubt chiefly caused by the facility of the previous marches but to which the knowledge of the negotiations going forward between king and emperor may partly have contributed 
In any case, security was certainly insecure with such a fort as Lychidnus untaken in their rear. The garrison of that fort had been reinforced by many cohorts of the regular army who had flocked thither at the general's signal, and with these Sabinianus prepared a formidable ambuscade. He sent a considerable number of infantry round by unfrequented paths over the mountains, and ordered them to take up a commanding but concealed position, and to rush forth from thence at a given signal. He himself started with his cavalry from Lychidnus at nightfall, and rode rapidly along the Ignatian Way. At dawn the pursuing horsemen attacked the Goths, who were just descending the last mountain slopes into the plain. Thudimund, with his mother, was riding near the head of the long line of march. Too anxious perhaps for her safety, and fearing to meet the reproachful looks of Theodoric if aught of harm happened to her, he hurried her across the last bridge, spanning a deep defile, which intervened between the mountains and the plain, and then broke down the bridge behind him to prevent pursuit. Pursuit was indeed rendered impossible, and the mother of Theodoric was saved, but at what a cost! The Goths turned back to fight, with the courage of despair, the pursuing cavalry. At that moment, the infantry in ambush, having received the signal, began to attack them from the rocks above. The position was a terrible one, and many brave men fell in the hopeless battle. Quarter, however, was given by the imperial soldiers, for we are told that more than five thousand of the Goths were taken prisoners. The booty was large, and all the wagons of the barbarians, two thousand in number, were of course captured, but the soldiers, misliking the toil of dragging them back over all those jagged passages to Lychidnus, burned them there as they stood upon the Candavian mountains. I have copied with some minuteness the account given us by the Greek historian of this mountain march of Theodoric, because it brings before us with more than usual vividness the conditions under which the campaigns of the barbarians were conducted. It will have been noticed that the Gothic army is not only an army but a nation, and that the campaign is also a migration. The mother and the sister of Theodoric are accompanying him. There is evidently a long train of non-combatants old men, women and children, following the army in those two thousand Gothic wagons. The character attributed by Horace to the Campestres Scythae Quorum Plaustra Vagas Rite Trahunt Domos still survives. The wagon holds the Scythians wandering home. The Goth, a terrible enemy to those outside the pale of his kinship, is a home lover at heart, and even in war will not separate himself from his wife and children. This makes his impact slow, his campaigns unscientific. It prepares him for frequent defeats such as that of the Candavian mountains which a celibate army would have avoided. But it makes his conquests, when he does conquer, more enduring, while it explains those perpetual demands for land, for a settlement within the empire almost on any terms, with which, as was before shown, the barbarian inroads so often close. We need not follow the tedious story of the negotiations with Adamantius, which were interrupted by this sudden success of the imperial arms. In fact, at this point our best authority, who has been unusually full and graphic for the events of 478 and 479, suddenly fails us, and we have scarcely anything but dry and scanty analytic notices for the next nine years of the life of Theodoric. He seems not to have maintained his footing in Epirus, but to have returned to the neighbourhood of the Danube, where he fought and conquered the king of the Bulgarians, a fresh horde of barbarians who at this time made their first appearance in the Balkan peninsula. Whether the much-desired reconciliation with the empire took place, we know not. It seems probable that this may have been the case, as in the year 481 we find his rival, the other Theodoric, in opposition, and planning an invasion of Greece. But the career of the son of Triarius was about to come to an untimely close. Marching westwards, he had reached a station on the Egnatian Way, near the frontiers of Thrace and Macedonia, called the Stables of Diomed, and there pitched his camp. One morning he would fain mount his horse for a gallop across the plain, but before he was securely seated in the saddle, the horse reared. The rider, afraid to grasp the bridle firmly lest he should pull the creature over upon him, clung tightly to his seat but could not guide the horse, which, in its dancing and prancing, came sidling past the door of the tent. 
there was hanging in barbarian fashion a spear fastened by a thong the horse shied up against the spear whose point gored his master's side he was not killed on the spot but died soon after of the wound after some domestic dissensions and bloodshed the leadership of his band passed to his son Rekitak, apparently a hot-tempered and tyrannical youth three years after his father's death Rekitak, now an enemy of the empire was put to death by theodoric the amal acting under the orders of zeno the band of triarian goths thirty thousand fighting men in number was joined to the army of theodoric an important addition to his power but also to his cares to the ever-present difficulty of finding food for his followers backwards and forwards between peace and war with the empire theodoric wavered during the six years which followed his rival's death the settlement of his people at this time seems to have been on the southern shore of the danube in part of the countries now known as servia and wallachia with novi sistova for his headquarters one year 482 he is making a raid into macedonia and thessaly and plundering larissa the next 483 he is again clothed with his old dignity of master of the soldiery and keeps his goths rigidly within their allotted limits the next 484 he is actually raised to the consulate an office which though devoid of power is still so radiant with the glory of the illustrious men who have held it for near a thousand years from the days of brutus and colatinus that emperors covet the possession of it and the mightiest barbarian chiefs in their service long for no higher reward two years after this 486 he is again in rebellion ravaging thrace the next year 487 he has broken through the long walls and penetrates within fourteen miles of constantinople in all this wearisome period of theodoric's life his action seems to be merely destructive there is nothing constructive no fruitful or fertilizing thought to be found in it had this been a fair sample of his life there could be no reason why he should not sink into the oblivion which covers so many forgotten freebooters but in 488 a change came over the spirit of his dream a plan was agreed upon between him and the emperor by which of them it was first suggested we cannot now say for the employment of all this wasted and destructive force in another field where its energies might accomplish some result beneficent and enduring that new field was italy and in order to understand the conditions of the problem which there awaited theodoric we must briefly recount the chief events which had happened in that peninsula since attila departed from untaken rome in compliance with the petition of pope leo End of chapter 5chapter six of theodoric the goth by thomas hodgkin this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six italy under odovacar in former chapters i have very briefly sketched the fortunes of the italian peninsula during two great barbarian invasions that of alaric 407 to 410 and that of attila 452 the monarch who ruled the western empire at the date of the last invasion was valentinian the third grandson of the great theodosius he dwelt sometimes at rome sometimes at ravenna which latter city protected by the waves of the adriatic and by the innumerable canals and pools through which the waters of two rivers flowed lazily to the sea was all but impregnable by the barbarians a selfish and indolent voluptuary valentinian the third made no valuable contribution to the defence of the menaced empire some stones of which were being shaken down every year by the tremendous blows of the teutonic invaders any wisdom that might be shown in the councils of the state was due to his mother gallia placidia who till her death in 451 was the real ruler of the empire any strength and valour that was displayed in its defence was due to the great minister and general aetius a man who had himself probably many drops of barbarian blood in his veins though he has not been unfitly styled the last of the romans 
it was Aetius who, as we have seen, in concert with the Visigothic king, fought the fight of civilization against Hunnish barbarism on the Catalonian battle plain. It was to Aetius thrice consul that the groans of the Britons were addressed when the barbarians drove them to the sea and the sea drove them back on the barbarians. When Attila was dead, the weak and worthless emperor seems to have thought that he might safely dispense with the services of this too powerful subject. Inviting Aetius to his palace, he debated with him a scheme for the marriage of their children. The son of the general was to wed the daughter of the emperor and when the debate grew warm, with calculated passion, he snatched a sword from one of his guardsmen and with it pierced the body of Aetius. The bloody work was finished by the courtiers standing by, and the most eminent of the friends and counsellors of the deceased statesmen were murdered at the same time. The foul assassination of this great defender of the Roman state was requited next year by two barbarians of his train, men who no doubt cherished for Aetius the same feelings of personal loyalty which bound the members of a Teutonic comitatus to their chief, and who deemed life a dishonour while their leader's blood remained unavenged. On a day in March, while Valentinian was watching intently the games in the Campus Martius of Rome, these two barbarians rushed upon him and stabbed him, slaying at the same time the eunuch who had been his chief confederate in the murder of Aetius. With Valentinian III, the line of Theodosius, which had swayed the Roman sceptre for eighty-six years, came to an end. None of the men who after him bore the great title of Augustus in Rome, I am speaking, of course, of the 5th century only, succeeded in founding a dynasty. Not only was no one of them followed by a son, scarcely one of them was suffered to end his own reign in peace. Of the nine emperors who wore the purple in Italy after the death of Valentinian, only two ended their reigns in the course of nature. Four were deposed and three met their death by violence. Only one reigned for more than five years, Several could only measure the duration of their royalty by months. Even the short period, 455 to 476, which these nine reigns occupy, is not entirely filled by them, for there were frequent interregna, one lasting for a year and eight months. And the men were as feeble as their kingly life was short and precarious. With the single exception of Majorian, 457 to 461, a brave and strong man, and one who, if fair play had been given to him, would have assuredly done something to stay the ruin of the empire, all of these nine men, with whose names there is no need to burden the reader's memory, are fitly named by a German historian, the Shadow Emperors. During sixteen years of this time, 456 to 472, supreme power in the empire was virtually wielded by a nobleman of barbarian origin but naturalized in the roman state the proud and stern patrician ricima this man descended from the chiefs of the suevi grandson of a visigothic king and brother-in-law of a king of the burgundians was doubtless able to bring much barbaric influence to support the cause which from whatever motives he had espoused the cause of the defence of that which was left to Rome of her empire in the west of Europe. Many Teutonic tribes had by this time settled themselves in the imperial lands. Spain was quite lost to the empire, some fragments of Gaul were still bound to it by a most precarious tie, but the loss which threatened the life of the state most nearly was the loss of Africa. For this province, the capital of which was the restored and Romanized city of Carthage, had been for generations the chief exporter of corn to feed the pauperized population of Rome, and here now dwelt and ruled, and from hence sallied forth to his piratical raids against Italy, the deadliest enemy of the Roman name, the king of the Vandals, Gaiseric. The Vandal conquest of Africa was, at the time which we have now reached, a somewhat old story, nearly a generation having elapsed since it occurred. But the Vandal sack of Rome, which came to pass immediately after the death of Valentinian III, and which marked the beginning of the period of the Shadow Emperors, was still near and terrible to the memories of men. No Roman but remembered in bitterness of soul how in June 455 the long ships of the Vandals appeared at the mouth of the Tiber, how Gaiseric and his men landed, marched to the Eternal City and entered it unopposed, 
how they remained there for a fortnight not perhaps slaying or ravishing but with calm insolence plundering the city of all that they cared to carry away stripping off what they supposed to be the golden roof of the capitol removing the statues from their pedestals transporting everything that seemed beautiful or costly and stowing away all their spoils in the holds of those insatiable vessels of theirs which lay at anchor at ostia the remembrance of this humiliating capture and the fear that it might at any moment be repeated probably with circumstances of greater atrocity were the dominant emotions in the hearts of the roman senate and people during the twenty-one years which we are now rapidly surveying it was doubtless these feelings which induced them to submit more patiently than they would otherwise have done to the scarcely veiled autocracy of an imperfectly romanized teuton such as ricimer he was a barbarian it is true probably he could not even speak latin grammatically but he was mighty with the barbarian kings mighty with the foderati the rough soldiers gathered from every german tribe on the other side of the alps who now formed the bulk of the imperial army let him be as arrogant as he would to the senate let him set up and pull down one shadow emperor after another if only he would keep the streets of rome from being again profaned by the tread of the terrible vandal to a certain extent the confidence reposed in ricimer was not misplaced he inflicted a severe defeat on the vandals in a naval engagement near the island of corsica he raised to the throne the young and valiant majorian who repelled a vandal invasion of campania he planned in conjunction with the eastern emperor a great expedition against carthage which failed through no fault of his but by the bad generalship of basiliscus whose brother-in-law leo had appointed him to the command but the rule of a barbarian like ricimer exercised on the sacred soil of italy and the brutal arrogance with which he dashed down one of his puppet emperors after another when they had served his purpose must have done much to break the spirit of the roman nobles and the roman commonalty and to prepare the way for the teutonic revolution which occurred soon after his death above all we have reason to think that during the whole time of ricimer's ascendancy the barbarian foderati were becoming more absolutely dominant in the roman army and with waxing numbers were growing more insolent in their demeanour and more intolerable in their demands the ranks of the foderati were at this time recruited not from one of the great historic nationalities visigoth ostrogoth frank or burgundian but chiefly from a number of petty tribes known as the rugii siri heruli and turkilingi who have failed to make any enduring mark in history these tribes which upon the break-up of attila's empire had established themselves on the shore of the middle danube north and west of the lands occupied by the ostrogoths were continually sending their young warriors over the passes of noricum salzburg styria and carinthia to seek their fortune in italy one of these recruits on his southward journey stepped into the cave of a holy hermit named severinius and stooping his lofty stature in the lowly cell asked the saint's blessing when the blessing was given the youth said farewell not farewell but fair forward answered severinius onward into italy skin clothed now but destined before long to enrich many men with costly gifts the name of this young recruit was odovacar odovacar probably entered italy about four sixty five he attached himself to the party of ricimer and before long became a conspicuous captain of foderati after the death of ricimer eighteenth august four seventy two there was a series of rapid revolutions in the roman state olibrius the then ruling nonentity died in october of the same year after five months interregnum a yet more shadowy shadow glycerius succeeded him and after fifteen months of rule was thrust from the throne by julius nepos who had married the niece of verena the mischief-making augusta of the east and who was therefore supported by all the moral influence of constantinople nepos after fourteen months of empire in which he distinguished himself only by the loss of some gaulish provinces to the visigoths was in his turn dethroned by the master of the soldiery orestes who had once held a subordinate situation in the court of attila nepos fled to dalmatia which was probably his native land and lived there for four years after his dethronement still keeping up some at least of the state which belonged to a roman emperor 
we know very little of the pretexts for these rapid revolutions or the circumstances attending them but there cannot be much doubt that the army was the chief agent in what to borrow a phrase from modern spanish politics were a series of pronunciamentos for some reason which is dim to us orestes though a full-blooded roman citizen did not set the diadem on his own head but placed it on that of his son a handsome boy of some fourteen or fifteen years named romulus and nicknamed the little augustus for himself he took the dignity of patrician which had been so long worn by ricimer and was associated in men's minds with the practical mastery of the empire but a ruler who has been raised to the throne by military sedition soon finds that the authors of his elevation are the most exacting of masters the foderati who knew themselves now absolute arbiters of the destiny of the empire and who had the same craving for a settlement within its borders which we have met with more than once among the followers of theodoric presented themselves before the patrician orestes and demanded that one-third of the lands of italy should be assigned to them as a perpetual inheritance this was more than orestes dared to grant and on his refusal odovacar said to the mercenaries make me king and i will obtain for you your desire twenty third of august four seventy six the offer was accepted odovacar was lifted high on a shield by the arms of stalwart barbarians and saluted as king by their unanimous acclamations when the foderati were gathered out of the roman army there seems to have been nothing left that was capable of making any real defence of the empire the campaign if such it may be called between odovacar and orestes was of the shortest and most perfunctory kind ticinum pavia in which orestes had taken refuge was taken sacked and partly burned by the barbarians the master of the soldiery himself fled to placentia but was there taken prisoner and beheaded only five days after the elevation of odovacar a week later his brother paulus who had not men enough to hold even the strong city of ravenna was taken prisoner and slain in the great pine forest outside that city at ravenna the young puppet emperor romulus was also taken prisoner the barbarian showed himself more merciful perhaps almost more contemptuous towards his boy rival than was the custom of the emperors of rome and constantinople towards the sons of their competitors odovacar who pitied the tender years of augustulus and looked with admiration on his beautiful countenance spared his life and assigned to him for a residence the palace and gardens of lucullus the conqueror of mithridates who five and a half centuries before had prepared for himself this beautiful home the lucullanum in the very heart of the lovely bay of naples the building and the fortifying of a great commercial city have utterly altered the whole aspect of the bay but in the long egg-shaped peninsula on which stands to-day the castel del ovo we can still see the outlines of the famous lucullanum in which the last roman emperor of rome ended his inglorious days his conqueror generously allowed him a pension of three thousand six hundred pounds per annum but for how long this pension continued to be a charge on the revenues of the new kingdom we are unable to say there is one doubtful indication of his having survived his abdication by about thirty years but clear historical notices of his subsequent life and the date of his death are denied to us a striking proof of the absolute nullity of his character this then was the event which stands out in the history of europe as the fall of the western empire the reader will perceive that it was no great and terrible invasion of a conquering host like the fall of the eastern empire in fourteen fifty three no sudden overthrow of a national polity like the norman conquest of ten sixty six not even a bloody overturning of the existing order by demagogic force like the french revolution of seventeen ninety two it was but the continuance of a process which had been going forward more or less manifestly for nearly a century the recognition of the fact that the foderati the so-called barbarian mercenaries of rome were really her masters if we had to seek a parallel for the event of four seventy six we should find it rather in the deposition of the last mogul emperor at delhi and the public assumption by the british queen of the raj over the greater part of india than in any of the other events to which we have alluded 
Reflecting on this fact, and seeing that the Roman Empire still lived on in the East for nearly a thousand years, that the Eastern Caesar never for many generations relinquished his claim to be considered the legitimate ruler of the old Rome as well as of the new, and sometimes asserted that claim in a very real and effective manner, and considering too that charles the great when he in modern phrase restored the western empire in eight hundred never professed to be the successor of romulus augustulus but of constantine the sixth the then recently deposed emperor of the east the latest school of historical investigators with scarcely an exception minimize the importance of the event of four seventy six and some even object to the expression fall of the western empire as fitly describing it the protest is a sound one and was greatly needed perhaps now the danger is in the other direction and there is a risk of our making too little of an event in which after all the sceptre did manifestly depart from rome during the whole interval between odovacar's accession and belisarius's occupation of rome four seventy six to five thirty six no roman however proud or patriotic could blind himself to the fact that a man of barbarian blood was the real and in a certain sense the supreme ruler of his country ricima might be looked upon as an eminent servant of the emperor who had the misfortune to be of barbarian birth odovacar and theodoric were without all contradiction kings if not kings of italy at any rate kings in italy sometimes actually making war on the caesar of byzantium and not caring when they did so to set up the phantom of a rival emperor in order to legitimize their opposition but in a matter so greatly debated as this it will be safer not to use our own or any modern words this is how count marcellinus an official of the eastern empire writing his annals about fifty-eight years after the deposition of romulus describes the event Odovacar killed Orestes and condemned his son Augustulus to the punishment of exile in the Luculanum, a castle of Campania. The Hesperian, Western, Empire of the Roman people, which Octavianus Augustus, first of the Augusti, began to hold in the 709th year of the building of the city, B.C. 44, perished with this Augustulus in the 522nd year of his predecessors, A.D. 476 the kings of the goths thenceforward holding both rome and italy of the details of odovacar's rule in italy we know very little of course the foderati had their will at any rate in some measure with reference to the assignment of land in italy but no historian has told us anything as to the social disorganization which such a distribution of property must have produced there are some indications that it was not thoroughly carried into effect at any rate in the south of italy and that the settlements of the foderati were chiefly in the valley of the po and in the districts since known as the romagna the old imperial machinery of government was taken over by the new ruler and in all outward appearance things probably went on under king odovacar much as they had done under count ricima no great act of cruelty or oppression stains the memory of odovacar he lost provence to the visigoths but on the other hand he by judicious diplomacy recovered sicily from the vandals altogether it is probable that italy was at any rate not more miserable under the sway of this barbarian king than she had been at any time since alaric's invasion in 408 proclaimed her helplessness to the world one piece of solemn comedy is worth relating namely the embassies dispatched to constantinople by the rival claimants to the dominion of italy it was probably towards the end of 477 or early in 478 that zeno then recently returned from exile after the usurpation of basiliscus received two embassies from two deposed emperors of the west first of all came the ambassadors of augustulus or rather of the roman senate sent nominally by the orders of augustulus really by those of odovacar these men great roman nobles represented that they did not need an emperor of their own one absolute ruler was sufficient to guard both east and west but they had moreover chosen odovacar who was well able to protect their interests being a man wise in council and brave in war 
they therefore prayed the emperor to bestow on him the dignity of patrician and to entrust to him the administration of the affairs of italy at the same time apparently they brought the ornaments of the imperial dignity the diadem the purple robe the jewelled buskins which had been worn by all the shadow emperors who flitted across the stage and requested that they might be laid up in the imperial palace at constantinople simultaneously there came ambassadors from nepos the imperial refugee the nephew by marriage of verena from his dalmatian exile he congratulated his kinsman zeno on his recent restoration to the throne and begged him to lend men and money to bring about the like happy result for him by replacing him on the western throne to these embassies zeno returned ambiguous answers which seemed to leave the question as to the legitimacy of odovacar's rule an open one the senate was sharply rebuked for having acquiesced in the dethronement of nepos and a previous emperor who had been sent to them from the east odovacar was recommended to seek the coveted dignity from nepos and to cooperate for his return at the same time the moderation of odovacar's rule and his desire to conform himself to the maxims of roman civilization received the emperor's praise the nature of the reply to nepos is not recorded but it was no doubt made plain to him that sympathy and good wishes were all that he would receive from his eastern colleague the letters addressed to odovacar bore the superscription to the patrician odovacar and that was all that the barbarian really cared for with such a title as this every act even the most high-handed on the part of the barbarian king was rendered legitimate nepos and augustulus were equally excluded as useless encumbrances to the state and the kings de jure and de facto became practically one man and that man odovacar end of chapter six chapter seven of theodoric the goth by thomas hodgkin this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7. The Conquest of Italy The friendly relations between Odovacar and the Eastern Emperor, which had been established by the embassy last described, were gradually altered into estrangement. In the year 480, Nepos, the dethroned Emperor of Rome, was stabbed by two treacherous courtiers in his palace near Salona odovacar led an army into dalmatia and avenged the murder but also apparently annexed the province of dalmatia to his dominion thus coming into nearer neighbourhood with constantinople this may have been one cause of alienation but a more powerful one was the negotiation which was commenced in the year 484 between odovacar and illus the last of the many insurgent generals who disturbed the reign of zeno at first odovacar held himself aloof from the proposed confederacy but afterwards he was disposed or zeno believed that he was disposed to accept the alliance of the insurgent general in order to find him sufficient occupation near a home the emperor fanned into a flame the smouldering embers of discord between odovacar and felithius king of the rugians the most powerful ruler of those danubian lands from which the italian king himself had migrated into italy the rugian war was short and odovacar's success was decisive in 487 he vanquished the rugian army and carried felithius and his wife prisoners to ravenna in 488 an attempt to raise again the standard of the rugian monarchy which was made by frederick the son of felithius was crushed and frederick an exile and a fugitive betook himself to the camp of theodoric who was then dwelling at novi sistova on the danube when the attempt to weaken odovacar by means of his fellow barbarians in rugiland failed zeno feigned outward acquiescence offering congratulations on the victory and receiving presents out of the rugian spoils but in his heart he felt that there must now be war to the death between him and this too powerful ruler of italy the news came to him at a time when theodoric was in one of his most turbulent and destructive moods when he had penetrated within fourteen miles of constantinople and had fired the towns and villages of thrace 
perhaps even within sight of the capital it was a natural thought and not altogether an unstatesmanlike expedient to play off one disturber of his peace against the other to commission theodoric to dethrone the tyrant odovacar and thus at least earn repose for the provincials of thrace perhaps secure an ally at ravenna theodoric we may be sure with those instincts of civilization and love for the empire which had been in his heart from boyhood though often repressed and disobeyed needed little exhortation to an enterprise which he himself may have suggested to the emperor thus then it came to pass that a formal interview was arranged between emperor and king perhaps at constantinople though it seems doubtful whether theodoric could have safely trusted himself within its walls and at this interview the terms of the joint enterprise were arranged an enterprise to which theodoric was to contribute all the effective strength and zeno the glamour of imperial legitimacy when the high contracting parties met theodoric lamented the hapless condition of italy and rome italy once subject to the predecessors of zeno rome once the mistress of the world now harassed and distressed by the usurped authority of a king of rugians and turcilingians if the emperor would send theodoric thither with his people he would be at once relieved from the heavy charges of their stipendia which he was now bound to furnish while theodoric would hold the land as of the free gift of the emperor and would reign there as king only till zeno himself should arrive to claim the supremacy in the autumn of the year 488 theodoric with all his host set forth from sistova on the danube on his march to italy his road was the same taken by alaric and by most of the barbarian invaders along the danube as far as belgrade then between the rivers drave and save or along the banks of one of them till he reached the julian alps not far from the modern city of Lybach, then down upon aquileia and the venetian plain as in the macedonian campaign so now he was accompanied by all the members of his nation old men and children mothers and maidens and doubtless by a long train of wagons we have no accurate information whatever as to the number of his army but various indications both in earlier and later history seem to justify us in assuming that the soldiers must have numbered fully forty thousand and if this was the case the whole nation cannot have been less than two hundred thousand the difficulty of finding food for so great a multitude in the often desolated plains of pannonia and noricum must have been enormous and was no doubt the reason of the slowness of theodoric's progress very probably he divided his army into several portions moving on parallel lines foragers would scour the country far and wide stores of provisions would be accumulated in the great gothic wagons which would be laboriously driven over the rough mountain passes then all the divisions of the army which had scattered in search of food would have to concentrate again when they came into the neighbourhood of an enemy whether odovacar or one of the barbarian kings who sought to bar their progress all these operations consumed much time and hence it was that though the goths started on their pilgrimage in four eighty eight probably in the autumn of that year they did not descend into the plains of italy even at its extreme northeastern corner till july four eighty nine there was one fact which probably facilitated the progress of theodoric and prevented his expedition with such a multitude from being condemned as absolute foolhardiness his road lay for the most part through regions with which he was already well acquainted through a land which might almost be called his native land and both the resources and the difficulties of which were well known to him the first considerable city that he came to singidinum the modern belgrade was the scene of his own first boyish battle the gepidae who were his chief antagonists on the road had swarmed over into that very province of pannonia where his father's palace once stood and though they showed themselves bitter foes they were doubtless surrounded by foes of their own who would be friends to the ostrogoths probably too frederick the rugian refugee brought with him many followers who knew the road and could count on the assistance of some barbarian allies eager to overturn the throne of odovacar thus it will be seen that though the perils of the ostrogothic march were tremendous the danger which in those mapless days was often so fatal to an invading army ignorance of the country was not among them 
we are vaguely told of countless battles fought by the ostrogoths with sclavonic and other tribes that lay across their line of march but the only battle of which we have any details and only those such as we can extract from the cloudy rhetoric of a popular preacher is one which was fought with the gepidae soon after the goths had emerged from the territory of the friendly empire near the great mere or river which went by the name of hiulca palace in what is now the crown land of sclavonia when the great and over-wearied multitude approached the outskirts of the gepid territory their leader sent an embassy to traustila king of the gepidae entreating that his host might have an unmolested passage and offering to pay for the provisions which they would require to this embassy traustila returned a harsh and insulting answer he would yield no passage through his dominions to the ostrogoths if they would go by that road they must first fight with the unconquered gepidae traustila then took up a strong position near the hiulca palace whose broad waters girdled by fen and treacherous morass made the onward march of the invaders a task of almost desperate danger but the ostrogoths could not now retreat famine and pestilence lay behind them on the road they must go forward and with a reluctant heart theodoric gave the signal for the battle it seemed at first as if that battle would be lost and as if the name and fame of the ostrogothic people would be swallowed up in the morasses of the reedy hiulca already the van of the army floundering in the soft mud and with only their wicker shields to oppose to the deadly shower of the gepid arrows were like to fall back in confusion then theodoric having called for a cup of wine and drunk to the fortunes of his people in a few spirited words called to his soldiers to follow his standard the standard of a king who would carve out the way to victory perchance he may have discerned some part of the plain where the road went over solid ground and if that were beset by foes at any rate the gepid was less terrible than the morass so it was that he charged triumphantly through the hostile ranks and being followed by his eager warriors achieved a signal victory the gepidae were soon wandering over the plain a broken and dispirited force multitudes of them were slain before the descent of night saved the remaining fugitives and so large a number of the gepid store wagons fell into the hands of the ostrogoths that throughout the host one voice of rejoicing arose that traustila had been willing to fight so had a little gothic blood bought food more than they could ever have afforded money to purchase thus through foes and famine hardships of the winter and hardships of the summer the nation army held on its way and at length as has already been said in the month of august four eighty nine the last of the wagons descended from the highlands which are an outpost of the julian alps and the ostrogoths were encamped on the plains of italy odovacar who apparently had allowed them to accomplish the passage of the alps unmolested stood ready to meet them on the banks of the isonzo the river which flows near the ruins of the great city of aquileia he had a large army the colonel of which would doubtless be those mercenaries who had raised him on the shield thirteen years before and among whom he had divided one-third part of the soil of italy but many other barbarians had flocked to his standard so that he had as it were a little court of kings chieftains serving under him as supreme leader he himself however was now in the fifty-sixth year of his age and his genius for war if he ever had any seems to have failed him he fought as far as we can discern his conduct from the fragmentary notices of the analysts and panegyrists with a sort of sullen savageness like a wild beast at bay but without skill either of strategy or tactics the invaders encumbered with the wagons and the non-combatants had greatly the disadvantage of position odovacar's camp had been long prepared was carefully fortified and protected by the deep and rapid isonzo but theodoric's soldiers succeeded in crossing the river stormed the camp defended as it was by a strong earthen rampart and sent its defenders flying in wild rout over the plains of venetia odovacar fell back on the line of the adige and the beautiful north-eastern corner of italy the region which includes among its cities udine venice vincenza padua now accepted without dispute the rule of theodoric and perhaps welcomed him as a deliverer from the stern sway of odovacar 
from this time forward it is allowable to conjecture that the most pressing of theodoric's anxieties that which arose from the difficulty of feeding and housing the women and children of his people if not wholly removed was greatly lightened odovacar took up a strong position near verona separated from that city by the river adige theodoric though not well provided with warlike appliances rightly judged that it was of supreme importance to his cause to follow up with rapidity the blow struck on the banks of the Isonzo, and accordingly towards the end of september he with his army stood before the fossatum or entrenched camp at verona in order to force his soldiers to fight bravely odovacar had in defiance of the ordinary rules of war placed his camp where retreat was almost hopelessly barred by the swift stream of the adige and he addressed his army with stout words full of simulated confidence in victory on the morning of the thirtieth of september when the two armies were about to join in what must evidently be a most bloody encounter the mother and sister of theodoric Ereliva and amalfrida sought his presence and asked him with some anxiety what were the chances of the battle with words reminding us of the homeric saying that the best omen is to fight bravely for one's country theodoric reassured their doubting hearts on that day he told his mother it was for him to show that she had given birth to a hero on the day when the ostrogoths did battle with the huns dressed in his most splendid robes those robes which their hands had adorned with bright embroidery he would be conspicuous both to friend and foe and would give a noble spoil to his conqueror if any man could succeed in slaying him with these words he leapt on his horse rushed to the van cheered on by his wavering troops and began a series of charges which at length but not till thousands of his own men as well as of the enemy were slain carried the fossatum of odovacar the battle once gained of course the dispositions which odovacar had made to ensure the resistance of his soldiers necessitated their ruin and the swirling waters of the adige probably destroyed as many as the ostrogothic sword odovacar himself again a fugitive sped across the plain south-eastward to ravenna compelled like so many roman emperors before him to shelter himself from the invader behind its untraversable network of rivers and canals it would seem from the scanty notices which remain to us that in this battle of verona the bloodiest and most hardly fought of all the battles of the war the original army of foderati the men who had crowned odovacar king and divided the third part of italy between them was if not annihilated utterly broken and dispirited and theodoric who now marched westward with his people and was welcomed with blessing and acclamations by the bishop and citizens of milan received also the transferred allegiance of the larger part of the army of his rival it seemed as if a campaign of a few weeks had secured the conquest of italy but the war was in fact prolonged for three years and a half from this time by domestic treachery foreign invasion and the almost absolute impregnability of ravenna at the head of the soldiers of odovacar who had apparently with enthusiasm accepted the leadership of his younger and more brilliant rival was a certain tufa master of the soldiery among the foderati either he had extraordinary powers of deception or theodoric short of generals accepted his professions of loyalty with most unwise facility for so it was that the ostrogothic king entrusted to tufa's generalship the army which assuredly he ought to have led himself to the siege of ravenna when tufa arrived at faventia about eighteen miles from ravenna his old master came forth to meet him the instinct of loyalty to odovacar revived if indeed he had not all along been playing a part in his alleged desertion and tufa carried over apparently the larger part of the army under his command to the service of theodoric's rival worst of all he surrendered to his late master the chief members of his staff the so-called committees henchmen of theodoric some of whom had probably helped him in his early adventure against singidinum and had shared his hardships in many a weary march through thrace and macedonia these men were all basely murdered by odovacar a deed which theodoric inwardly determined should never be forgiven such an event as the defection of tufa carrying with him a considerable portion of his troops was a great blow to the ostrogothic cause 
Some time later, another and similar event took place. Frederick the Rugian, whose father had been dethroned and who had been himself driven into exile by the armies of Odovacar, for some unexplained and most mysterious reason, quitted the service of Theodoric and entered that of his own deadliest enemy. The sympathy of scoundrels seems to have drawn him into a special intimacy with Tufa, with whom he probably wandered up and down through Lombardy, as we now call it, and Venetia, robbing and slaying in the name of Odovacar, but not caring to share his hardships in blockaded and famine-stricken Ravenna. Fortunately, the nemesis which so often waits on the friendship of bad men was not wanting in this case. The two traitors quarrelled about the division of the spoil, and a battle took place between them in the valley of the Adige above Verona, in which Tufa was slain. Frederick, with his Rugian countrymen, occupied the strong city of Ticinum, Pavia, where they spent two dreadful years. Their minds, says an eyewitness, in after time the bishop of that city, were full of cruel energy which prompted them to daily crimes. In truth, they thought that each day was wasted which they had not made memorable by some sort of outrage. In 494, with the general pacification of Italy, they disappear from view, and we may conjecture, though we are not told, that Pavia was taken and that Frederick received his deserts at the hands of Theodoric. In the year 490, Gundobad, king of the Burgundians, crossed the Alps and descended into Italy to mingle in the fray as an antagonist of Theodoric. In the same year, probably at the same time, Alaric II, king of the Visigoths, entered Italy as his ally. A great battle was fought on the river Adda, ten miles east of Milan, in which Odovacar, who had emerged from the shelter of Ravenna, was again completely defeated. He fled once more to Ravenna, which he never again quitted. While these operations were proceeding, Theodoric's own family and the non-combatants of the Ostrogothic nation were in safe shelter, though in somewhat narrow quarters, in the strong city of Pavia, whose bishop, Epiphanius, was the greatest saint of his age, and one for whom Theodoric felt an especial veneration. No doubt they must have left that city before the evil-minded Rugians entered it, but we hear nothing of the circumstance of their flight or removal. As for the Burgundian king, he does not seem to have been guided by any high considerations of policy in his invasion of Italy, and having been induced to conclude a treaty with Theodoric, he returned to his own royal city of Lyon with goodly spoil and a long train of hapless captives torn from the fields of Liguria. These disturbing elements being cleared away, we may now turn our attention to the true key of the position and the central event of the war, the siege of Odovacar in Ravenna. After Tufa's second change of sides and during the Burgundian invasion of Italy, there was no possibility of keeping up an Ostrogothic blockade of the city of the marshes. Odovacar emerged thence, won back the lower valley of the Po, and marching on Milan, inflicted heavy punishment on the city for the welcome given to Theodoric. In the Battle of the Adda, 11th August 490, however, as has already been mentioned, he sustained a severe defeat, in which he lost one of his most faithful friends and ablest counsellors, a Roman noble named Pierius. After his flight to Ravenna, which immediately followed the Battle of the Adda, there seems to have been a general movement throughout Italy, headed by the Catholic clergy, for the purpose of throwing off his yoke, and if we do not misread the obscure language of the panegyrist, this movement was accompanied by a widespread popular conspiracy, somewhat like the Sicilian Vespers of a later day, to which the Foderati, the still surviving adherents of Odovacar, scattered over their various domains in Italy, appear to have fallen victims. Only two cities, Cesena and Rimini, besides Ravenna, now remained to Odovacar, and for the next two years and a half, from the autumn of 490 to the spring of 493, Ravenna was straitly besieged. Corn rose to a terrible famine price, 72 shillings a peck, and before the end of the siege the inhabitants had to feed on the hides of animals and all sorts of foul and fearful aliments, and many of them perished of hunger. 
a sortie made in 491 by a number of barbarian recruits whom odovacar had by some means attracted to his standard was repelled after a desperate encounter during all this time theodoric from his entrenched camp in the great pine wood of ravenna was watching jealously to see that no provisions entered the city by land and in 492 after taking rimini he brought a fleet of swift vessels thence to a harbour about six miles from ravenna and thus completed its investment by sea in the beginning of 493 the misery of the besieged city became unendurable and odovacar with infinite reluctance began to negotiate for its surrender his son thalani was handed over as a hostage for his fidelity and the parleying between the two rival chiefs began on the twenty fifth of february on the following day theodoric and his ostrogoths entered classis the great naval emporium about three miles from the city and on the twenty seventh by the mediation of the bishop peace was formally concluded between the warring kings the peace the surrender of the city the acceptance of the rule of the new king from the east were apparently placed under the especial guardianship of the church the most blessed man the archbishop john says a later ecclesiastical historian opened the gates of the city fifth of march four ninety three which odovacar had closed and went forth with crosses and thuribles and the holy gospels seeking peace while the priests and the rest of the clergy round him intoned the psalms he falling prostrate on the ground obtained that which he desired he welcomed the new king coming from the east and peace was granted unto him including not only the citizens of ravenna but all the other romans for whom the blessed john made entreaty the chief clause of the treaty was that which assured odovacar not only life but absolute equality of power with his conqueror the fact that theodoric should have even in appearance consented to an arrangement so precarious and unstable is the strongest testimony to the impregnability of ravenna which after three years strict blockade could still be won only by so mighty a concession but of course there was not there could not be any real peace on such terms between the two queen bees in that swarming hive of barbarians theodoric received information so we are told that his rival was laying snares for his life and being determined to anticipate the blow invited odovacar to a banquet at the palace of the laurel grove on the south-east of the city fifteenth march four ninety three when odovacar arrived two suppliants knelt before him and clasped his hands while offering a feigned petition some soldiers who had been stationed in two side alcoves stepped forth from the ambush to slay him but at the last moment their hearts failed them and they could not strike if the deed was to be done theodoric must himself be the executioner or the assassin he raised his sword to strike where is god cried the defenceless but unterrified victim thus didst thou to my friends answered theodoric reminding him of the treacherous murder of the henchman then with a tremendous stroke of his broadsword he clove his rival from the shoulder to the loin the barbarian frenzy which the scandinavian minstrels call the fury of the berserk was in his heart and with a savage laugh at his own too impetuous blow he shouted as the corpse fell to the ground i think the weakling never had a bone in his body the body of odovacar was laid in a stone coffin and buried near the synagogue of the jews his brother was mortally wounded while attempting to escape through the palace garden his wife died of hunger in her prison his son sent for safe-keeping to the king of the visigoths in gaul afterwards escaped to italy and was put to death by the orders of theodoric thus perished the whole short-lived dynasty of the captain of the foderati in his long struggle for the possession of italy theodoric had shown himself patient in adversity moderate in prosperity brave resourceful and enduring but the memory of all those noble deeds is dimmed by the crime which ended the tragedy a crime by the commission of which theodoric sank below the level of the ordinary morality of the barbarian breaking his plighted word and sinning against the faith of hospitality end of chapter seven
Chapter Eight of Theodoric the Goth by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, Civilitas. Thus far, we have followed the fortunes of a Teutonic warrior of the fifth century of our era, marking his strange vacillations between friendship and enmity to the great civilized empire under the shattered fabric whereof he and his people were dwelling and neither concealing nor extenuating any of his lawless deeds least of all that deed of treachery and violence by which he finally climbed to the pinnacle of supreme power in italy now for the next thirty years we shall have to watch the career of this same man ruling italy with unquestioned justice and wise forethought making the welfare of every class of his subjects the end of all his endeavours and cherishing civilization or as it was called in the language of his chosen counsellors civilitas with a love and devotion almost equal to that which religious zeal kindles in the hearts of its surrendered votaries the transformation is a marvellous one success and unquestioned dominion far more often deprave and distort than ennoble and purify the moral nature of man but something like this transformation was seen when octavian the crafty and selfish intriguer ripened into the wise and statesmanlike augustus nor have our own days been quite ignorant of a similar phenomenon when the stern soldier politician of germany the man who once seemed to delight in war and whose favourite motto had till then been blood and iron having secured for his master the hegemony of europe strove or seems to have striven during twenty difficult years to maintain peace among european nations like one convinced in his heart that war is the supreme calamity for mankind it is a threadbare saying happy is the nation that has no annals and the miserable historians of the time tell us far too little about the thirty years of peace which italy enjoyed under the wise rule of theodoric still we are told enough to enable us in some degree to understand both what he accomplished and how he accomplished it and one thing which makes us accept the statements of these historians with unquestioning belief is that they have no motive for the praises which they so freely bestow on the great ostrogoth they are not his countrymen nor his fellow religionists our chief authorities are roman and orthodox and bitterly condemn theodoric for the persecution of the catholics into which as we shall see he was provoked in the last two years of his reign still over the grave of this dead barbarian and heretic when they have nothing to gain by speaking well of him they cannot forbear to praise the noble impartiality and anxious care for the welfare of his people which for the space of one whole generation gave happiness to italy it will be well to quote here one or two of these testimonies borne by impartial witnesses our chief authority who is believed to have been a catholic bishop of ravenna says he was an illustrious man and full of good will towards all he reigned thirty-three really thirty-two years and during thirty of those years so great was the happiness of italy that even the wayfarers were at peace for he did nothing wrong so did he govern the two nations the goths and romans as if they were one people belonging himself to the arian sect yet he ordained that the civil administration should remain for the romans as it had been under their emperors he gave presents and rations to the people yet though he found the treasury ruined he brought it round by his own hard work into a flourishing state he attempted nothing during these first thirty years against the catholic faith exhibiting games in the circus and amphitheatre he received from the romans the names of trajan and valentinian the happy days of which most prosperous emperors he did in truth seek to restore and at the same time the goths rendered true obedience to their valiant king according to the edict which he had promulgated for them he gave one of his daughters in marriage to the king of the visigoths in gaul another to the son of the burgundian king his sister to the king of the vandals and his niece to the king of the thuringians thus he pleased all the nations round him for he was a lover of manufactures and a great restorer of cities he restored the aqueduct of ravenna which trajan had built and again after a long interval brought water into the city he completed but did not dedicate the palace and finished the porticoes round it at verona 
he erected baths and a palace and constructed a portico from the gate to the palace the aqueduct which had been long destroyed he renewed and brought in water through it he also surrounded the city with new walls at ticinum pavia too he built a palace baths and an amphitheatre and erected walls round the city on many other cities also he bestowed similar benefits thus he so charmed the nations near him that they entered into a league with him hoping that he would be their king the merchants too from diverse provinces flocked to his dominions for so great was the order which he maintained that if any one wished to leave gold or silver on his land in his country house it was as safe as in a walled city a proof of this was the fact that he never made gates for any city of italy and the gates already existing were not closed any one who had business to transact could do it as safely by night as by day in his time men bought wheat at sixty pecks for a solidus twelve shillings a quarter and thirty amphorae of wine for the same price two shillings fourpence a gallon so far the supposed bishop of ravenna now let us hear procopius an official in the imperial army which brought the ostrogothic kingdom to ruin theodoric was an extraordinary lover of justice and adhered rigorously to the laws he guarded the country from barbarian invasions and displayed the greatest intelligence and prudence there was in his government scarcely a trace of injustice towards his subjects nor would he permit any of those under him to attempt anything of the kind except that the goths divided among themselves the same proportion of the land of italy which odovacar had allotted to his partisans thus then theodoric was in name a tyrant that is an irregular because barbarian ruler but indeed a true king or emperor not inferior to the best of his predecessors and his popularity grew greatly both among goths and italians and this fact that he was popular with both nations was contrary to the ordinary fashion of human affairs for generally as different classes in the state want different things the government which pleases one party has to incur the odium of those who do not belong to it after a reign of thirty-seven years he died having been a terror to all his enemies but leaving a deep regret for his loss in the hearts of his subjects so much for the general aspect of theodoric's rule in italy now let us consider rather more in detail what was his precise position in that country and first as to the title by which he was known it is singularly difficult to say what this title was it is quite clear that theodoric never claimed to be emperor of the west the successor of honorius and augustulus but there are grave reasons for doubting whether he called himself as has been often stated king of italy in the fifth century territorial titles of this kind were if not absolutely unknown at least very uncommon the various teutonic rulers generally took their titles from the nations whom they led to battle Gaiseric being king of the Vandals and Alans, Gundobad king of the Burgundians, Clovis king of the Franks, and so forth. Upon the whole, it seems most probable that Theodoric's full title was king of the Goths and Romans in Italy, and that the allusion to Romans in his title explains some of the conflict of testimony as to the source from whence he derived his title of king. It is quite true that a Teutonic sovereign like Theodoric sprung from a long line of royal ancestors and chosen by the voice of his people to succeed their king his father would not need and except under circumstances of a great national humiliation would not accept any grant of the kingly title as ruler over his own nation from the augustus at new rome but when it came to claiming by the same title the obedience of romans as well as goths especially in that country which had once been the heart of the empire theodoric king of the goths might well be anxious to strain all the resources of diplomacy in order to obtain from the legitimate head of the roman world the confirmation of those important words and romans which appeared in his regal title in the year four ninety probably soon after the battle of the adder theodoric sent faustus an eminent roman noble and chief of the senate on an embassy to zeno hoping that he might receive from that emperor permission to clothe himself with the royal mantle 
it will be remembered that in the compact between roman and teuton which preceded theodoric's invasion of italy words had been used which implied that he was only to rule as locum tenens of the emperor till he himself should arrive to claim the supremacy now with that conquest apparently almost completed and with his rival fast sealed up in ravenna theodoric sends a report of his success of the enterprise undertaken on joint account and desires to legalize his position by a formal grant of the mantle of royalty from the autocrat of the world the time of the arrival of theodoric's embassy at constantinople was unpropitious as the emperor zeno was already stricken by mortal illness on the ninth of april four ninety one he died and was succeeded by the handsome but elderly life guardsman anastasius to whom ariadne widow of zeno gave her hand in marriage the rights and duties which pertained to the compact between theodoric and zeno were perhaps considered as of only personal obligation it might plausibly be contended by the emperor's successor that he was not bound to recognize the new royalty of his predecessors filius in armour and by theodoric that the conditional estate in italy granted to him to hold till zeno should himself arrive became absolute now that by the death of zeno that event was rendered impossible however this may be we hear no more of negotiations between the gothic camp and the court of constantinople till the death of odovacar then the goths apparently in some great assembly of the nation confirmed theodoric to themselves as king without waiting for the orders of the new emperor whatever this ceremony may have imported it must have in some way conferred on theodoric a fuller kingship perhaps more of a territorial and less of a tribal sovereignty than he had possessed when he was wandering with his followers over the passes of the balkans though theodoric had not consulted the emperor before taking this step he sent an ambassador again faustus who now held the important post of master of the offices to constantinople probably in order to give a formal notification of his self-assumed accession of dignity no messages or embassies however could yet soothe the wounded pride of anastasius there was deep resentment at the eastern court and for three or four years there seems to have been a rupture of diplomatic relations between constantinople and ravenna at length in the year four ninety seven theodoric sent another ambassador festus also an eminent roman noble and chief of the senate to anastasius this messenger more successful than his predecessor made peace with anastasius concerning theodoric's premature assumption of royalty and brought back all the ornaments of the palace which odovacar had transmitted to constantinople this final ratification of the ostrogoths sovereignty in italy is so vaguely described to us that it is difficult to see how much it may have implied probably it was to a certain extent convenient to both parties that it should be left vague the emperor would not abandon any hope however shadowy of one day winning back full possession of the hesperian kingdom the king might hope that in the course of years or generations he himself or his descendants might sever the last link of dependence on constantinople perhaps might one day establish themselves as full-blown emperors of rome the claims thus left in vagueness were the seeds of future difficulties and bore fruit forty years later in a bloody and desolating war but meanwhile the position as far as we can ascertain it seems to have been something like this theodoric king of the goths and romans in italy was the absolute ruler of the country de facto except in so far as the gothic nation assembled under arms at its periodical parades may have exercised some check on his full autocracy he made peace and war he nominated the high officers of state even one of the two consuls who still kept alive the fiction of the roman republic he probably regulated the admissions to the senate he was even in the last resort arbiter of the fortunes of the roman church on the other hand he did not himself coin gold or silver money with his effigy but in this he was not singular for it was not till a generation or two had elapsed that any of the new barbarian royalties thought it worth while to claim this attribute of sovereignty though dressed in the purple of royalty by assuming the title of king only 
he accepted a position somewhat lower than that of the emperor of the new rome he sent the names of the consuls whom he had appointed to constantinople an act which might be represented as a mere piece of formal courtesy or as a request for their ratification according to the point of view of the narrator with a similar show of courtesy or submission the accession of theodoric's descendants to the throne was when the occasion arose notified to the then reigning emperor and there were many limitations which the good sense and statesmanlike feeling of the ostrogothic king imposed on his exercise of the royal power but which might be perhaps were represented as part of the fundamental compact between him and the emperor of rome such were the employment of men of roman birth by preference in all the great offices of the state absolute impartiality between the rival creeds catholic and arian to the latter of which theodoric himself was an adherent and a determination to abstain as much as possible from all fresh legislation which might modify the rights and duties of the roman inhabitants of italy the legislative power being chiefly exercised in order to provide for those new cases which arose out of the settlement of so large a number of newcomers of alien blood within the borders of the land after all the attempts which have been made to explain and to systematize the relation between the new barbarian royalties and the old and tottering empire much remains which is absolutely incapable of definition but perhaps an historical parallel though not strictly accurate may somewhat aid our comprehension of the subject it is well known how for the first hundred years of the english raj in india the power which actually resided in an association of traders the old east india company and which was wielded under their orders by a clive a hastings or a wellesley was theoretically vested in an emperor the descendant of the great mogul who lived in seclusion in his palace at delhi and who though nominally all-powerful had really as macaulay has said less power to help or to hurt than the youngest civil servant of the company now assuredly anastasius and justin the imperial contemporaries of theodoric were no mere phantoms of royalty like the last mogul emperors of delhi but as far as actual efficacious share in the government of italy went the parallel holds good such deference as was paid to their name and authority was a mere courteous form the whole power of the state subject as has been said to the limitations still imposed by the popular institutions of the goths was gathered up in the hands of theodoric what then it may be said was gained by keeping up the fiction that italy still formed part of the roman empire and that theodoric ruled in any sense as the delegate of the emperor for the present much though at the cost of future entanglements and complications since it facilitated that union of romania and barbaricum which was the next piece of work obviously necessary for europe if the reader will recur to that noble sentence of autolphus which was quoted in the introduction to this book he will see that the reasoning of that great chieftain took this shape a commonwealth must have laws the goths accustomed for generations to their tameless freedom have not acquired the habit of obedience to the laws till they acquire that habit the administration of the state must be left in roman hands and all the authority of the king must be used in defence of roman organization these principles though he may never have read the passage of oriosus which expounded them were essentially the principles of theodoric so long as he remained in antagonism to the empire he could not reckon on the hearty cooperation of roman officials in the task of government the brave through patriotism and the cowardly through fear of coming retribution would decline to be known as his adherents and would stand aloof from his work of reorganization but when it was known that even the great augustus at constantinople our lord anastasius father of his country as the coins styled him recognized the royalty of theodoric and had in some sort confided to him the government of italy all the great army of civil servants who performed the functions of that highly specialized organism the roman state could without fear and without reproach accept office under the newcomer and could look forward again as they had done before to a fortunate official career to the honours and emoluments which were the recognized reward of the successful civil servant in the next chapter 
i shall describe with a little more detail the character and the duties of some of these roman officials for the present we will rather consider the nature of the work which theodoric accomplished through their instrumentality we have already heard from a nearly contemporary chronicler the story of some of the great civilizing works which he wrought in the wasted land the aqueducts of ravenna and verona the walls of verona and pavia the baths the palace and the amphitheatre more important for the great mass of his subjects was the perfect security which he gave to the merchant for his commerce to the husbandman for the fruit of his toil corn as we have seen sank to the extraordinarily low price of twelve shillings a quarter but this low price did not mean as it might in our country the depression of the agricultural interest through the rivalry of the foreign producer on the contrary the great economic symptom of theodoric's reign and under the circumstances a most healthy symptom was that italy from a corn importing became a corn exporting country under the old emperors whose rule was a most singular blending of autocracy and demagogy in fact a kind of crowned socialism every nerve had been strained to bring from alexandria and carthage the corn which was distributed gratuitously to the idle population of rome under such hopeless competition as this together with the demoralizing influence of slave labour large tracts of italy had actually gone out of cultivation now by political changes the merit of which must not be claimed for the ostrogothic government both egypt and africa had become unavailable for the supply of the necessities of rome theodoric and his ministers may however be praised for that prevalence of order and good government which enabled the long prostrate agriculture of italy to spring up like grass after a summer shower the conditions of prosperity were there and only needed the removal of adverse influences and mistaken benevolence to bring forth their natural fruit the grain largesses to the people of rome were indeed still continued in a modified form but the stores thus dispensed seem to have been brought almost entirely from italy when gaul was visited with famine the shipmasters along the whole western coast of italy were permitted and encouraged to take the surplus of the italian crops to the suffering province even in a time of dearth and after war had begun corn was sold by the state to the impoverished inhabitants of liguria at sixteen shillings a quarter altogether we seem justified in asserting that the economic condition of italy both as to the producers and the consumers of its food supplies was more prosperous under theodoric than it had been for centuries before or than it was to be for centuries afterwards i have already made some reference to aqueducts which were among the noblest and most beneficial works that any ruler of italy could accomplish ravenna situated in an unhealthy swamp where water fit for drinking was proverbially dearer than wine was pre-eminently dependent on such supplies of the precious fluid as could be brought fresh and sparkling from the distant apennines theodoric issued an order to all the farmers dwelling along the course of the aqueduct to eradicate the shrubs growing by its side which would otherwise fix their roots in the bed of the stream loosen the masonry and cause many a dangerous leak this being done said the secretary of state we shall again have baths that we may look upon with pleasure water which will cleanse not stain water after using which we shall not require again to wash ourselves drinking water the mere sight of which will not take away our appetite similar care was needed to preserve the great aqueducts which were the glory of imperial rome as even now their giant arches striding for miles over the desolate campagna are her most impressive monument at rome also the officer who was specially charged with the maintenance of these noble works the count of the aqueducts was exhorted to show his zeal by rooting up hurtful trees and by at once repairing any part of the masonry that seemed to be falling into decay through age he was warned against peculation and against connivance at the frauds which often marked the distribution of the water supply and he was assured that the strengthening of the aqueducts would constitute his best claim on the favour of his sovereign but while in most parts of italy water is a boon eagerly craved for in some places it is a superabundance and a curse at terracina on the latian coast 
there still stands in the piazza a slab of marble with a long inscription setting forth that the most illustrious lord and renowned king theodoric triumphant conqueror ever augustus born for the good of the commonwealth guardian of liberty and propagator of the roman name subduer of the nations ordered that nineteen miles of the appian way being the portion extending from three bridges tripontium to terracina should be cleared of the waters which had flowed together upon it from the marshes on either side a nobleman of the very highest rank consul patrician and prefect of the city caecina morus basilus decius successfully accomplished this work under the orders of his sovereign and for the safety thus afforded to travellers was rewarded by a large grant of the newly drained lands we have seen that theodoric's anonymous panegyrist calls him a lover of manufactures and a great restorer of cities of the manufactures encouraged by the ostrogothic king we should have been glad to receive a fuller account all that i have been able to discover in the published state papers of himself and his successors at all bearing on this subject is some instructions with reference to the opening of gold mines in brutii the modern calabria and iron mines in dalmatia a concession of potteries to three senators who are promised the royal protection if they will prosecute the work diligently and permission to another nobleman to erect a row of workshops or manufactories overlooking the roman forum the whole tenor of these state papers however shows that public works were being diligently pushed on in every quarter of italy and is entirely consistent with the praise awarded to theodoric as a lover of manufactures his zeal for the restoration of cities is by the same documents abundantly manifested at one time we find him giving orders for the transport of marble slabs and columns to ravenna at another directing the repair of the walls of catana now rebuilding the walls and towers of arles and now relieving the distress of naples and nola which have been half ruined by an eruption of vesuvius his care for the adornment of the cities of italy with works of art is manifest as well as his zeal for their material enrichment he hears with great disgust that a brazen statue has been stolen from the city of como it is vexatious says his secretary that while we are labouring to increase the ornaments of our cities those which antiquity has bequeathed to us should be diminished by deeds such as this a reward of one hundred aurei sixty pounds and a free pardon is offered to any accomplice who will assist in the discovery of the chief offender but it is above all for rome for the glory and magnificence of rome that this ostrogothic king in a certain sense the kinsman and successor of her first ravager alaric shows a tender solicitude her aqueducts as we have seen are to be repaired her cloacae those still existing memorials of the civilization of the earliest the regal rome are to be carefully upheld the thefts of brass and lead from the public buildings which have become frequent during the disorders of the past century are to be sternly repressed a spirited patrician who has restored the mighty theatre of pompeius is encouraged and rewarded the prefect of the city is stimulated to greater activity in the repair of all the ruined buildings therein in rome praised beyond all cities by the world's mouth it is not right that anything should be found either sordid or mediocre in all these councils for the material well-being of italy and for the repair of the ravages of anarchy and war theodoric was undoubtedly much assisted by his ministers of roman extraction some of whom i shall endeavour to portray in a later chapter still though the details of the work may have been theirs it cannot be denied that the initiative was his a barbarian thinking only barbarous thoughts looking upon war and the chase as the only employments worthy of a free man would not have chosen such counsellors and if he had found them in his service would not have kept them therefore remembering those years of boyhood which he passed at constantinople at a time when the character is most susceptible of strong and lasting impressions i cannot doubt that notwithstanding the frequent relapses into barbarism which marked his early manhood he was at heart a convert to civilization that his desire was to obtain for the hesperian land all that he had seen best and greatest in the social condition of the city by the bosphorus 
and that his secretary truly expressed his deepest and inmost thoughts when he made him speak of himself as one whose whole care was to change everything for the better i shall close this chapter with a few anecdotes far too few have been preserved to us which serve to show what manner of man he appeared to his contemporaries again i borrow from the anonymous author the supposed bishop of ravenna he was we are told unlettered though fond of the converse of learned men and so clumsy with his pen that after ten years of reigning he was still unable to form without assistance the four letters t h e o which were affixed as his sign manual to documents issued in his name in order to overcome this difficulty he had a golden plate prepared with the necessary letters perforated in it and drew his pen through the holes but though he was unlettered his shrewdness and mother wit caused both his sayings and doings to be much noted and remembered by his subjects in one difficult case which came before him he discovered the truth by a sudden device which probably reminded the bystanders of the judgment of solomon a young man who as a child had been brought up by a friend of his deceased father returned to his home and claimed a share of his inheritance from his mother she however was on the point of marriage with a second husband and under her suitor's influence she disowned the son whom she had first welcomed with joy and had entertained for a month in her house as the suitor persisted in his demand that the son should be turned out of doors and the son refused to leave his paternal abode the case came before the king's court where the widow still persisted in her assertion that the young man was not her son but a stranger whom she had entertained merely out of the motives of hospitality suddenly the king turned round upon her and said this young man is to be thy husband i command thee to marry him the horror-stricken mother then confessed that he was indeed her son some of theodoric's sayings passed into proverbs among the common people one was he who has gold and he who has a devil can neither of them hide what he has got another the roman when in misery imitates the goth and the goth in comfort imitates the roman we have unfortunately no description of the great ostrogoth's outward appearance though the indications in his history would lead us to suppose that he was a man of stalwart form and soldierly bearing nor is this deficiency adequately made up to us by his coins since as has already been said the gold and silver pieces which were circulated in his reign bore the impress of the eastern emperor and the miserable little copper coins which bear his effigy do not pretend to portraiture End of chapter 8i have said that one of the most important characteristics of theodoric's government of italy was that it was conducted in accordance with the traditions of the empire and administered mainly by officials trained in the imperial school to a certain extent the same thing is true of all the teutonic monarchies which arose in the fifth century on the ruins of the empire in dealing with the needs and settling the disputes of the large highly organized communities into whose midst they had poured themselves it was not possible if it had been desirable for the rulers to remain satisfied with the simple sometimes barbarous principles of law and administration which had sufficed for the rude farmer folk who dwelt in isolated villages beyond the rhine and the danube nor was this necessity disliked by the rulers themselves they soon perceived that the roman law with its tendency to derive all power from the imperial head of the state and the roman official staff an elaborate and well-organized hierarchy every member of which received orders from one above him and transmitted orders to those below were far more favourable to their own prerogative and gave them a far higher position over against their followers and comrades in war than the institutions which had prevailed in the forests of germany hence as i have said all the new barbarian royalties even that of the vandals in africa in some respects more anti-roman than any other 
preserved much of the laws and machinery of the Roman Empire, but Theodoric's Italian kingdom preserved the most of all. It might in fact almost be looked upon as a mere continuation of the old imperial system, only with a strong laborious martial goth at the head of affairs, able and willing to keep all the members of the official hierarchy sternly to their work, instead of the ruler whom the last three generations had been accustomed to behold, a man decked with the purple and diadem, but too weak, too indolent, too nervously afraid of irritating some powerful captain of Fodorati or some wealthy Roman noble, to be able to do justice to all classes of his subjects. The composition of the official hierarchy of the empire is, from various sources, almost fully known to us as that of any state of modern Europe. Pre-eminent in dignity over all the rest rose the illustrious Praetorian Prefect, the Vice-Regent of the Sovereign, a man who held towards Emperor or King nearly the same position which a Grand Vizier holds towards a Turkish Sultan. Like his Sovereign, he wore a purple robe, which reached, however, only to his knees, not to his feet, and he drove through the streets in a lofty official chariot. It was for him to promulgate the imperial laws, sometimes to put forth edicts of his own. He proclaimed what taxes were to be imposed each year, and their produce came into his praetorian chest. He suggested to his sovereign the names of the governors of the provinces, paid them their salaries, and exercised a general superintendence over them, having even power to depose them from their offices. And lastly, he was the highest judge of appeal in the land, even the emperor himself having generally no power to reverse his sentences. There was another illustrious minister, who, during this century, both in the Eastern and Western Empire, was always treading on the heels of the Praetorian prefect and trying to rob him of some portion of his power. This was the master of the offices, an intermediary between the sovereign and the great mass of the civil servants, to whom the execution of his orders was entrusted. A swarm of agentes in rebus, king's messengers, bailiffs, sheriff's officers, we may call them by all these designations, roved through the provinces, carrying into effect the orders of the sovereign, always magnifying their master's dignity, whence they derived their epithet of magistriani, and seeking to depress the praetorian cohorts, who discharged somewhat similar duties under the praetorian prefect. The master of the offices, besides sharing the consuls of his sovereign in relation to foreign states, had also the arsenals under his charge, and there was transferred to him from his rival the prefect the superintendence of the cursus publicus, the great postal service of the empire. Again, somewhat overlapping, as it seems to us, the functions of the master of the offices, came the illustrious quaestor, the head rhetorician of the state, the official whose business it was to put the thoughts of the sovereign into fitting and eloquent words, either when he was replying to the ambassadors of foreign powers, or when he was issuing laws and proclamations to his own subjects. As his duties and qualifications were of a more personal kind than those of his two brother ministers already described, he had not like them a large official staff waiting upon his orders. There were two great financial ministers, the Count of Sacred Largesses, sacred of course is equivalent to imperial, and the Count of Private Domains, whose duties practically related in the former case to the personal, in the latter to the real, estate of the sovereign or perhaps, for it is difficult exactly to define the nature of their various duties, it would be better to think of the Count of Sacred Largesses as the Imperial Chancellor of the Exchequer, and the Count of Private Domains as the Chief Commissioner of Woods and Forests. The Superintendent of the Sacred Dormitory was the Grand Chamberlain of the Empire, and commanding, as he did, the army of pages, grooms of the bedchamber, vestiaries and life guardsmen, who ministered to the myriad wants of an Arcadius or a Honorius, he was not the least important among the chief officers of the state. These great civil ministers, eight in number under the Western emperors, for there were three Praetorian prefects, one for the Gauls, one for Italy, and one for the city of Rome, formed, with the military officers of highest rank, generally five in number, the innermost circle of illustres, who may be likened to the cabinet of the emperor. At this time, the cabinet of illustres may have been smaller by one or two members on account of the separation of the Gaulish provinces from Rome, 
but we are not able to speak positively on this point nearly every one of these great ministers of state had under him a large ambitious and often highly paid staff of subordinates who were called his officium the civil servant was at least as regular and highly specialized a profession under the emperors and under theodoric as it is in any modern state it is possible that we should have to go to the celestial empire of china to find its fitting representative a large number of singularii rationalii clavicularii and the like whom we should call policemen subordinate clerks and jailers formed the unlettered staff militia illiterata who stood on the lowest stage of the bureaucratic pyramid above these was the lettered staff beginning with the humble chancellor cancellarius who sat by the cancelli lattice work at the bottom of the court to prevent importunate suitors from venturing too far and rising to the dignified princeps or cornicularius who was looked upon as equal in rank to a count and who expected to make an income of not less than six hundred pounds a year equivalent to two or three times that amount in our day all this great hierarchy of officials wielded powers derived mediately or immediately from the emperor or in the ostrogothic monarchy from the king and great as was their brilliancy in the eyes of the dazzled multitudes who crouched before them it was all reflected from him who was the central sun of their universe but there were still two institutions which were in theory independent of emperor or king which were yet held venerable by men and which had come down from the days of the great world conquering republic or the yet earlier days of romulus and numa these two institutions were the consulship and the senate the consuls as was said in an earlier chapter still appeared to preside over the roman republic as they had in truth presided wielding between them the full power of a king when brutus and collatinus a thousand years before theodoric's commencement of the siege of ravenna took their seat upon the curule chairs and donned the trabea of the consul still though utterly shorn of its power the glamour of the venerable office remained the emperor himself seemed to add to his dignity when he allowed himself to be nominated as consul and in nothing was the cupidity of the tyrant emperors and the moderation of the patriot emperors better displayed than in the number of consulships which they claimed or forbore from claiming ever since the virtual division of the empire into an eastern and western portion it had been usual though not absolutely obligatory for one consul to be chosen out of each half of the orbis romanus and in reading the contemporary chronicles we can almost invariably tell to which portion the author belongs by observing to which consul's name he gives the priority as has already been stated after the resumption of friendly relations between ravenna and constantinople theodoric while naming the western consul sent a courteous notification of the fact to the emperor by whom his nomination seems to have been always accepted without question the great ostrogoth having once worn the consular robes and distributed largesse to the roman people in the streets of constantinople does not seem to have cared a second time to assume that ancient dignity but in the year five nineteen towards the end of his reign he named his son-in-law eutheric consul and the splendour of eutheric's year of office was enhanced by the fact that he had the then reigning emperor justin for his colleague as for the senate it too was still in appearance what it had ever been the highest council in the state the assembly of kings which overawed the ambassador of pyrrhus the mainspring or if not the mainspring at any rate the balance wheel of the administrative machine this it was in theory for there had never been any formal abolition of its existence or abrogation of its powers in practice it was just what the sovereign whether called emperor or king allowed it to be a self-willed and arbitrary monarch like caligula or domitian would reduce its functions to a nullity a wise and moderate emperor like trajan or marcus aurelius would consult it on all important state affairs and while reserving to himself both the power of initiation and that of final control would make of it a real council of state a valuable member of the governing body of the empire the latter seems to have been the policy of theodoric 
probably the very fact of his holding a somewhat doubtful position towards the emperor at constantinople made him more willing to accept all the moral support that could be given him by the body which was in a certain sense older and more august than any emperor the venerable senate of rome at any rate the letters in which he announces to the senate the various acts especially the nomination of the great officials of his kingdom in which he desires their concurrence are couched in such extremely courteous terms that sometimes civility almost borders on servility notwithstanding this however it is quite plain that it was always thoroughly understood who was master in italy and that any attempt on the part of the senate to wrest any portion of real power from theodoric would have been instantly and summarily suppressed i have said that it was only by the aid of officials trained in the service of the empire that theodoric or indeed any of the new barbarian sovereigns could hope to keep the machine of civil government in working order we have fortunately a little information as to some of these officials and an elaborate self-drawn picture of one of them liberius had been a faithful servant of odovacar and had to the last remained by the sinking vessel of his fortunes this fidelity did not injure him in the estimation of the conqueror when all was over he came with no eagerness and with unconcealed sorrow for the death of his former master to offer his services to theodoric who gladly accepted them and gave him at once the pre-eminent dignity of praetorian prefect his wise and economical management of the finances filled the royal exchequer without increasing the burdens of the taxpayer and it is probable that the early return of prosperity to italy which was described in the last chapter was in great measure due to the just and statesmanlike administration of liberius in the delicate business of allotting to the gothic warriors the third part of the soil of italy which seems to have been their recognised dividend on theodoric's italian speculation he so acquitted himself as to win the approbation of all it is difficult for us to understand how such a change of ownership can have brought with it anything but heart-burning and resentment but one there are not wanting indications that owing to evil influences both economic and political there was actually a large quantity of good land lying unoccupied in italy in the fifth century and two there had already been one expropriation of the same kind for the benefit of the soldiers of odovacar in so far as this allotment of thirds merely followed the lines of that earlier redistribution but little of a grievance was caused to the italian owner an ostrogoth the follower of theodoric stepped into the position of a slain syrian or turkilingian the follower of odovacar and the italian owner suffered no further detriment still there must have been some loss to the provincials and some cases of hardship which would be long and bitterly remembered before every family which crossed the alps in the gothic wagons was safely settled in its italian home it is therefore not without some qualification that we can accept the statement of the official panegyrist of the gothic regime who declares that in this business of the allotment of the thirds liberius joined both the hearts and the properties of the two nations gothic and roman for whereas neighbourhood often proves a cause of enmity with these men communion of farms proved a cause of concord thus the division of the soil promoted the concord of the owners friendship grew out of the loss of the provincials and the land gained a defender whose possession of part guaranteed the quiet enjoyment of the remainder it is possible that there was some foundation of truth for the last statement after the fearful convulsions through which the whole western empire had passed and with the strange paralysis of the power of self-defence which had overtaken the once brave and hardy population of italy it is possible that the presence near to each considerable italian landowner of a goth whose duty to his king obliged him to defend the land from foreign invasion and to suppress with a strong hand all robbery and brigandage may have been felt in some cases as a compensation even for whatever share of the soil of italy was transferred to goth from roman by the chief commissioner liberius two eminent romans whom in the early years of his reign theodoric placed in high offices of state were the two successive ambassadors to constantinople faustus and festus both seem to have held the high dignity of praetorian prefect we do not however 
hear much as to the career of Festus, and what we hear of Faustus is not altogether to his credit. He had been for several years practically the prime minister of Theodoric, when, in an evil hour for his reputation, he coveted the estate of a certain Castorius, whose land adjoined his own. Deprived of his patrimony, Castorius appealed, not in vain, to the justice of Theodoric, whose ears were not closed, as an emperor's would probably have been, to the cry of a private citizen against a powerful official. We are determined, says Theodoric, in his reply to the petition of Castorius, to assist the humble and to repress the violence of the proud. If the petition of Castorius prove to be well founded, let the spoiler restore to Castorius his property and hand over besides another estate of equal value. If the magnificent Faustus have employed any subordinate in this act of injustice, bring him to us bound with chains that he may pay for the outrage in person if he cannot do so in purse. If on any future occasion that now known craftsman of evil, Faustus, shall attempt to injure the aforesaid Castorius, let him be at once fined fifty pounds of gold, two thousand pounds. Greatest of all punishments will be the necessity of beholding the untroubled estate of the man whom he sought to ruin. Behold herein a deed which may well chasten and subdue the hearts of all our great dignitaries when they see that not even a praetorian prefect is permitted to trample on the lowly, and that when we put forth our arm to help, such as one's power of injuring the wretched fails him. From this may all men learn how great is our love of justice, since we are willing to diminish even the power of our judges, that we may increase the contentment of our own conscience. This edict was followed by a letter to the illustrious Faustus himself, in which that grasping governor was reminded that human nature frequently requires a change, and permission was graciously given him to withdraw for four months into the country. At the end of that time he was without fail to return to the capital, since no Roman senator ought to be happy if permanently settled anywhere but at Rome. It is tolerably plain that the four months' villegiatura was really a sentence of temporary banishment, and we may probably conclude that the magnificent Faustus never afterwards held any high position under Theodoric. The letters announcing the king's judgment in this matter like all the other extant state papers of Theodoric, were written by a man who was probably, by the fall of Faustus, raised a step in the official hierarchy, and who was certainly, for the last twenty years of the reign of Theodoric, one of the most conspicuous of his Roman officials. This was Cassiodorus, or to give him his full name, Magnus Aurelius Cassiodorus Senator, a man whose life and character require to be described in some detail. Cassiodorus was sprung from a noble Roman family, which had already given three of its members in lineal succession, all bearing the name Cassiodorus, to the service of the state. His great-grandfather, of illustrious rank, defended Sicily and Calabria from the incursions of the Vandals. His grandsire, a tribune in the army, was sent by the emperor Valentinian III on an important embassy to Attila. His father filled first one and then the other of the two highest financial offices in the state under Odovacar. On the overthrow of that chieftain, he, like Liberius, transferred his services to Theodoric, who employed him as governor first of Sicily, then of Calabria, and finally, about the year 500, conferred upon him the highest dignity of all, that of Praetorian Prefect. The ancestral possessions of the Cassiodori were situated in that southernmost province, sometimes likened to the toe of Italy, which was then called Brutii and is now called Calabria. It was a land rich in cattle, renowned for its cheese and for its aromatic white palmation wine, and veins of gold were said to be in its mountains. Here, in the old Greek city of Scylacium, Squilace, a city perched upon a high hill overlooking the sea, sunny yet fanned by cool Mediterranean breezes and looking peacefully on the cornfields, the vineyards and the olive groves around her, Cassiodorus was born, about the year 480. He was therefore probably some twelve or thirteen years of age when the long strife between Odovacar and Theodoric was ended by the murder scene in the palace at Ravenna. 
like all the young roman nobles who aspired to the honours and emoluments of public life cassiodorus studied philosophy and rhetoric and according to the standard of the age a degraded standard he acquired great proficiency in both lines of study when his father was made praetorian prefect about the year five hundred the young rhetorician received an appointment as conciliarius or assessor in the prefect's court at a salary which probably did not exceed forty or fifty pounds while he was holding this position it fell to his lot to pronounce a laudatory oration on theodoric perhaps on the occasion of one of his visits to rome and the eloquence of the young conciliarius so delighted the king that he was at once made an illustrious quaestor thus receiving what we should call cabinet rank while he was still considerably under thirty years of age the quaestor as has been said was the public orator of the state it devolved upon him to reply to the formal harangues in which the ambassadors of foreign nations greeted his master to answer the petitions of his subjects and to see that the edicts of the sovereign were expressed in proper terms the post exactly fitted the intellectual tendencies of cassiodorus who was never so happy as when he was wrapping up some commonplace thought in a garment of sonorous but turgid rhetoric and the simple honesty of his moral nature simple in its very vanity and honest in its childlike egotism coupled as it was with real love for his country and loyal zeal for her welfare endeared him in his turn to theodoric with whom he had many gloriosa colloquia as he calls them conversations in which the young learned and eloquent roman poured forth for his master the stored-up wine of generations of philosophers and poets while the kingly barbarian doubtless unfolded some of the propositions of that more difficult science the knowledge of men which he had acquired by long and arduous years of study in the council chamber on the mountain march and on the battlefield we can go at once to the fountainhead for information as to the character of cassiodorus when he was promoted soon after the death of theodoric to the rank of praetorian prefect it became his duty as quaestor to the young king athalaric theodoric's successor to inform himself by an official letter of the honour conferred upon him in writing this letter he does not deviate from the usual custom of describing the virtues and accomplishments which justify the new minister's promotion why indeed should he keep silence on such an occasion no one could know the good qualities of cassiodorus so well or so intimately as cassiodorus himself and accordingly the quaestor sets forth with all the rhetoric of which he had such an endless supply the virtues and the accomplishments which his observant eye has discovered in himself the new praetorian prefect such a course would certainly not be often pursued by a modern statesman but there is a pleasing ingenuousness about it which to some minds will be more attractive than our present methods the inspired article in a hired newspaper or the feigned reluctance to receive a testimonial which till the receiver suggested it no one had dreamed of offering this then is how cassiodorus in five thirty three describes his past career you came his young sovereign athalaric is supposed to be addressing him in very early years to the dignity of quaestor and my grandfather's theodoric's wonderful insight into character was never more abundantly proved than in your case for he found you to be endued with rare conscientiousness and already ripe in your knowledge of the laws you were in truth the chief glory of your times and you won his favour by arts which none could blame for his mind by nature anxious in all things was able to lay aside its cares while you supported the weight of the royal councils with the strength of your eloquence in you he had a charming secretary a rigidly upright judge a minister to whom avarice was unknown you never fixed a scandalous tariff for the sale of his benefits you chose to take your reward in public esteem not in riches therefore it was that this most righteous ruler chose you to be honoured by his glorious friendship because he saw you to be free from all taint of corrupt vices how often did he fix your place among his white-haired counsellors inasmuch as they by the experience of years had not come up to the point from which you had started he found that he could safely praise your excellent disposition open-handed in bestowing benefits tightly closed against the vices of avarice 
thus you passed on to the dignity of the master of the offices which you obtained not by a pecuniary payment but as a testimony to your character in that office you were ever ready to help the quaestors for when pure eloquence was needed men always resorted to you and in fact when you were at hand and ready to help there was no accurate division of labour among the various offices of the state no one could find an occasion to murmur aught against you although you bore all the unpopularity which accompanies the favour of a prince your detractors were conquered by the integrity of your life your adversaries bowing to public opinion were obliged to praise even while they hated you to the lord of the land you showed yourself a friendly judge and an intimate minister when public affairs no longer claimed him he would ask you to tell him the stories in which wise men of old have clothed their maxims that by his own deeds he might equal the ancient heroes the courses of the stars the ebb and flow of the sea the marvels of springing fountains unto all these subjects would that most acute questioner inquire so that by his diligent investigations into the nature of things he seemed to be a philosopher in the purple this sketch of the character of the minister throws light incidentally on that of the monarch who employed him of course as a general rule history cannot allow the personages with whom she deals to write their own testimonials but in this case there is reason to think that the self-portraiture of cassiodorus is accurate in its main outlines though our modern taste would have suggested the employment of somewhat less florid colouring one literary service which cassiodorus rendered to the ostrogothic monarchy is thus described by himself still speaking in his young king's name and addressing the roman senate he was not satisfied with extolling surviving kings from whom their panegyrist might hope for a reward he extended his labours to our remote ancestry learning from books that which the hoary memories of our old men scarcely retained he drew forth from their hiding-place the kings of the goths hidden by long forgetfulness he restored the amals in all the lustre of their lineage evidently proving that we have kings for our ancestors up to the seventeenth generation he made the origin of the goths part of roman history collecting into one wreath the flowers which had previously been scattered over the wide plains of literature consider therefore what love he showed to you the senate in uttering our praises while teaching that the nation of your sovereign has been from ancient time a marvellous people so that you who from the days of your ancestors have been truly deemed noble are also now ruled over by the long descended progeny of kings these sentences relate to the gothic history of cassiodorus which once existed in twelve books but is now unfortunately lost a hasty abridgment of it made by an ignorant monk named jordanes is now all that remains even this with its many faults is a most precious monument of the early history of the teutonic invaders of the empire and it is from its pages that much of the information contained in the previous chapters is drawn the object of the original statesman author in composing his gothic history is plainly stated in the above sentences he wishes to heal the wound given to roman pride by the fact of the supremacy in italy of a gothic lord and in order to effect this object he strings together all that he can collect of the sagas of the gothic people showing the great deeds of the amal progenitors of theodoric whose lineage he traces back into distant centuries it is true he seems to say to the senators of rome that you who once ruled the world are now ruled by an alien but at least that alien is no newcomer into greatness he and his progenitors have been crowned kings for centuries his people who are quartered among you and claim one-third of the soil of italy are an old historic people their ancestors fought under the walls of troy they defeated cyrus king of persia they warred not ingloriously with Perdiccas of Macedonia. These classical elements of the Gothic history of Cassiodorus, which rest chiefly on a misunderstanding of the vague and unscientific term Scythians, are valueless for the purposes of history, but the old Gothic sagas, of which he has evidently also preserved some fragments, are both interesting and valuable when a nation has played so important a part on the theatre of the world as that assigned to the Goths even their legendary stories of the past are precious 
whether these early amal kings fought and ruled and migrated as the sagas represent them to have done or not in any case the belief that these were their achievements was a part of the intellectual heritage of the gothic peoples the songs to whose lullaby the cradle of a great nation is rocked are a precious possession to the historian the other most important work of cassiodorus is the collection of letters called the varii in twelve books this collection contains all the chief state papers composed by him during the period somewhat more than thirty years which was covered by his official life five books are devoted to the letters written at the dictation of theodoric two to the formulae or model letters addressed to the various dignitaries of the state on their accession to office three to the letters written in the name of theodoric's immediate successors his grandson daughter and nephew and two to those written by cassiodorus himself in his own name when he had attained the crowning dignity of praetorian prefect i have already made some extracts from this collection of various epistles and the reader from the specimens thus submitted to him will have formed some conception of the character of the author's style that style is diffuse and turgid marked in an eminent degree with the prevailing faults of the sixth century an age of literary decay when the language of cicero and virgil was falling into its dotage there is much ill-timed display of irrelevant learning and a grievous absence of simplicity and directness in the various epistles it must be regarded as a misfortune for theodoric that his maxims of statesmanship which were assuredly full of manly sense and vigour should have reached us only in such a shape diluted with the platitudes and false rhetoric of a scholar of the decadence still even through all these disguises it is easy to discern the genuine patriotism both of the great king and of his minister their earnest desire that right not might should determine every case that came before them their true insight into the vices and the virtues of each of the two different nations which now shared italy between them their persevering endeavour to keep civilitas intact their determination to oppose alike the turbulence of the goth and the chicane of the scheming roman as specimens of the rhetoric of cassiodorus when he is trying his highest flights the reader may care to peruse the two following letters the first was written to faustus the praetorian prefect to complain of his delay in forwarding some cargoes of corn from calabria to rome what are you waiting for says cassiodorus writing in his master's name why are your ships not spreading their sails to the breeze when the south wind is blowing and your oarsmen are urging on your vessels has the sucking fish echinaeus fastened its bite upon them through the liquid waves or have the shellfishes of the indian sea with similar power stayed your keels with their lips those creatures whose quiet touch is said to hold back more than the tumultuous elements can possibly urge forward the idle bark stands still though winged with swelling sails and has no way on her though the breeze is propitious she is fixed without anchors she is moored without cables and these tiny animals pull back more than all such favouring powers can propel therefore when the subject wave would hasten the vessel's course it appears that it stands fixed on the surface of the sea and in marvellous style the floating ship is remained immovable while the wave is hurried along by countless currents but let us describe the nature of another kind of fish perhaps the crews of the aforesaid ships have been benumbed into idleness by the touch of a torpedo by which the right hand of him who attacks it is so deadened even through the spear by which it is itself wounded that while still part of a living body it hangs down benumbed without sense or motion i think some such misfortunes must have happened to men who are unable to move themselves but no the sucking fish of these men is their hindering corruption the shellfishes that bite them are their avaricious hearts the torpedo that benumbs them is lying guile with perverted ingenuity they manufacture delays that they may seem to have met with a run of ill luck let your greatness whom it especially behoves to take thought for such matters cause that this be put right by speedious rebuke lest the famine which will otherwise ensue be deemed to be the child of negligence rather than of the barrenness of the land the occasion of the second letter varia ten thirty was as follows 
some brazen images of elephants which adorned the sacred street of rome were falling into ruin cassiodorus writing in the name of one of theodoric's successors to the prefect of the city orders that their gaping limbs should be strengthened by hooks and their pendulous bellies should be supported by masonry he then proceeds to give to the admiring prefect some wonderful information as to the natural history of the elephant he regrets that the metal effigies should be so soon destroyed when the animal which they represent is accustomed to live more than a thousand years the living elephant he says when it is once prostrate on the ground cannot rise unaided because it has no joints in its feet hence when they are helping men to fell timber you see numbers of them lying on the earth till men come and help them to rise thus this creature so formidable by its size is really more helpless than the tiny ant the elephant wiser than all other creatures renders religious adoration to the ruler of all also to good princes but if a tyrant approach it will not pay him the homage which is due only to the virtuous it uses its proboscis that nose-like hand which nature has given it in compensation for its very short neck for the benefit of its master accepting the presents which will be profitable to him it always walks cautiously remembering that fatal fall into the hunter's pit which was the beginning of its captivity when requested to do so it exhales its breath which is said to be a remedy for the headache when it comes to water it sucks up a vast quantity in its trunk and then at the word of command squirts it forth like a shower if any one have treated its demands with contempt it pours forth such a stream of dirty water over him that one would think that a river had entered his house for this beast has a wonderfully long memory both of injury and of kindness its eyes are small but move solemnly so that there is a sort of royal majesty in its appearance and it despises scurrile jests while it always looks with pleasure on that which is honourable it must be admitted that if the official communications of modern statesmen thus anxiously combined amusement with instruction the dull routine of i have the honour to inform and i beg to remain your obedient humble servant would acquire a charm of which it is now destitute i have translated two letters which show the ludicrous side of the literary character of cassiodorus in justice to this honest if somewhat pedantic servant of theodoric i will close this sketch of his character with a state paper of a better type and one which incidentally throws some light on the social condition of italy under the goths theodoric to the illustrious neudes varia five twenty nine we were moved to sympathy by the long petition of ocker but yet more by beholding the old hero bereft of the blessing of sight inasmuch as the calamities which we witness make more impression upon us than those which we can only hear he poor man living on in perpetual darkness had to borrow the sight of another to hasten to our presence in order that he might feel the sweetness of our clemency though he could not gaze upon our countenance he complains that gudilla and opus probably two gothic nobles or a gothic chief and his wife have reduced him to a state of slavery a condition unknown to him or his fathers since he once served in our army as a free man we marvel that such a man should be dragged into bondage who on account of his infirmity ought to have been liberated by a lawful owner it is a new kind of ostentation to claim the services of such a one the sight of whom shocks you and to call that man a slave to whom you ought rather to minister with divine compassion he adds also that all claims of this nature have been already judged invalid after careful examination by count pythias a man celebrated for the correctness of his judgments but now overwhelmed by the weight of his calamity he cannot assert his freedom by his own right hand which in the strong man is the most effectual advocate of his claims we however whose peculiar property it is to administer justice indifferently whether between men of equal or unequal condition do by this present mandate decree that if in the judgment of the aforesaid pythias ochre have proved himself free-born you shall at once remove those who are harassing him with their claims nor shall they dare any longer to mock at the calamities of others these people who once convicted ought to have been covered with shame for their wicked designs end of chapter nine
Chapter Ten of Theodoric the Goth by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: The Aryan League. The position of Theodoric in relation both to his own subjects and to the empire was seriously modified by one fact to which hitherto I have only alluded casually: the fact that he like the great majority of the teutonic invaders of the empire was an adherent of the arian form of christianity in order to estimate at its true value the bearing of religion or at least of religious profession on politics at the time of the fall of the roman state we might well look at the condition of another dominion founded under the combined influence of martial spirit and religious zeal which is now going to pieces under our very eyes i mean the empire of the ottomans in the lands which are still under the sway of the sultan religion may not be a great spiritual force but it is at any rate a great political lever when you have said that a man is a muslim or a druze a member of the orthodox or of the catholic church an armenian or a protestant you have almost always said enough to define his political position without the need of additional information you have already got the elements of his civic equation and can say whether he is a loyal subject of the port or whether he looks to russia or greece to france austria or england as the sovereign of his future choice in fact as has been often pointed out in the east at this day religion is nationality very similar to this was the condition of the ancient world at the time when the general movement of the northern nations began the battle with heathenism was virtually over christianity being the unquestioned conqueror but the question which of the many modifications of christianity devised by the subtle hellenic and oriental intellects should be the victor was a question still unsettled and debated with the keenest interest on all the shores of the mediterranean so keen indeed was the interest that it sometimes seems almost to have blinded the disputants to the fact that the roman empire the greatest political work that the world has ever seen was falling in ruins around them when we want information about the march of armies and the fall of states the chroniclers to whom we turn for guidance withholding that which we seek deluge us with trivial talk about the squabbles of monks and bishops about timothy the weasel and peter the fuller and a host of other self-seeking ecclesiastics to whose names to whose characters and to whose often violent deaths we are profoundly and absolutely indifferent but though a feeling of utter weariness comes over the mind of most readers while watching the theological sword-play of the fourth and fifth centuries the historical student cannot afford to shut his eyes altogether to the battle of the creeds which produced results of such infinite importance to the crystallizing process by which mediaeval europe was formed out of the roman empire as i have just said theodoric the ostrogoth like almost all the great teutonic swarm leaders like alaric the visigoth like gaiseric the vandal like gundobad the burgundian was an arian on the other hand the emperors zeno for instance and anastasius and the great majority of the population of italy and of the provinces of the empire were catholic what was the amount of theological divergence which was conveyed by these terms arian and catholic or to speak more judicially for the arians averred that they were the true catholics and that their opponents were heretics arian and athanasian as this is not the place for a disquisition on disputed points of theology it is sufficient to say that while the athanasian held for truth the whole of the nicene creed the arian at least that type of arian with whom we are here concerned would in that part which relates to the son of god leave out the words being of one substance with the father and would substitute for them being like unto the father in such manner as the scriptures declare he would also have refused to repeat the words which assert the godhead of the holy spirit these were important differences but it will be seen at once that they were not so broad as those which now generally separate orthodox from heterodox theologians the reasons which led the barbarian invaders of the empire to accept the arian form of christianity are not yet fully disclosed to us 
the cause could not be an uncultured people's preference for a simple faith for the arian champions were at least as subtle and technical in their theology as the athanasian and often surpassed them in these qualities it is possible that some remembrances of the mythology handed down to them by their fathers made them willing to accept a subordinate christ a spiritualized bolder the beautiful divine yet subject to death standing as it were upon the steps of his father's throne rather than the dogma too highly spiritualized for their apprehension of one god in three persons but probably the chief cause of the arianism of the german invaders was the fact that the empire itself was to a great extent arian when they were in friendly relations with it and were accepting both religion and civilization at its hands in the middle years of the fourth century the most powerful factor in this change the man who more than all others was responsible for the conversion of the germanic races to christianity in its arian form was the gothic bishop ulfilas three eleven to three eighty one whose construction of an alphabet and translation of the scriptures into the language of his fellow countrymen have secured for him imperishable renown among all who are interested in the history of human speech ulfilas who has been well termed the apostle of the goths seems to have embraced christianity as a young man when he was dwelling in constantinople as a hostage thus in some measure anticipating the part which one hundred and thirty years later was to be played by theodoric and having been ordained first lector reader and afterwards three forty one bishop of gothia he spent the remaining forty years of his life in missionary journeys among his countrymen in dacia in collecting those of his converts who fled from the persecution of their still heathen rulers and settling them as colonists in moesia and most important of all in his great work of the translation of the bible into gothic of this work as is well known some precious fragments still remain most precious of all the glorious silver manuscript of the gospels codex argenteus which is supposed to have been written in the sixth century and which after many wanderings and an eventful history rests now in a scandinavian land in the library of the university of Uppsala it is well worth while to make a pilgrimage to that friendly and hospitable swedish city if for no other purpose than to see the letters traced in silver on parchment of rich purple dye in which the skilful amanuensis laboriously transcribed the sayings of christ rendered by the bishop ulfilas into the language of alaric for that codex argenteus is the oldest of all extant monuments of teutonic speech the first fruit of that mighty tree which now spreads its branches over half the civilized world with the theological bearings of the arian controversy we have no present concern but it is impossible not to notice the unfortunate political results of the difference of creed between the german invaders and the great majority of the inhabitants of the empire the cultivators of the soil and the dwellers in the cities had suffered much from the misgovernment of their rulers during the last two centuries of imperial sway they could to some extent appreciate the nobler moral qualities of the barbarian settlers their manliness their truthfulness their higher standard of chastity nor is it idle to suppose that if there had been perfect harmony of religious faith between the newcomers and the old inhabitants they might soon have settled down into vigorous and well-ordered communities such as theodoric and cassiodorus longed to behold combining the teutonic strength with the roman reverence for law religious discord made it impossible to realize this ideal the orthodox clergy loathed and dreaded the invaders infected as they said with the arian pravity the barbarian kings unaccustomed to have their will opposed by men who never wielded a broadsword were masterful and high-handed in their demand for absolute obedience even when their commands related to things of god rather than to things of caesar and the arian bishops and priests who stood beside their thrones and who had sometimes long arrears of vengeance for past insult or oppression to exact often wrought up the monarch's mind to a perfect frenzy of fanatical rage and goaded him to cruel deeds which made reconciliation between the warring creeds hopelessly impossible in africa the vandal kings set on foot a persecution of their catholic subjects which rivalled nay exceeded the horrors of the persecution under diocletian churches were destroyed bishops banished and their flocks forbidden to elect their successors 
nay sometimes in the fierce quest after hidden treasure eminent ecclesiastics were stretched on the rack their mouths were filled with noisome dirt or cords were twisted round their foreheads or their shins in gaul under the visigothic king Euric, the persecution was less savage but it was stubborn and severe here too the congregations were forbidden to elect successors to their exiled bishops the paths to the churches were stopped up with thorns and briars cattle grazed on the grass-grown altar steps and the rain came through the shattered roofs into the dismantled basilicas thus all round the shores of the mediterranean there was strife and bitter heart-burning between the roman provincial and his teutonic guest not so much because one was or called himself a roman while the other called himself goth burgundian or vandal but because one was athanasian and the other arian with this strife of creeds theodoric for the greater part of his reign refused to concern himself he remained an arian as his fathers had been before him but he protected the catholic church in the privileges which she had acquired and he refused to exert his royal authority either to threaten or allure men into adopting his creed so evenly for many years did he hold the balance between the rival faiths that it was reported of him that he put to death a catholic priest who apostatized to arianism in order to attain the royal favour and though this story does not perhaps rest on sufficient authority there can be no doubt that the general testimony of the marvelling catholic subjects of theodoric would have coincided with that already quoted from the bishop of ravenna that he attempted nothing against the catholic faith still though determined not to govern in the interests of a sect it was impossible that theodoric's political relations should not be to a certain extent modified by his religious affinities let us glance at the position of the chief states with which a ruler of italy at the close of the fifth century necessarily came into contact first of all we have the empire practically confined at this time to the balkan peninsula south of the danube asia minor syria and egypt and presided over by the elderly politic but unpopular anastasius this state is catholic though as we shall hereafter see not in hearty alliance with the church of rome westward from the empire along the southern shore of the mediterranean stretches the great kingdom of the vandals with carthage for its capital they have a powerful navy but their kings Gunthermund, 484 to 496 and thrasamund 496 to 523 do not seem to be disposed to renew the buccaneering expeditions of their grandfather the great vandal gaiseric they are decided arians and keep up a stern steady pressure on their catholic subjects who are spared however the ruthless brutalities practised upon them by earlier vandal kings the relations of the vandals with the ostrogothic kingdom seem to have been of a friendly character during almost the whole reign of theodoric Thrasamund, the fourth king who reigned at Carthage, married Amalafrida, Theodoric's sister, who brought with her as dowry possession of the strong fortress of Lilibaeum, Marsala, in the west of Sicily, and who was accompanied to her new home by a brilliant train of one thousand Gothic nobles with five thousand mounted retainers. In the north and west of Spain dwell the nation of the Suevi, teutonic and arian but practically out of the sphere of european politics and who half a century after the death of theodoric will be absorbed by their visigothic neighbours this latter state the kingdom of the visigoths is apparently at the end of the fifth century by far the most powerful of the new barbarian monarchies all spain except its northwestern corner and something like half of gaul namely that region which is contained between the pyrenees and the loire owns the sway of the young king whose capital city is toulouse and who though a stranger in blood bears the name of the great visigoth who first battered a breach in the walls of rome the mighty alaric this alaric the second four eighty five to five o seven the son of Euric who had been the most powerful sovereign of his dynasty inherited neither his father's force of character nor the bitterness of his arianism the persecution of the catholics was suspended or ceased altogether and we may picture to ourselves the congregations again wending their way by unblockaded paths to the house of prayer the churches once more roofed in and again made gorgeous by the stately ceremonial of the catholic rite 
in other ways too alaric showed himself anxious to conciliate the favour of his roman subjects he ordered an abstract of the imperial code to be prepared and this abstract under the name of the breviarium alaricianum is to this day one of our most valuable sources of information as to roman law he is also said to have directed the construction of the canal which still bears his name canal d'alaric and which connecting the ador with the n assists the irrigation of the meadows of gascony but all these attempts to close the feud between the king and his orthodox subjects were in vain when the day of trial came it was seen as it had long been suspected that the sympathies and the powerful influence of the bishops and clergy were thrown entirely on the side of the catholic invader between the visigothic and ostrogothic courts there was firm friendship and alliance the remembrance of their common origin and of many perils and hardships shared together on the shores of the euxine and in the passes of the balkans being fortified by the knowledge of the dangers to which their common profession of arianism exposed them amidst the catholic population of the empire the alliance which had served theodoric in good stead when the visigoths helped him in his struggle with odovacar was yet further strengthened by kinship the young king of toulouse having received in marriage a princess from ravenna whose name is variously given as aravagni or ostrogotho a matrimonial alliance also connected theodoric with the king of the burgundians these invaders who were destined so strangely to disappear out of history themselves while giving their name to such wide and rich regions of medieval europe occupied at this time the valleys of the saone and the rhone as well as the country which we now call switzerland their king gundobad a man somewhat older than theodoric had once interfered zealously in the politics of italy making and unmaking emperors and striking for odovacar against his ostrogothic rival now however his whole energies were directed to extending his dominions in gaul and to securing his somewhat precarious throne from the machinations of the catholic bishops his subjects for he too was by profession an arian though of a tolerant type and though he sometimes seemed on the point of crossing the abyss and declaring himself a convert to the nicene faith feudo gotho sister of aravagni was given by her father theodoric in marriage to sigismund the son and heir of gundobad the event which intensified the fears of all these arian kings and which left to each one little more than the hope that he might be the last to be devoured was the conversion to catholicism of clovis the heathen king of the franks that fortunate barbarian who by a well-timed baptism won for his tribe of rude warriors the possession of the fairest land in europe and the glory of giving birth to one of the foremost nations in the world as we are here come to one of the commonplaces of history i need but very briefly remind the reader of the chief stages in the upward course of the young frankish king born in 466 he succeeded his father childeric as one of the kings of the salian franks in 481 the lands of the salians occupied but the extreme northern corner of modern france and a portion of flanders and even here clovis was but one of many kinglets allied by blood but frequently engaged in petty and inglorious wars with one another for five years the young salian chieftain lived in peace with his neighbours in the twentieth year of his age 486 he sprang with one bound into fame and dominion by attacking and overcoming the roman siagrius who with ill-defined prerogatives and bearing the title not of emperor or of prefect but of king had succeeded amidst the wreck of the western empire in preserving some of the fairest districts of the north of gaul from barbarian domination with the help of some of his brother chiefs clovis overthrew this king of soissons siagrius took refuge at the court of toulouse and the frankish king now felt himself strong enough to send to the young alaric who had ascended the throne only a year before a peremptory message insisting under the penalty of a declaration of war on the surrender of the roman fugitive the visigoth was mean-spirited enough to purchase peace by delivering up his guest bound in fetters to the ambassadors of clovis who shortly after ordered him to be privily done to death from that time we may well believe clovis felt confident that he should one day vanquish alaric about seven years after this event 493 
came his memorable marriage with clotilda a burgundian princess who unlike her arian uncle gundobad was enthusiastically devoted to the catholic faith and who ceased not by private conversations and by inducing him to listen to the sermons of the eloquent bishop remigius to endeavour to win her husband from the religion of his heathen forefathers to the creed of rome and of the empire clovis however for some years wavered sprung himself according to the traditions of his people from the sea-god merovius he was not in haste to renounce this fabulous glory nor to acknowledge as lord one who had been reared in a carpenter's shop at nazareth he allowed clotilda to have her eldest son baptized but when the child soon after died he took that as a sign of the power and vengeance of the old gods a second son was born was baptized fell sick had that child died clovis would probably have remained an obstinate heathen but the little one recovered given back as was believed to the earnest prayers of his mother it was perhaps during these years of indecision as to his future religious profession that clovis consented to a matrimonial alliance between his house and that of the arian theodoric the great ostrogoth married probably about the year 495 the sister of clovis orgo Fleda, who as we may reasonably conjecture renounced the worship of the gods of her people and was baptized by an arian bishop on becoming queen of the goths and romans unfortunately the meagre annals of the time give us no hint of the character or history of the princess who was thus transferred from the fens of flanders to the marshes of ravenna every indication shows that she came from a far lower level of civilization than that which her husband's people occupied did she soon learn to conform herself to the stately ceremonial which ravenna borrowed from constantinople did she too speak of civilitas and the necessity of obeying the roman laws and did she share the glorious colloquies which her husband held with the exuberant cassiodorus when war came between the ostrogoth and the frank did she openly show her sympathy with her brother clovis or did she forget her people and her father's house and cleave with all her soul to the fortunes of theodoric as to all these interesting questions the various letters with all their diffuseness give us no more information than the most jejune of the analysts the only fact upon which we might found a conjecture is the love of literature and of roman civilization displayed by her daughter amala suentha which inclines us to guess that the mother may have thrown off her frankish wildness when she came into the softening atmosphere of italy we return to the event so memorable in the history of the world clovis's conversion to christianity in the year 486 he went forth to fight his barbarian neighbours in the southeast the alamanni the battle was a stubborn and bloody one as well it might be when two such thunderclouds met the savage frank and the savage alaman already the frankish host seemed wavering when clovis lifting his eyes to heaven and shedding tears in the agony of his soul said o jesus christ whom clotilda declares to be the son of the living god who art said to give help to the weary and victory to them that trust in thee i humbly pray for thy glorious aid and promise that if thou wilt indulge me with the victory over these enemies i will believe in thee and be baptized in thy name for i have called on my own gods and have found that they are of no power and do not help those who call upon them scarcely had he spoken the words when the tide of battle turned the franks recovered from their panic the alamanni turned to flight their king was slain and his people submitted to clovis who returning told his queen how he had called upon her god in the day of battle and been delivered then followed after a short consultation with the leading men of his kingdom which made the change of faith in some degree a national act the celebrated scene in the cathedral of rheims where the king having confessed his faith in the holy trinity was baptized in the name of the father and the son and the holy ghost the poetical bishop uttering the well-known words bow down thy head in lowliness o sicambrian adore what thou hast burned and burn what thou hast adored the streets of the city were hung with bright banners white curtains adorned the churches and clouds of sweet incense filled all the great basilica in which the new constantine stooped to the baptismal water he entered the cathedral a mere sicambrian chieftain 
the descendant of the sea god he emerged from it amid the acclamations of the joyous provincials the eldest son of the church the result of this ceremony was to change the political relations of every state in gaul though the franks were among the roughest and most uncivilized of the tribes that had poured westward across the rhine as catholics they were now sure of a welcome from the catholic clergy of every city and where the clergy led the roman provincials or in other words the latin-speaking laity generally followed immediately after his baptism clovis received a letter of enthusiastic welcome into the true fold written by avitus bishop of Vion, the most eminent ecclesiastic of the burgundian kingdom i regret says avitus that i could not be present in the flesh at that most glorious solemnity but as your most sublime humility had sent me a messenger to inform me of your intention when night fell i retired to rest already secure of your conversion how often my friends and i went over the scene in our imaginations we saw the band of holy prelates vying with one another in the ambition of lowly service each one wishing to comfort the royal limbs with the water of life we saw that head so terrible to the nations bowed low before the servants of god the hair which had grown long under the helmet now crowned with the diadem of the holy anointing the coat of mail laid aside and the white limbs wrapped in linen robes as white and spotless as themselves one thing only have i to ask of you that you will spread the light which you have yourself received to the nations around you scatter the seeds of faith from out of the good treasure of your heart and be not ashamed by embassies directed to this very end to strengthen in other states the cause of that god who has so greatly exalted your fortunes shine on for ever upon those who are present by the lustre of your diadem upon those who are absent by the glory of your name we are touched by your happiness as often as you fight in those heretical lands we conquer the use of language like this showing such earnest devotion to the cause of clovis in the subject of a rival monarch well illustrates the tendency of the frankish king's conversion to loosen the bonds of loyalty in the neighbouring states and to facilitate the spread of his dominion over the whole of gaul in fact the frankish kingdom having become catholic was like the magnetic mountain of oriental fable which drew to itself all the iron nails of the ships which approached it and so caused them to sink in hopeless dissolution seeing this obvious result of the conversion of the frank some historians especially in the last century were disposed to look upon that conversion as a mere hypocritical pretence later critics have shown that this is not an accurate account of the matter doubtless the motives which induced clovis to accept baptism and to profess faith in the crucified one were of the meanest poorest and most unspiritual kind few men have ever been further from that which christ called the kingdom of heaven than this grasping and brutal frankish chief to whom robbery falsehood murder were after his baptism as much as before it perhaps even more than before it the ordinary steps in the ladder of his elevation but the rough barbaric soul had in its dim fashion a faith that the god of the christians was the mightiest god and that it would go well with those who submitted to him in his rude style he made imaginary bargains with the most high so much reverence to clotilda's god so many offerings at the shrine of san martin so much land to the church of san genoveffa on condition that i shall beat down my enemies before me and extend my dominions from the seine to the pyrenees this is the kind of calculation which the missionaries in our own day are only too well accustomed to hear from the lips of barbarous potentates like those of uganda and fiji a conversion thus effected brings no honour to any church and the utter selfishness and even profanity of the transaction disgusts the devout souls of every communion still the conversion of clovis was not in its essence and origin a hypocritical scheme for obtaining the support of the catholic clergy in gaul how clearly soever the new convert may have soon perceived that from that support he would suck no small advantage the first of his Aryan neighbours whom Clovis struck at was the Burgundian Gundobad. In the year 500, 
he besieged Dijon with a large army. Gundobad called on his brother Godegizel, who reigned at Geneva, for help, but that brother was secretly in league with Clovis, and at a critical moment joined the invaders, who were for a time completely successful. Gundobad was driven into exile, and Godegizel, accepting the position of a tributary ally of his powerful Frankish friend, ruled over the whole Burgundian kingdom. His rule, however, seems not to have been heartily accepted by the Burgundian people. The exiled Gundobad returned with a few followers who daily increased in number. He found himself strong enough to besiege Godegizel in Vion. He at length entered the city through the blowhole of an aqueduct, slew his brother with his own hand, and put his chief adherents to death with exquisite torments. The Frankish troops who garrisoned Vion were taken prisoners, but honourably treated and sent to Toulouse to be guarded by Alaric the Visigoth, who had probably assisted the enterprise of Gundobad. The inactivity of Clovis during this counter-revolution in Burgundy is not easily explained. Either there was some great explosion of Burgundian national feeling against the Franks, which for the time made further interference dangerous, or Gundobad, having added his brother's dominions to his own, was now too strong for Clovis to meddle with, or, which seems on the whole the most probable supposition, Gundobad himself, secretly inclining towards the Catholic cause, had made peace with Clovis through the mediation of the clergy, and came back to Vion to rule thenceforward as a dependent ally, though not an avowed tributary of Clovis and the Franks. We shall soon have occasion to observe that in the crisis of its fortunes the confederacy of Aryan states could not count on the cooperation of Gundobad. To form such a confederacy and to league together all the older Aryan monarchies against this one aspiring Catholic state which threatened to absorb them all was now the main purpose of Theodoric. He seems, however, to have remained meanwhile on terms of courtesy and apparent harmony with his powerful brother-in-law. He congratulated him on a second victorious campaign against the Alamanni, about 503 or 504, and he took some trouble to comply with a request which Clovis had made to him to find out a skilful harper who might be sent to his court. The letter which relates to this transaction is a curious specimen of Cassiodorus's style. It is addressed to the young philosopher Boethius, a man whose varied accomplishments adorned the middle period of the reign of Theodoric, and whose tragical death was to bring sadness over its close. To this man, whose knowledge of the musical art was preeminent in his generation, Cassiodorus addresses one of the longest letters in his collection. It would occupy about six pages of an ordinary octavo, only one or two sentences of which relate to the business in hand. The letter begins, Since the king of the Franks, attracted by the fame of our banquets, has with earnest prayers besought us to send him a harper, Cytherodus, our only hope of executing his commission lies in you, whom we know to be accomplished in musical learning. For it will be easy for you to choose a well-skilled man, having yourself been able to attain to that high and abstruse study. Then follow a string of reflections on the soothing power of music, a description of the five modes, Dorian, Phrygian, Aeolian, Ionian, and Lydian, and of the diapason, instances of the power of music drawn from the scriptures and from heathen mythology, a discussion on the harmony of the spheres, and a doubt whether the enjoyment of this astral music be rightly placed among the delights of heaven. At length the marvellous state paper draws to a close. But since we have made this pleasing digression, because it is always agreeable to talk about learning with learned men, let your wisdom choose out for us the best harper of the day for the purpose that we have mentioned. Herein will you accomplish a task somewhat like that of Orpheus, when he with sweet sounds tamed the fierce hearts of savage creatures. The thanks which we owe you will be expressed by liberal compensation, for you obey our rule, and to the utmost of your power render it illustrious by your attainments. Evidently the court of Theodoric was regarded as a centre of light and civilization by his Teutonic neighbours, the lords of the new kingdoms to the north of him. King Gundobad desired to become the possessor of a clepsydra, or water-clock, 
such as had long been used in athens and rome to regulate the time allotted to the orators in public debates he also wished to obtain an accurately graduated sundial for both he made request to theodoric and again the universal genius boethius was applied to cassiodorus writes him in his master's name a letter which gives us some interesting information as to the past career of boethius and then proceeds to give a specification of the required machines in language so magnificent as to be at any rate to modern mechanicians hopelessly unintelligible then a shorter letter to accompany the clock and dial is written to king gundobad this letter which is written in a slightly condescending tone says that the tie of affinity between the two kings makes it right that gundobad should receive benefits from theodoric let burgundy under your sway learn to examine the most curious objects and to praise the inventions of the ancients through you she is laying aside her old barbarian tastes and while she admires the prudence of her king she rightly desires the works of wise men of old let her mark out the different intervals of the day by her actions let her in the most fitting manner assign the occupation of each hour this is to lead the true human life as distinguished from that of the brutes who know the flight of time only by the cravings of their appetites a time however was approaching when this pleasant interchange of courtesies between the three sovereigns ostrogothic frankish and burgundian was to be succeeded by the din of war alaric the visigoth alarmed at the victorious progress of the frankish king sent a message to this effect if my brother is willing let him consider my proposal that by the favour of god we should have an interview with one another clovis accepted the offer and the two kings met on an island in the loire near amboise but either no alliance could be formed owing to religious differences or the treaty so made was too weak for the strain which it had to bear and it became manifest before long that war would soon break out between francia and gothia theodoric exerted himself strenuously to prevent the impending struggle which as he too surely foresaw would bring only disaster to his visigothic allies he caused his eloquent secretary to write letters to clovis to alaric to gundobad to the neighbours of the franks on their eastern border the kings of the heruli the warni and the thuringians to clovis he dilated on the horrors which war brings upon the inhabitants of the warring lands who have a right to expect that the kinship of their lords will keep them at peace a few paltry words were no sufficient cause of war between two such monarchs and it was the act of a passionate and hot-headed man to be mobilising his troops while he was sending his first embassy to alaric he sent an earnest warning against engaging in war with clovis you are surrounded by an innumerable multitude of subjects and you are proud of the remembrance of the defeat of attila but war is a terribly dangerous game and you know not how the long peace may have softened the warlike fibre of your people he besought gundobad to join with him in preserving peace between the combatants to each of whom he had offered his arbitration it behoves us old men to moderate the wrath of the royal youths who should reverence our age though they are still in the flower of their hot youth the kings of the barbarians were reminded of the friendship which alaric's father euric had shown them in the old days and invited to join in a league of peace in order to check the lawless aggressions of clovis which threatened danger to all the diplomatic action of theodoric was powerless to avert the war possibly even it may have stimulated clovis to strike rapidly before a hostile coalition could be formed against him at an assembly of his nation perhaps the camp of march in the early part of 507 he impetuously declared i take it grievously amiss that these arians should hold so large a part of gaul let us go and overcome them with god's help and bring the land into subjection to us the saying pleased the whole multitude and the collected army marched southward to the loire on their way they passed through the territory owned by the monastery of saint martin of tours the greatest saint of gaul 
here the king commanded them to abstain religiously from all depredations taking only grass for their horses and water from the streams one of the soldiers finding a quantity of hay in the possession of a peasant took it from him arguing that hay was grass and so came within the permitted exception he was however at once cut down with a sword the king exclaiming what hope shall we have of victory if we offend the blessed martin having first prayed for a sign clovis sent his messengers with gifts to the great basilica of tours and behold when these messengers set foot in the sacred building the choristers were singing an antiphon taken from the eighteenth psalm thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me meanwhile alaric taken at unawares short of men and short of money was endeavouring to remedy the latter deficiency by a depreciation of the currency to swell his slender battalions he evidently looked to his father-in-law theodoric whose peacemaking letter had ended with these words we look upon your enemy as the common enemy of all whoever strives against you will rightly have to deal with me as a foe yet notwithstanding this assurance no ostrogothic troops came at this time to the help of the visigoths in the great dearth of historical material our account of these transactions has had to be made up from scattered and fragmentary notices which do not enable us to explain this strange inaction of so true-hearted an ally it is not imputed to him as a fault by any contemporary authority and it seems reasonable to suppose that not the will but the power to help his menaced son-in-law was wanting one alarming change in the situation had revealed itself since theodoric ordered his secretary to write the letters recommending an anti-frankish confederacy of kings gundobad the burgundian was now the declared ally of clovis and promised himself a share of the spoil so powerful an enemy on the flank threatening the communications of the two gothic states may very probably have been the reason why no timely succour was sent from ravenna to toulouse clovis and his frankish host hungering for the spoil pressed forwards and succeeded apparently without opposition in crossing the broad river loire alaric had taken up a strong position at the campus vogladensis vouille de pontmont vion about ten miles from poitiers here he wished to remain on the defensive till the expected succours from theodoric could arrive but his soldiers confident in their power to beat the franks unassisted began to revile their king's overcaution and his father-in-law's delay and forced alaric to fight the goths began hurling their missile weapons but the daring franks rushed in upon them and commenced a hand-to-hand -hand encounter in which they were completely victorious the goths turned to flee and clovis riding up to where alaric was fighting slew him with his own hand he himself had immediately afterwards a narrow escape from two of the enemy who coming suddenly upon him thrust their long spears at him one on each side the strength of his coat of mail however and the speed of his horse saved him from a disaster which might possibly even then have turned the tide of victory the result of this battle was the complete overthrow of the visigothic kingdom of toulouse in a certain sense it survived and for two centuries played a great part in europe as the spanish kingdom of toledo but as competitors for dominion in gaul the visigoths henceforward disappear from history there seems to have been a certain want of toughness in the visigothic fibre a tendency to rashness combined with a tendency to panic which made it possible for their enemies to achieve a complete triumph over them in a single battle. 376. Athanaric staked his all on one battle with the Huns and lost by the rivers of Bessarabia. 507. Alaric II, as we have seen, staked his all on one battle with the Franks and lost on the Campus Vogladensis. 701. Two centuries later, roderick staked his all upon one battle with the moors and lost at jerez de la frontera all through the year 507 the allied forces of franks and burgundians seem to have poured over the southwest and south of gaul annexing angouleme saintonge auvergne and gascony to the dominions of clovis and provence to the dominions of gundobad 
only the strong city of Arles and perhaps the fortress of Carcassonne, that most interesting relic of the early Middle Ages, which still shows the handiwork of Visigothic kings in its walls, still held out for the son of Alaric. In 508, the long-delayed forces of Theodoric appeared upon the scene under his brave general Tulum and dealt some severe blows at the allied Frankish and Burgundian armies. In 509, another army under Duke Mamo crossed the Cotian Alps near Briancon, laid waste part of Dauphiné, and probably compelled a large detachment of the Burgundian army to return for the defence of their homes. And lastly, in 510, Theodoric's general, Ibas, inflicted a crushing defeat on the allied armies, leaving, it is said, 30,000 francs dead upon the field. The number is probably much exaggerated, as these historical bulletins are apt to be, but there can be no doubt that a great and important victory was won by the troops of Theodoric. The immediate result of this victory was the raising of the siege of Arles, whose valiant defenders had held out against storm and blockade, famine and treachery within, Franks and Burgundians without, for the space of two years and a half. Ultimately, and perhaps before many months had passed, the victory of Ibas led to a cessation of hostilities, if not to a formal treaty of peace, between the three powers which disputed the possession of Gaul. The terms practically arranged were these. Clovis remained in possession of far the largest part of Alaric's dominions, Aquitaine nearly up to the roots of the Pyrenees, and so much of Languedoc, including Toulouse, the late capital of the Visigoths, as lay west of the mountains of the Savon. Theodoric obtained the rest of Languedoc and Provence, the first province being deemed to be a part of the Visigothic, the second of the Ostrogothic dominions. Gundobad obtained nothing but lost some towns on his southern frontier, a fitting reward for his tortuous and shifty policy. In the meantime, something like civil war had been waged on the other side of the Pyrenees for the Spanish portion of the Visigothic inheritance. Alaric, slain on the field of Vouille, had left two sons, one Amalaric, his legitimate heir and grandson of Theodoric, but still a child the other a young man but of illegitimate birth named Gesalic. This latter was, on the death of his father, proclaimed king by some fraction of the Visigothic people. Had Gesalic shown courage and skill in winning back the lost inheritance of his father, Theodoric, whose own descent was not legitimate according to strict church law, would not, perhaps, have interfered with his claim to the succession but the young man was as weak and cowardly as his birth was base, and the strenuous efforts of Theodoric, seconded probably by many of the Visigoths who had first acclaimed him as king, were directed to getting rid of this futile pretender. Gesalic, defeated by Gundobad at Nabon, which for a time became the possession of the Burgundians, fled over the Pyrenees to Barcelona, and from thence across the sea to Carthage. Thrasamund, king of the Vandals, aided him with money and promised him support, being probably deceived by the glozing tongue of Gesalic, and looking upon him simply as a brave young Visigoth battling for his rightful inheritance with the Franks. A correspondence followed between Ravenna and Carthage, in which Theodoric bitterly complained of the protection given by his brother-in-law to an intriguer and a rebel, and, on the receipt of Theodoric's letter, Thrasamund at once disclaimed all further intention of helping the pretender and sent rich presents to his offended kinsman, which Theodoric graciously returned. Gesalic again appeared in Barcelona, still doubtless wearing the insignia of kingship, but was defeated by the same Duke Ibas who had raised the siege of Arles, and, fleeing into Gaul, probably in order to claim the protection of the enemy of his house, King Gundobad, he was overtaken by the soldiers of Theodoric near the river Durance and was put to death by his captors. Thus there remained but one undisputed heir to what was left of the great Visigothic kingdom, the little child Amalaric, Theodoric's grandson. He was brought up in Spain, but apparently with the full consent of the Visigothic people, his grandsire assumed the reins of government, ruling in his own name, but with a tacit understanding that Amalaric and no other should succeed him. There was thus, for fifteen years, a combination of states which Europe has not witnessed before or since, 
though Charles V and some of his descendants were not far from achieving it. All of Italy and all of Spain, except the northwest corner which was held by the Suevi, obeyed the rule of Theodoric and the fair regions of Provence and Languedoc, acknowledging the same master, were the ligament that united them. Of the character of the government of Theodoric in Spain, history tells us scarcely anything, but there is reason to think that it was as wise and beneficent as his government of Italy, its chief fault being probably the undue share of power which was grasped by the Ostrogothic minister Theudis, whom Theodoric had appointed as guardian to his grandson, and who, having married a wealthy Spanish lady, assumed a semi-royal state and became at last so mighty that Theodoric himself did not dare to insist upon the recall which he had veiled under the courteous semblance of an invitation to his palace at Ravenna. Thus then the policy of Theodoric towards his kinsmen and co-religionists in Gaul had failed, but it had not been a hopeless failure. He had missed probably through no fault of his own, through the rashness of Alaric and the treachery of Gundobad, the right moment for saving the kingdom of Toulouse from shipwreck. But he had vindicated in adversity the honour of the Gothic name, and he had succeeded in saving a considerable part of the cargo which the stately vessel had carried. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Theodoric the Goth by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven Anastasius. In order to complete our survey of the foreign policy of the great Ostrogoth, we must now consider the relations which existed between him and the majestic personage who, though he had probably never set foot in Italy, was yet always known in the common speech of men as the Roman Emperor. It has been already said that Zeno, the sovereign who bore this title when Theodoric started for Italy, died before his final victory, and that it was his successor, Anastasius, with whom the tedious negotiations were conducted, which ended in a recognition, perhaps a somewhat grudging recognition, by the Emperor of the right of the Ostrogothic king to rule in Italy. Anastasius, who was Theodoric's contemporary during twenty-five years of his reign, was already past sixty when the widowed Empress Ariadne chose him for her husband and her emperor, and he had attained the age of eighty-eight when his harassed life came to a close. A man of tall stature and noble presence, a wise administrator of the finances of the empire, and therefore one who both lightened taxation and accumulated treasure, a sovereign who chose his servants well and brought his only considerable war, that with Persia, to a successful issue, Anastasius would seem to be an emperor of whom both his subjects and posterity should speak favourably. Unfortunately, however, for his fame, he became entangled in that most wearisome of theological debates which is known as the Monophysite controversy. In this controversy he took an unpopular side, he became embroiled with the Roman pontiff and estranged from his own patriarch of Constantinople. Opposition and the weariness of age soured a naturally sweet temper, and he was guilty of some harsh proceedings towards his ecclesiastical opponents. Even worse than his harshness, which did not, even on the representations of his enemies, amount to cruelty, was a certain want of absolute truthfulness, which made it difficult for a beaten foe to trust his promises of forgiveness, and thus caused the fire of civil discord, once kindled, to smoulder on almost interminably. The religious party to which he belonged had probably the majority of the aristocracy of Constantinople on its side, but the mob and the monks were generally against Anastasius, and some scenes very humiliating to the imperial dignity were the consequence of this antagonism. Once when he had resolved on the deposition of the orthodox patriarch of Constantinople, Macedonius, so great a tempest of popular and theological fury raged through the city that he ordered the great gates of his palace to be barred and the ships to be made ready at what is now called Seraglio Point, intending to seek safety in flight. A humiliating reconciliation with the patriarch, the order for whose banishment he rescinded, saved him from this necessity. 
the citizens and the soldiers poured through the streets shouting triumphantly our father is yet with us and the storm for the time abated but the emperor had only appeared to yield and some months later he stealthily but successfully carried into effect his design for the banishment of macedonius again the next year a religious faction fight disgraced the capital of the empire the addition of the words who wast crucified for us to the chorus of the te deum holy 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 lord god almighty goaded the orthodox but fanatical mob to madness for three days such scenes as london saw during lord george gordon's no popery riots were enacted in the streets of constantinople the palaces of the heterodox ministers were burned their deaths were eagerly demanded the head of a monk who was supposed to be responsible for the heretical addition to the hymn was carried round the city on a pole while the murderers shouted behold the head of an enemy to the trinity then the statues of the emperor were thrown down an act of insurrection which corresponded to the building of barricades in the revolutions of paris and loud voices began to call for the proclamation of a popular general as augustus anastasius this time dreamed not of flight but took his seat in the podium at the hippodrome the great place of public meeting for the citizens of constantinople thither too streamed the excited mob fresh from their work of murder and pillage shouting with hoarse voices the line of the te deum in its orthodox form a suppliant without his diadem without his purple robe the white-haired anastasius eighty-two years of age sat meekly on his throne and bade the criers declare that he was ready to lay down the burden of the empire if the citizens would decide who should assume it in his stead the humiliation was accepted the clamorous mob were not really of one mind as to the election of a successor and anastasius was permitted still to reign and to reassume the diadem which has not often encircled a wearier or more uneasy head such an emperor as this at war with a large part of his subjects and suspected of heresy by the great body of the catholic clergy was a much less formidable opponent for theodoric than the young and warlike clovis with his rude energy and his unquestioning if somewhat truculent orthodoxy moreover at this time independently of those special causes of strife there was a chronic schism between the sea of rome and the sea of constantinople precursor of that great schism which three centuries later finally divided the eastern and western churches and this schism though it did not as yet lead to the actual excommunication of anastasius caused him to be looked upon with coldness and suspicion by the successive popes of rome and made the rule of theodoric avowed arian as he was but anxious to hold the balance evenly between the rival churches far more acceptable at the lateran than that of the schismatic partisan anastasius for some years after the embassy of festus and the consequent recognition of theodoric by the emperor there appears to have been peace if no great cordiality between the courts of ravenna and constantinople but a war in which theodoric found himself engaged with the gepidae taking him back as it did into his old unwelcome nearness to the danube led to the actual outbreak of hostilities between the two states hostilities however which were but of short duration the great city of sirmium on the save the ruins of which may still be seen about eighty miles west of belgrade had once belonged to the western empire and had been rightly looked upon as one of the bulwarks of italy to any one who studies the configuration of the great alpine chain which parts off the italian peninsula from the rest of europe it will be manifest that it is in the northeast that that mountain barrier is the weakest the maritime pennine and cotian alps which soar above the plains of piedmont and western lombardy afford scarcely any passes below the snow line practicable for an invading army great generals like hannibal and napoleon have indeed crossed them but the pride which they have taken in the achievement is the best proof of its difficulty modern engineering science has carried its zigzag roads up to their high crests 
has thrown its bridges across their ravines has defended the traveller by its massive galleries from their avalanches and in these later days has even bored its tunnels for miles through the heart of the mountains but all of these are works done obviously in defiance of nature and if europe relapsed into a state of barbarism the eternal snow and the eternal silence would soon reassert their supremacy over the frail handiwork of man quite different from this is the aspect of the mountains on the northeastern border of italy the countries which we now call venetia and istria are parted from their northern neighbours by ranges chiefly that known as the julian alps which are indeed of bold and striking outline but which are not what we generally understand by alpine in their character and which often do not rise to a greater elevation than four thousand feet therefore it was from this quarter of the horizon from the pannonian or in modern language austrian countries bordering on the middle danube that all the greatest invaders in the fifth and sixth centuries alaric attila alboin bore down upon italy and for this reason it was truly said by an orator who was recounting the praises of theodoric in connection with this war the city of the sirmians was of old the frontier of italy upon which emperors and senators kept watch lest from thence the stored-up fury of the neighbouring nations should pour over the roman commonwealth this city of sirmian however and the surrounding territory had now been for many years divorced from italy in theodoric's boyhood it is possible that his own barbarian countrymen occupying as they did the province of pannonia lorded it in the streets of sirmian which was properly a pannonian city since the ostrogoths evacuated the province the gepidae as we have seen had entered it and it was a king of the gepidae traustila who sought to bar theodoric's march into italy and who sustained at the hands of the ostrogothic king the crushing defeat by the hiulca palace traustila's son trasaric had asked for theodoric's help against a rival claimant to the throne and had perhaps promised to hand over possession of sirmian in return for that assistance theodoric who as king of the hesperian realm felt that it was a point of honour to recover possession of the frontier city of italy gave the desired help but failed to receive the promised recompense when trasaric's breach of faith was manifest theodoric sent an army composed of the flower of the gothic youth commanded by a general named pitsias into the valley of the save the gepidae though reinforced by some of the bulgarians who about thirty years before this time had made their first appearance in the country which now bears their name were completely defeated by pitsias trasaric's mother the widow of theodoric's old enemy traustila fell into the hands of the invaders Trasaric was expelled from that corner of Pannonia, and Sirmian, still apparently a great and even opulent city, notwithstanding the ravages of the barbarians, submitted, probably with joy, to the rule of Theodoric, under which she felt herself once more united to the Roman commonwealth. We have still, in the various letters of Cassiodorus, two letters relating to this annexation of Sirmium in the first addressed to count Colosseus, that illustrious official is informed that he is appointed to the governorship of pannonia Sirmiensis, a former habitation of the goths this province is now to extend a welcome to her old roman lords even as she gladly obeyed her ostrogothic rulers surrounded by the wild anarchy of the barbarous nations the new governor is to exhibit the justice of the goths a nation so happily situated in the midst of praise that they could accept the wisdom of the romans and yet hold fast the valour of the barbarians he is to shield the poor from oppression and his highest merit will be to establish in the hearts of the inhabitants of the land the love of peace and order to the barbarians and romans settled in pannonia the secretary of theodoric writes informing them that he has appointed as their governor a man mighty in name colosseus and mighty in deeds they must refrain from acts of violence and from redressing their supposed wrongs by main force having got an upright judge they must use him as the arbiter of their differences 
what is the use to man of his tongue if his armed hand is to settle his cause or how can peace be maintained if men take to fighting in a civilized state they are therefore to imitate the example of our goths who do not shrink from battles abroad but who have learned to exhibit peaceable moderation at home the recovery of sirmium from the gepidae though doubtless the subject of congratulation in italy was viewed with much displeasure at constantinople whether the part of pannonia in which it was included belonged in strictness to the eastern or western empire is a question that has been a good deal discussed and upon which we have perhaps not sufficient materials for coming to a conclusion the boundary line between east and west had undoubtedly fluctuated a good deal in the fourth and fifth centuries and the fact that there were not as viewed by a roman statesman two empires at all but only one great world empire which for the sake of convenience was administered by two emperors one dwelling at ravenna or milan and the other at constantinople was probably the reason why that boundary was not defined as strictly as it would have been between two independent kingdoms moreover through the greater part of the fifth century when huns and ostrogoths rugians and gepidae were roaming over these countries of the middle danube any claim of either the eastern or western emperor to rule in these lands must have been so purely theoretical that it probably seemed hardly worth while to spend time in defining it but now that the actual ruler of italy and that ruler a strong and capable barbarian like theodoric was holding the great city of sirmium and was sending his governors to civilize and subdue the inhabitants of what is now called the austrian military frontier the emperor who reigned at constantinople was not unlikely to find his neighbourhood unpleasant it was doubtless in consequence of the jealousy arising from the conquest of sirmium that war soon broke out between the two powers upper moesia in modern geography servia was undoubtedly part of the eastern empire yet it is there that we next find the gothic troops engaged in war mundo the hun a descendant of attila was in league with theodoric but at enmity with the empire and was wandering with a band of freebooters through the half desolate lands south of the danube sabinian the son of the general of the same name who twenty-six years before had fought with theodoric in macedonia was ordered by anastasius to exterminate this disorderly hun with ten thousand men among whom there were some bulgarian foderati and with a long train of wagons containing a great store of provisions he marched from the balkans down the valley of the morava mundo in despair and already thinking of surrender called on his ostrogothic ally for aid and pizias marching rapidly with an army of two thousand five hundred young and warlike goths two thousand infantry and five hundred cavalry reached horea Margi, the place where mundo was besieged in time to prevent his surrender notwithstanding the enthusiasm of the gothic troops the battle was most stubbornly contested especially by the fierce bulgarians but in the end pizias obtained a complete victory we may state this fact with confidence as it is recorded in the chronicles of an official of the eastern empire he says of sabinian having joined battle at horea Margi, and many of his soldiers having been slain in this conflict and drowned in the river margus morava having also lost all his wagons he fled with a few followers to the fortress which is called nato in this lamentable war so promising an army fell that speaking after the manner of men its loss could never be repaired without any general campaign the quarrel between the goths and the empire seems to have smouldered on for three years longer in his chronicle for the year 508 the same byzantine official who has just been quoted says very honestly romanus count of the domestics and rusticus count of the scolarii with one hundred armed ships and as many cutters carrying eight thousand soldiers went forth to ravage the shores of italy and proceeded as far as the most ancient city of tarentum having recrossed the sea they reported to anastasius caesar this inglorious victory which in piratical fashion romans had snatched from their fellow romans 
These words of the chronicler show to what extent Theodoric's kingdom was looked upon as still forming part of the Roman Empire, and they also point to the difficulty of the position of Anastasius, who, whatever might be his cause of quarrel with Theodoric, could only enforce his complaints against him by resorting to acts which in the eyes of his subjects wore the unholy appearance of a civil war. Though we are not precisely informed when or how hostilities were brought to a close, it seems probable that soon after this raid, about the year 509, peace, unbroken for the rest of Theodoric's reign, was re-established between Ravenna and Byzantium. The epistle which stands in the forefront of the various letters of Cassiodorus was probably written on this occasion. Most clement emperor, says Theodoric, or rather Cassiodorus speaking in his name, there ought to be peace between us since there is no real occasion for animosity. Every kingdom should desire tranquillity since under it the people flourish and the common good is secured. Tranquillity is the comely mother of all useful arts. She multiplies the race of men as they perish and are renewed. She expands our powers, she softens our manners, and he who is a stranger to her sway grows up in ignorance of all these blessings. Therefore, most pious prince, it redounds to your glory that we should now seek harmony with your government, as we have ever felt love for your person. For you are the fairest ornament of all realms, the safeguard and defence of the world, to whom all other rulers rightly look up with reverence, inasmuch as they recognise that there is in you something which exists nowhere else. But we pre-eminently thus regard you, since by divine help it was in your republic that we learned the art of ruling the Romans with justice. Our kingdom is an imitation of yours, which is the mould of all good purposes, the only model of empire. Just in so far as we follow you, do we surpass all other nations. You have often exhorted me to love the Senate, to accept cordially the legislation of the emperors, to weld together all the members of Italy. Then, if you wish thus to form my character by your counsels, how can you exclude me from your august peace? I may plead, too, affection for the venerable city of Rome, from which none can separate themselves who prize that unity which belongs to the Roman name. We have therefore thought fit to direct the two ambassadors who are the bearers of this letter to visit your most serene piety, that the transparency of peace between us, which from various causes hath been of late somewhat clouded, may be restored to its former brightness by the removal of all contentions. For we think that you, like ourselves, cannot endure that any trace of discord should remain between two republics which, under the older princes, ever formed but one body, and which ought not merely to be joined together by a languid sentiment of affection, but strenuously to help one another with their mutually imparted strength. Let there be always one will, one thought in the Roman kingdom. Wherefore, proffering the honourable expression of our salutation, we beg with humble mind that you will not, even for a time, withdraw us from the most glorious charity of your mildness, which I should have a right to hope for, even if it were not granted to others. The change from we to I, which here occurs in the original, is puzzling. Other matters we have left to be suggested to your piety verbally by the bearers of this letter that on the one hand this epistolary speech of ours may not become too prolix, and on the other that nothing may be omitted which would tend to our common advantage. The letter which I have attempted thus to bring before the reader is one which almost defies accurate translation. It is an exceedingly diplomatic document, full of courtesy, yet committing the writer to nothing definite. The very badness of his style enables Cassiodorus to envelop his meaning in a cloud of words from which the quaestor of Anastasius perhaps found it as hard to extract a definite meaning then as a perplexed translator finds it hard to render it into intelligible English now. It is certainly difficult to acquit Cassiodorus of the charge of a deficient sense of humour when we find him putting into the mouth of his master, who had so often marched up and down through Thrace, ravaging and burning, these solemn praises of tranquillity. 
and when we read the fulsome flattery which is lavished on anastasius the almost obsequious humbleness with which the great ostrogoth who was certainly the stronger monarch of the two prays for a renewal of his friendship we may perhaps suspect either that the illiteratus rex did not comprehend the full meaning of the document to which he attached his signature or that cassiodorus himself in his later years when after the death of his master he republished his various letters somewhat modified their diction so as to make them more roman more diplomatic more slavishly subservient to the emperor than theodoric himself would have ever permitted one other act of this emperor must be noticed as illustrating the subject of the last chapter when clovis returned in triumph from the visigothic war he found messengers awaiting him from anastasius who brought to him some documents from the imperial chancery which are somewhat obscurely described as codicils of the consulship then in the church of san martin at tours he was robed in a purple tunic and clamis and placed apparently on his own head some semblance of the imperial diadem at the porch of the basilica he mounted his horse and rode slowly through the streets of the city to the other chief church scattering largesse of gold and silver to the shouting multitude from that day we are told he was saluted as consul and augustus the name of clovis does not like that of theodoric appear in the fasti of imperial rome and what the precise nature of the consulship conferred by the codicils may have been it is not easy to discover but there is no doubt that the authority which clovis up to this time had exercised by the mere right of the stronger over great part of gaul was confirmed and legitimized by this spontaneous act of the augustus at constantinople nor that this eager recognition of the royalty of the slayer of alaric was meant in some degree as a demonstration of hostility against alaric's father-in-law with whom anastasius had not then been reconciled the coalition of eastern emperor and frankish king boded no good to italy perhaps could the eye of anastasius have pierced through the mists of seven future centuries could he have foreseen the insults the extortions the cruelties which a roman emperor at constantinople was to endure at the hands of frankish invaders he would not have been so eager in his worship of the new sun which was rising over gaul from out of the marshes of the scheldt the remainder of the life of clovis seems to have been chiefly spent in removing the royal competitors who were obstacles to his undisputed sway over the franks doubtless these were kings of a poor and barbarous type with narrower and less statesmanlike views than those of the founder of the merovingian dynasty but the means employed to remove them were hardly such as we should have expected from the eldest son of the church from him who had worn the white robe of a catechumen in the baptistery at rheims his most formidable competitor was sigebert king of the ripuarian franks that is the franks dwelling on both banks of the rhine between mainz and colne in the forests of the ardennes and along the valley of the moselle but sigebert who had sent a body of warriors to help the salian king in his war against the visigoths was now growing old and among these barbarous peoples age and bodily infirmity were often considered as to some extent disqualifications for kingship Clovis accordingly sent messengers to Cloderic, the son of Sigebert, saying, Behold, thy father has grown old and is lame on his feet. If he were to die, his kingdom should be thine, and we would be thy friends. Cloderic yielded to the temptation, and when his father went forth from Colne on a hunting expedition in the beech forests of Hesse, assassins employed by cloderic stole upon him in his tent as he was taking his noontide slumber and slew him the deed being done cloderic sent messengers to clovis saying my father is dead and his treasures are mine send me thy messengers to whom i may confide such portion of the treasure as thou mayest desire thanks said clovis i will send my messengers and do thou show them all that thou hast yet thou thyself shalt still possess all 
when the messengers of clovis arrived at the palace of the ripuarian cloderic showed them all the royal hoard and here said he pointing to a chest my father used to keep his gold coins of the empire in hanc archelolum solitus erat pater meus numismata ori congerere plunge thy hand in said the messenger and search them down to the very bottom the king stooped low to plunge his hand into the coins and while he stooped the messenger lifted high his battle-axe and clove his skull thus says the pious gregory who tells the story did the unworthy son fall into the pit which he had digged for his own father when clovis heard that both father and son were slain he came to the same place probably colonia where all these things had come to pass and called together a great assembly of the ripuarian people here he said what hath happened while i was quietly sailing down the scheldt cloderic my cousin's son practised against his father's life giving forth that i wished him slain and when he was fleeing through the beech forests he sent robbers against him by whom he was murdered then cloderic himself when he was displaying his treasures was slain by some one i know not whom but in all these things i am free from blame for i cannot shed the blood of my relations that were an unholy thing to do but since these events have so happened i offer you my advice if it seem good to you to accept it turn you to me that you may be under my defence then they when they heard these things shouted approval and clashed their spears upon their shields in sign of assent and raising clovis on a buckler proclaimed him their king and he receiving the kingdom and the treasures of sigebert added the ripuarians to the number of his subjects for concludes gregory bishop of tours to whom we owe the story of this enlargement of the dominions of his hero god was daily laying low the enemies of clovis under his hand and increasing his kingdom because he walked before him with a right heart and did those things which were pleasing in his eyes this ideal champion of orthodoxy in the sixth century then proceeded to clear the ground of the little salian kings his nearer relatives and perhaps more dangerous competitors Chararic had failed to help him in his early days against Siagrius. He was deposed, the long hair of the Merovingians was shorn away from his head and from his son's head, and they were consecrated as priest and deacon in the Catholic Church. Chararic wept and wailed over his humiliation, but his son, to cheer him, said, alluding to the loss of their locks, the wood is green and the leaves may yet grow again would that he might quickly perish who has done these things the words were reported to clovis who ordered both father and son to be put to death and added their hordes to his treasure their warriors to his host chararic had not gone forth to the battle against siagrius but Ragnarcar of Cambrai had given Clovis effectual help in that crisis of his early fortunes. However, Ragnarcar, by his dissolute life and his preposterous fondness for an evil counsellor named Pharo, had given great offence to the proud Franks his subjects. Just as James I said of the forfeited estates of Raleigh, I mourn hay the land, I mourn hay it for Car so ragnarcar said whenever any one offered him a present or whenever a choice dish was brought to table this will do for me and pharo clovis learned and fermented the secret discontent he sent to the disaffected nobles amulets and baldrics of copper gilt which they in their simplicity took for gold inviting them to betray their master the secret bargain being struck Clovis then moved his army towards Cambrai. The anxious Ragnarcar sent scouts to discover the strength of the advancing host. How many are they? said he on their return. Quite enough for thee and Pharaoh, was the discouraging and taunting reply, and in fact the soldiers of Ragnarcar seem to have been beaten as soon as the battle was set in array. With his hands bound behind his back, 
Ragnarkar and his brother Rikiar were brought into the presence of Clovis. Shame on thee, said the indignant king, for humiliating our race by suffering thy hands to be bound. It had been better for thee to die thus, and the great battle-axe descended on his head. Then, turning to Rikiar, he said, If thou hadst helped thy brother, he would not have been bound, and his skull too was cloven with the battle-axe. Before many days the traitorous chiefs discovered the base metal in the ornaments which had purchased their treason, and complained of the fraud. Good enough gold, said Clovis, for men who were willing to betray their lord to death, and the traitors, trembling for their lives under his frown and fierce rebuke, were glad to leave the matter undiscussed. Thus, in all his arguments with the weaker creatures around him, the Frankish king was always right. It was always they, not he, who had befouled the stream. In this, shall I say, shameless plausibility of wrong, the founder of the Frankish monarchy was a worthy prototype of Louis the Fourteenth and of Napoleon. Having slain these and many other kings, and extended his dominions over the whole of Gaul, He once, in an assembly of his nobles, lamented his solitary estate. Alas, I am but a stranger and a pilgrim, and have no kith or kin who could help me if adversity came upon me. But this he said, not in real grief for their death, but in guile, in order that if there were any forgotten relative lurking anywhere, he might come forth and be killed. None, however, was found to answer to the invitation. Like all his family, Clovis was short-lived, though not so conspicuously short-lived as many of his descendants. He died at forty-five in the year 511, five years after the battle of the Campus Vogladensis. He was buried in the Church of the Holy Apostles at Paris, and his kingdom, consolidated with so much labour and at the price of so many crimes, was partitioned among his four sons. The aged emperor Anastasius survived his Frankish ally seven years, and died in the eighty-ninth year of his age, 8th of July, 518. His death was sudden, and some later writers averred that it was caused by a thunderstorm, of which he had always had a peculiar and superstitious fear. Others declared that he was inadvertently buried alive, that he was heard to cry out in his coffin, and that when it was opened some days after, he was found to have gnawed his arm. But these facts are not known to earlier and more authentic historians, and the invention of them seems to be only a rhetorical way of putting the fact that he died at enmity with the Holy See. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of Theodoric the Goth by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Rome and Ravenna. The death of Anastasius was followed by changes in the attitude towards one another of Pope and Emperor, which embittered the closing years of Theodoric and caused his son to set in clouds. But before we occupy ourselves with these transactions, we may consider a little more carefully the relations between Theodoric and his subjects in the happier days, the early and middle portion of his reign, and for this purpose we will first of all hear what the chroniclers have to tell us of a memorable visit to Rome which he paid in the eighth year after his accession, that year which, according to our present chronology, is marked as the five hundredth after the birth of Christ. Rome had been for more than two centuries strangely neglected by the rulers who in her name lorded it over the civilised world. Ever since Diocletian's reconstruction of the empire, it had been a rare event for an Augustus to be seen within her walls. Even the emperor who had Italy for his portion generally resided at Milan or Ravenna rather than on the banks of the Tiber. Constantine was but a hasty visitor before he went eastward to build his marvellous new Rome beside the Bosphorus. His son Constantius in middle life paid one memorable visit. 
Thirty years later, Theodosius followed his example. His son Honorius celebrated there his doubtful triumph over Alaric, and his grandson Valentinian III was standing in the Roman Campus Martius when he fell under the daggers of the Avengers of Aetius. But the fact that these visits are so pointedly mentioned shows the extreme rarity of their occurrence, nor was any great alteration wrought herein by Theodoric, for this visit to Rome, which we are now about to consider, and which lasted for six months, seems to have been the only one that he ever paid in the course of his reign of thirty-three years. He came at an opportune time, when there was a lull in the strife amounting almost to civil war caused by a disputed papal election. Two years before, two bodies of clergy had met on the same day, 22nd of November, in different churches, in order to elect the successor to a deceased pope. The larger number, assembled in the mother church, the Lateran, elected a deacon of Sardinian extraction named Symmachus. The smaller but apparently more aristocratic body, backed by the favour of the majority of the Senate and supported by the delegates of the Emperor, met in the church now called by the name of Saint Maria Maggiore and voted for the arch-presbyter Laurentius. The effect of this contested election was to throw Rome into confusion. Parties of armed men who favoured the cause of one or the other candidate paraded the city and all the streets were filled with riot and bloodshed. It seemed as if the days of Marius and Sulla were come back again, though it would have been impossible to explain to either Marius or Sulla what was the nature of the contest, a dispute as to the right to be considered successor to a fisherman of Bethsaida. When the anarchy was becoming intolerable, the senate, clergy, and people determined to invoke the mediation of Theodoric, thus furnishing the highest testimony to the reputation for fairness and impartiality which had been earned by the Arian king. Both the rival bishops repaired to Ravenna, and having laid the case before the king, heard his answer. Whichsoever candidate was first chosen, if he also received the majority of votes, shall be deemed duly elected. Both qualifications were united in Symmachus, who was therefore for a time recognised as lawful pope, even by Laurentius himself. The disturbances broke out again later on. Charges, probably false charges, of gross immorality were brought against Symmachus, who fled from Rome, returned, was tried by a synod, and acquitted. It was not till after nearly six years had elapsed and six synods had been held that Laurentius and his party gave up the contest and finally acquiesced in the legitimacy of the claim of Symmachus to the popedom. But most of these troubles were still to come. There was a lull in the storm and it seemed as if the king's wise and righteous judgment had settled the succession to the papal chair when in the year 500 Theodoric visited Rome seeing for the first time in full middle life the city whose name he had doubtless often heard with a child's wonder and awe in his father's palace by the platten sea his first visit was paid to the great basilica of st peter outside the walls where he performed his devotions with all the outward signs of reverence which would have been exhibited by the most pious catholic before he entered the gates of the city he was welcomed by the senate and people of Rome, who poured forth to meet him with every indication of joy. Borne along by the jubilant throng, he reached the senate house, which still stood in its majesty, overlooking the Roman forum. Here, in some portico attached to the senate house, which bore the name of Golden Palm, he delivered an oration to the people. The accent of the speech may not have been faultless, the style was assuredly not Ciceronian, but the matter was worthy of the enthusiastic acclamations with which it was received. Recognising the continuity of his government with that of the emperors who had preceded him, he promised that with God's help he would keep inviolate all that the Roman princes in the past had ordained for their people. So might a Norman or Angevin king, anxious to reassure his Saxon subjects, swear to observe all the laws of the good king Edward the Confessor. This speech of Theodoric's at the Golden Palm was listened to by an obscure African monk whose emotions on the occasion are described to us by his biographer. 
Fulgentius, the grandson of a senator of Carthage, had forsaken what seemed a promising official career and had accepted the solitude and the hardships of a monastic life, at a time when, owing to the severe persecution of the Catholics by the Vandal kings, there was no prospect of anything but ignominy, exile, and perhaps death for every eminent confessor of the Catholic faith. Fulgentius and his friends had suffered many outrages at the hands of Numidian freebooters and Vandal officers, and they meditated a flight into Egypt, where they might practice a yet more rigid monastic rule, undisturbed by the civil power. In his search after a suitable resting place for his community, Fulgentius, who was in the thirty-third year of his age, had visited Sicily, and now had reached Rome in this same summer of 500, which was made memorable by Theodoric's visit. He found, we are told, the greatest joy in this city, truly called the head of the world, both the senate and people of Rome testifying their gladness at the presence of Theodoric the king. Wherefore the blessed Fulgentius, to whom the world had long been crucified, after he had visited with reverence the shrines of the martyrs and saluted with humble deference as many of the servants of God as he could in so short a time be introduced to, stood in that place which is called Parma Aurea, while Theodoric was making his harangue. There, as he gazed upon the nobles of the Roman Senate, marshalled in their various ranks and adorned with comely dignity, and as he heard with chaste ears the favouring shouts of the people, he had a chance of knowing what the boastful pomp of this world resembles. Yet he looked not willingly upon aught in this gorgeous spectacle, nor was his heart seduced to take any pleasure in these worldly vanities, but rather kindled thereby to a more vehement desire for Jerusalem above. And thus, with edifying discourse, did he ever admonish the brethren who were present. How fair must be that heavenly Jerusalem, if the earthly Rome be thus magnificent. And if in this world such honour is paid to the lovers of vanity, what honour and glory shall be bestowed on the saints who behold the eternal reality? With many such words as these did the blessed Fulgentius debate with them in a profitable manner all that day. And now with his whole heart earnestly desiring to behold his monastery again, he sailed swiftly to Africa, touching at Sardinia, and presented himself to his monks, who, in the excess of their joy, could scarcely believe that the blessed Fulgentius was indeed returned. Besides his promises of good government according to the old laws of the empire, Theodoric recognised the duty which, according to long-established usage, devolved upon the supreme ruler to provide panem et circenses for the citizens of Rome. The elaborate machinery, part of the crowned socialism of the empire, by which a certain number of loaves of bread had been distributed to the poorer households of the city, had probably broken down in the death agony of the Caesars of the West, and had not been again set going by Odo Vacar. We are told that Theodoric now distributed as rations to the people of Rome and to the poor one hundred and twenty thousand modii of corn yearly. As this represents only 30,000 bushels, and as in the flourishing days of the empire no fewer than 200,000 citizens used to present themselves, probably once or twice a week, to receive their rations, it is evident that, if the chronicler's numbers are correct, we have here no attempt to revive the wholesale distribution of corn to the citizens, an expenditure with which the finances of Theodoric's kingdom were probably quite unable to cope. What was now done was more strictly a measure of outdoor relief for the absolute destitute classes and was therefore a more legitimate employment of the energies of the state than the socialistic attempt to feed a whole people which had preceded it. At the same time that he granted these anonai, Theodoric also set aside from the proceeds of a certain wine tax two hundred pounds of gold eight thousand pounds yearly for the restoration of the imperial dwellings on the palatine and for the repair of the walls of rome little did he foresee that a time would come when those walls battered and breached as they were would be all too strong for the fortunes of the gothic warriors who would dash themselves vainly against their ramparts it was now thirty years since theodoric 
returning from his exile at constantinople had been hailed by his gothic countrymen as a partner of his father's throne in memory of that event from which he was separated by so many years of toil and triumph so many battles so many marches so many weary negotiations with emperors and kings theodoric celebrated his tricenalia at rome on this occasion the gigantic flavian amphitheatre the Colosseum, as we generally call it seems not to have been opened to the people the old murderous fights with gladiators which once dyed its pavement with human blood had been for a century suppressed by the influence of the church and the costly shows of wild beasts which were the permitted substitute would perhaps have taxed too heavily the still feeble finances of the state but to the circus maximus all the citizens crowded in order to see the chariot races which were run there and which recalled the brilliant festivities of the empire the circus oval in form notwithstanding its name was situated in the long valley between the palatine and aventine hills high above on the northeast rose the palaces of the caesars already mouldering to decay but one of which had probably been furbished up to make it a fitting residence for the king of the goths and romans on the southwest the solemn aventine still perhaps showed side by side the decaying temples of the gods and the mansions of the holy roman matrons who under the preaching of saint jerome had made their sumptuous palaces the homes of monastic self-denial in the long ellipse between the two hills the citizens of rome were ranged not too many now in the dwindled state of the city to find elbow room for all a shout of applause went up from the senators and people as the gothic king surrounded by a brilliant throng of courtiers moved majestically to his seat in the imperial podium at one end of the circus were twelve portals ostia behind which the eager charioteers were waiting in the middle of it there rose a long platform called the spina at either end of which stood an obelisk brought from egypt by an emperor one of these obelisks now adorns the piazza del popolo and the other the square in front of the lateran at a signal from the king the races began whether the first heat would be between big eye or quadrigai two horse or four horse chariots we cannot say but of one kind or the other twelve chariots bounded forth from the ostia the moment that the rope which had hitherto confined them was let fall seven times they careered round and round the long spina of course with eager struggles to get to the inside turn and perhaps with not an infrequent fall when a too eager charioteer in his desire to accomplish this struck against the protecting curbstone as each circuit was completed by the foremost chariot a steward of the races placed a great wooden egg in a conspicuous place upon the spina to mark the score and keen was the excitement when in a match between two well-known rivals six eggs announced to the spectators that the seventh the deciding circuit had begun the entire course thus traversed seven times in each direction made a race of between three and four miles and each heat would probably occupy nearly a quarter of an hour the number of heats missus was usually four and twenty and we may therefore imagine theodoric and his people occupying the best part of a summer day in watching the galloping steeds the shouting lashing drivers and the fast flashing chariot wheels at rome as at constantinople though not in quite so exaggerated a degree partisanship with the charioteers was more than a passing fancy it was a deep and abiding passion with the multitude and it sometimes went very near to actual madness four colours the blue and the green the white and the red were worn respectively by the drivers who served each of the four joint stock companies as we should call them that catered for the taste of the race-loving multitude red and white had had their day of glory and still won a fair proportion of races but the keenest and most terrible competition was between blue and green at constantinople a generation later than the time which we have now reached the undue favour which an emperor 
Justinian was accused of showing to the blues caused an insurrection which wrapped the city in flames and nearly cost that emperor his throne. No such disastrous consequences resulted from circus partisanship in Rome, but even in Rome that partisanship was very bitter and, in the view of a philosopher, supremely ridiculous. As the sage Cassiodorus remarked, in these, beyond all other shows, men's minds are hurried into excitement without any regard to a fitting sobriety of character. The green charioteer flashes by, part of the people is in despair. The blue gets a lead, a larger part of the city is in misery. The populace cheer frantically when they have gained nothing. They are cut to the heart when they have received no loss and they plunge with as much eagerness into these empty contests as if the whole welfare of their imperilled country depended upon them. In two other letters, Theodoric is obliged seriously to chide the Roman Senate for its irascible temper in dealing with one of the factions of the circus. A patrician and a consul, so it was alleged, had truculently assaulted the Green Party, and one man had lost his life in the fray. The king ordered that the matter should be inquired into by two officials of illustrious rank who had special jurisdiction in cases wherein nobles of high position were concerned. He then replied to a counter-accusation which had been brought by the senators against the mob for assailing them with rude clamours in the hippodrome. You must distinguish, says the king, between deliberate insolence and the festive impertinences of a place of public amusement. It is not exactly a congregation of Catos that comes together at the circus. The place excuses some excesses. And moreover, you must remember that these insulting cries generally proceed from the beaten party, and therefore you need not complain of clamour, which is the result of a victory that you earnestly desired. Again, the king had to warn the senators not to bring disgrace on their good name and do violence to public order by allowing their menials to embroil themselves with the mob of the hippodrome. Any slave accused of having shed the blood of a free-born citizen was to be at once given up to justice, or else his master was to pay a fine of four hundred pounds and to incur the severe displeasure of the king and do not you o senators be too strict in marking every idle word which the mob may utter in the midst of the general rejoicing if any insult which requires special notice should be offered you bring it before the prefect of the city this is far wiser and safer than taking the law into your own hands the festivities which celebrated theodoric's visit to the eternal city were perhaps somewhat discordantly interrupted by the discovery of a conspiracy against him set on foot by a certain count odoin about whom we have no other information but the form of whose name at once suggests that he was of gothic not roman extraction it is possible that this conspiracy indicates the discontent of the old Gothic nobility with the increasing tendency to copy Roman civilization and to assume imperial prerogatives which they observed in the king who had once been little more than chief among a band of comrades. But we have not sufficient information as to this conspiracy to enable us to fix its true place in the history of Theodoric nor can we even say with confidence that it was directed against the king and not against one of his ministers. The result alone is certain. Odoin's treachery was discovered and he was beheaded in the Caesarian palace, a building which probably stood upon the patrimony of Constantine, hard by the southern wall of Rome and near to the spot where we now see the church of Santa Croce. At the request of the people, the words of Theodoric's harangue on his entrance into the city were engraved on a brazen tablet which was fixed in a place of public resort, perhaps the Roman Forum. Even so did the joyeuse entrée of a Burgundian duke into Brussels confirm and commemorate the privileges of his good subjects, the citizens of Brabant. Upon the whole, there can be little doubt that the half-year which Theodoric spent in Rome was really a time of joyfulness both to prince and people, and that the tiles which are still occasionally turned up by the spade in Rome, bearing the inscription, 
domino nostro theodorico felix roma were not merely the work of official flatterers but did truly express the joy of a well-governed nation after six months theodoric returned to that city which during the last thirty years of his life he probably regarded as his home ravenna by the adriatic and there he delighted the heart of his subjects by the pageants which celebrated the marriage of his niece amala berga with hermanfrid the king of the distant thuringians this young prince whom theodoric had adopted as his son by right of arms had sent to his future kinsman a team of cream-coloured horses of a rare breed and theodoric sent in return horses swords and shields and other instruments of war but as he said the greatest requital that we make is joining you in marriage to a woman of such surpassing beauty as our niece the later fortunes of the ostrogothic princess who thus migrated from ravenna to the banks of the elba were not happy a proud and ambitious woman she is said to have stimulated her husband to make himself by fratricide and civil war sole king of the thuringians the help of one of the sons of clovis had been unwisely invoked for this operation so long as the ostrogothic hero lived thuringia was safe under his protection but soon after his death dissensions arose between franks and thuringians a claim of payment was made for the ill-requited services of the former thuringia was invaded her king defeated and after a while treacherously slain amala berga took refuge with her kindred at ravenna and after the collapse of their fortunes retired to constantinople where her son entered the imperial service in after years that son amalafrid the goth was not the least famous of the generals of justinian the broad lands between the elba and the danube over which the thuringians had wandered were added to the dominions of the franks and became part of the mighty kingdom of austrasia i have had occasion many times in the preceding pages to write the name of ravenna the residence of most of the sovereigns of the sinking empire and now the home of theodoric let me attempt in a few paragraphs to give some faint idea of the impression which this city a boulder stone left by the ice drift of the dissolving empire amid the green fields of modern civilization produces on the mind of a traveller ravenna stands in a great alluvial plain between the apennines the adriatic and the po the fine mud which has been for centuries poured over the land by the streams descending from the mountains has now silted up her harbour and classis the maritime suburb of ravenna which in the days of odovacar and theodoric was a busy seaport on the adriatic now consists of one desolate church magnificent in its desolation and two or three farm buildings standing in the midst of a lonely and fever-haunted rice swamp between the city and the sea stretches for miles the glorious pine forest now alas cruelly maimed by the hands of nature and of man by the frost of one severe winter and by the spades of the builders of a railway but still preserving some traces of its ancient beauty here it was that theodoric pitched his camp when for three weary years he blockaded his rival's last stronghold and here by the deep trench for sartum which he had dug to guard that camp he fought the last and not the least deadly of his fights when odovacar made his desperate sortie from the famine-stricken town memories of a gentler kind but still not wanting in sadness now cluster round the solemn avenues of the pineta there we still seem to see dante wandering framing his lay of the selva oscura through which lay his path to the unseen world and ever looking in vain for the arrival of the messenger who should summon him back to ungrateful florence there in boccaccio's story a maiden's hapless ghost is for ever pursued through the woods by the spectre huntsman guido cavalcanti whom her cruelty had driven to suicide and there in our father's days rode byron like dante an exile if self-exiled from his country and feeding on bitter remembrances of past praise and present blame both too lightly bestowed by his countrymen we leave the pine wood and the desolate-looking rice-fields 
we cross over the sluggish streams ronco and montone and we stand in the streets of historic ravenna our first thoughts are all of disappointment there is none of the trim beauty of a modern city nor as we first think is there any of the endless picturesqueness of a well-preserved medieval city we look in vain for any building like giotto's campanile at florence for any space like that noble crescent-shaped forum full of memories of the middle ages the piazzo del campo of siena we see some strange but not altogether beautiful bell towers and one or two brown cupolas breaking the skyline but that seems to be all and our first feeling as i have said is one of disappointment but when we enter the churches if we have leisure to study them if we can let their spirit mingle with our spirits if we can quietly ask them what they have to tell us of the past all disappointment vanishes for ravenna is to those who will study her attentively a very pompeii of the fifth century telling us as much concerning those years of the falling empire and the rising medieval church as pompeii can tell us of the social life of the romans in the days of triumphant paganism not that the record is by any means perfect many leaves have been torn out of the book by the childish conceit of recent centuries which vainly imagined that they could write something instead which any mortal would now care to read the destroying hand of the so-called renaissance has passed over these churches defacing sometimes the chancel sometimes the nave one of the most interesting of the churches of ravenna has the cupola disfigured by wretched paintings which mislead the eye in following the lines of the building another has its apse covered with those gilt spangles and clouds and cherubs which were the eighteenth century's ideal of impressive religious art the duomo which should have been one of the most interesting of all the monuments of ravenna was almost entirely rebuilt in the last century and is now scarcely worth visiting still enough remains in the unrestored churches of ravenna to captivate the attention of every student of history and every lover of early christian art it is only necessary to shut our eyes to the vapid and tasteless work of recent embellishers as we should close our eyes to the whispers of vulgar gossipers while listening to some noble and entrancing piece of sacred music thus concentrating our attention on that which is really interesting and venerable in these churches while we admire their long colonnades their skilful use of ancient columns some of which may probably have adorned the temples of olympian deities in the days of the emperors and the exceedingly rich and beautiful new forms of capitals of a design quite unknown to vitruvius which the genius of romanesque artists has invented we find that our chief interest is derived from the mosaics with which these churches were once so lavishly adorned mosaic as is well known is the most permanent of all the processes of decorative art fresco must fade sooner or later and where there is any tendency to damp it fades with cruel rapidity oil painting on canvas changes its tone in the long course of years and the boundary line between cleaning and repainting is difficult to observe but the fragments out of which the mosaic picture is formed having been already passed through the fire will keep their colour for centuries we might probably say for millenniums damp injures them not except by lessening the cement with which they are fastened to the wall and therefore when restoration of a mosaic picture becomes necessary a really conscientious restorer can always reproduce the picture with precisely the same form and colour which it had when the last stone was inserted by the original artist and thus when we visit ravenna we have the satisfaction of feeling that we are in many cases looking upon the very same picture which was gazed upon by the contemporaries of theodoric portraits of theodoric himself unfortunately we have none but we have two absolutely contemporary portraits of justinian the overturner of his kingdom and one of justinian's wife the celebrated theodora these pictures it is interesting to remember were considerably older when cimabue found giotto in the sheepfolds drawing sheep upon a tile than any picture of cimabue's or giotto's is at the present time let us enter the church which is now called saint apollinare within the walls 
but which in the time of Theodoric was called the Church of St. Martin, often with the addition De Caelo Oreo, on account of the beautiful gilded ceiling which distinguished it from the other basilicas of Ravenna. This church was built by order of Theodoric, who apparently intended it to be his own royal chapel. Probably, therefore, the great Ostrogoth many a time saw the divine mysteries celebrated here by bishops and priests of the Arian communion. Two long colonnades fill the nave of the church. The columns are classical, with Corinthian capitals, and are perhaps brought from some older building. A peculiarity of the architecture consists in the high abacus, a frustum of an inverted pyramid, which is interposed between the capital of the column and the arch that springs from it, as if to give greater height than the columns alone would afford. Such in its main features was the church of St. Martin of the Golden Heaven, when Theodoric worshipped under its gorgeous roof. But its chief adornment, the feature which makes more impression on the beholder than anything else in Ravenna, was added after Theodoric's death, yet not so long after but that it may be suitably alluded to here as a specimen of the style of decoration which his eyes must have been wont to look upon. About the year 560, after the downfall of the Gothic monarchy, Agnellus, the Catholic bishop of Ravenna, reconciled this church, that is, re-consecrated it for the performance of worship by orthodox priests, and in doing so adorned the attics of the nave immediately above the colonnades with two remarkable mosaic friezes, each representing a long procession. On the north wall of the church we behold a procession of virgin martyrs. There are twenty-four in number, a little larger than life, and are chiefly those maidens who suffered in the terrible persecution of Diocletian. The place from which they start is a seaport town, with ships entering the harbour, domes and columns and arcades showing over the walls of the city. An inscription tells us that we have here represented the city of Classis, the seaport of Ravenna. By the time that we have reached the last figure in this long procession, we are almost at the east end of the nave. Here we see the Virgin Mother throned in glory, with the infant Jesus on her lap, and two angels on each side of her. But between the procession and the throne is interposed the group of the three wise men, in bright-coloured raiment, with tiara-like crowns upon their heads, stooping forward as if with eager haste to present their various oblations to the Divine Child. On the right, or south wall of the church, a similar procession of martyred men, twenty-six in number, seems to move along, in all the majesty of suffering, bearing their crowns of martyrdom as offerings to the Redeemer. The Christ is here not an infant, but a full-grown man, the man of sorrows, his head encircled with a nimbus, and two angels are standing on either side. The martyr procession starts from a building, with pediment above, and three arches resting upon pillars below. The intervals between the pillars are partly filled with curtains looped up in a curious fashion and with bright purple spots upon them. An inscription on this building tells us that it is Palatium, that is, Theodoric's palace at Ravenna. In both these processions the representation is of course far from the perfection of art. Both the faces and the figures have a certain stiffness, partly due to the very nature of mosaic work. There is also a sort of childlike simplicity in the treatment, especially of the female figures, which an unsympathetic critic would call grotesque. But, I think, most beholders feel that there is something indescribably solemn in these two great mosaic pictures in St. Apollinare Dentro. From the glaring, commonplace Italian town, with its police notices and its proclamation of the number of votes given to the government of Vittorio Emmanuel, you step into the grateful shade of the church and find yourself transported into the sixth century after Christ. You are looking on the faces of the men and maidens who suffered death with torture rather than deny their lord. For thirteen centuries those two processions have seemed to be moving on upon the walls of the basilica, and another ceaseless procession of worshippers, Goths, Byzantines, Lombards, Franks, Italians, 
has been in reality moving on beneath them to the grave and then you remind yourself that when the artist sketched those figures on the walls he was separated by no longer interval than three long lives would have bridged over from the days of the persecution itself that there were still men living on the earth who worshipped the olympian jupiter and that the name of mohammed son of abdallah was unknown in the world so as you gaze the telescope of the historic imagination does its work and the far-off centuries become near one or two other Aryan churches built during theodoric's reign in the northern suburb of the city have now entirely disappeared there still remains however the church which theodoric seems to have built as the cathedral of the Aryan community while leaving the old metropolitan church ecclesia ursiana now the duomo as the cathedral of the catholics this Aryan cathedral was dedicated to saint theodore but has in later ages been better known as the church of the holy spirit tasteless restoration has robbed it of the mosaics which it doubtless once possessed but it has preserved its fine colonnade consisting of fourteen columns of dark green marble with corinthian capitals whose somewhat unequal height seems to show that they like so many of their sisters have been brought from some other building where they have once perhaps served other gods through the courtyard of the church of san spirito we approach a little octagonal building known both as the oratory of saint maria in cosmedia and as the arian baptistery the great octagonal font which once stood in the centre of the building has disappeared but we can easily reconstruct it in our imaginations from the similar one which still remains in the catholic baptistery the interest of this building consists in the mosaics of its cupola on the disc in the centre is represented the baptism of christ the saviour stands immersed up to his loins in the jordan whose water flowing past him is depicted with a quaint realism the baptist stands on his left side and holds one hand over his head on the right of the saviour stands an old man who is generally said to represent the river god and the reed in his hand the urn from which water gushes under his arms certainly seem to favour this supposition but in order to avoid so strange a medley of christianity and heathenism it has been suggested that the figure may be meant for moses and in confirmation of this theory some keen-eyed beholders have thought they perceived the symbolic horned rays proceeding from each side of the old man's forehead round this central disc are seen the figures of the twelve apostles they are divided into two bands of six each who seem marching with crowns in their hands towards a throne covered with a veil and a cushion on which rests a cross blazing with jewels saint peter stands on the right of the throne saint paul on the left and these two apostles carry instead of crowns the one the usual keys and the other two rolls of parchment the interest of these figures though they have something of the stern majesty of early mosaic work is somewhat lessened by the fact that they have undergone considerable restoration it is suggested i know not whether on sufficient grounds that the figures of the apostles were added when the baptistery was reconciled to the catholic worship after the overthrow of the gothic dominion two more buildings at ravenna which are connected with the name of theodoric require to be noticed by us his palace and his tomb the story of his tomb however will be best told when his reign is ended as for the palace which once occupied a large space in the eastern quarter of the city we have seen that there is a representation of it in mosaic on the walls of saint apollinare dentro closely adjoining that church and facing the modern corso garibaldi is a wall about five and twenty feet high built of square brick tiles which has in its upper story one large and six small arched recesses the arches resting on columns only the front is ancient it is admitted that the building behind it is modern low down in the wall so low that the citizens of ravenna in passing brush it with their sleeves is a bath-shaped vessel of porphyry which in the days of archaeological ignorance used to be shown to strangers as the coffin of theodoric 
but the fact is that its history and its purpose are entirely unknown. This shell of a building is called in the Ravenna guidebooks the Palace of Theodoric. Experts are not yet agreed on the question whether its architectural features justify us in referring it to the 6th century, though all agree that it does not belong to a much later age. It does not agree with the representation of the Palatium in the church of St. Apollinare Dentro, and if it have anything whatever to do with it, it is probably not the main front, nor even any very important feature of the spacious palace, which, as we are told by the local historians and learn from inscriptions, was surrounded with porticoes, adorned with the most precious mosaics, divided into several triclinia, surmounted by a tower which was considered one of the most magnificent of the king's buildings, and surrounded with pleasant and fruitful gardens, planted on ground which had been reclaimed from the morass. But practically almost all the monuments of the Ostrogothic hero, except his tomb and the three churches already described, have vanished from Ravenna. Would that we could have seen the great mosaic which once adorned the pediment of his palace. There Theodoric stood, clad in mail with spear and shield. On his left was a female figure representing the city of Rome, also with a spear in her hand and her head armed with a helmet, while towards his right Ravenna seemed speeding with one foot on the land and the other on the sea. How this great mosaic perished is not made clear to us, but there was also an equestrian statue of Theodoric raised on a pyramid six cubits high. Horse and rider were both of brass, covered with yellow gold, and the king here too had his buckler on his left arm, while the right, extended, pointed a lance at an invisible foe. This statue was carried off from Ravenna, probably by the Frankish Emperor Charles, to adorn his capital at Aachen, and it was still to be seen there when Agnellus wrote his ecclesiastical history of Ravenna, three hundred years after the death of Theodoric. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of Theodoric the Goth by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Boethius. Hitherto, the career of Theodoric has been one of almost unbroken prosperity, and the reader who has followed his history has perhaps grown somewhat weary of the monotonous repetition of the phrases of his mildness and his equity. Unfortunately, he will be thus wearied no longer. The son of the great Ostrogoth set in sorrow, and what was worse than in sorrow, in deeds of hasty wrath and cruel injustice, which lost him the hearts of the majority of his subjects, and which have dimmed his fair fame with posterity many causes combined to sadden and depress the king's heart as he felt old age creeping upon him providence had not blessed him with a son and while his younger rival clovis left four martial sons to defend and also to partition his newly formed kingdom theodoric's daughter amala suentha was the only child born of his marriage with clovis's sister in order to provide himself with a male heir for the customs of the Goths did not favour, if they did not actually exclude, female sovereignty, Theodoric summoned to his court a distant relative, a young man named Eutheric, descended from the mighty Hermanric, who was at the time living in Spain. Eutheric, who was well reported of for bodily vigour and for statesmanlike ability, came to the Ostrogothic court, married Amala Suentha, 515, four years afterwards received the honour of a consulship which he held along with the emperor justin and exhibited games and combats of wild beasts to the populace of rome and ravenna on a scale of unsurpassed magnificence but he died probably soon after his consulship leaving two children a boy and a girl and thus theodoric's hope of bequeathing his crown to a mature and masculine heir was disappointed still however he would not propose a female ruler to his old Gothic comrades, and the little grandson, Athalaric, though under ten years of age, 
was solemnly presented by him to an assembly of gothic counts and the nobles of the nation as their king the proclamation of athalaric was made when the king felt that he should shortly depart this life probably in the summer of 526. I have mentioned it here in order to complete my statement as to the succession to the throne, but we will now return to an earlier period, to the events which immediately followed Eutharic's consulship. Coming as he did from Spain, the Visigothic lords of which were still an aristocracy of bitter Arians in the midst of a cowed but Catholic Roman population, Eutharic, who, as we are expressly told, was too harsh and hostile to the Catholic faith, may have to some extent swayed the mind of his father-in-law away from its calm balance of even-handed justice between the rival churches. But the state of affairs at Constantinople exercised a yet more powerful influence. Anastasius, who though no Arian, had during his long reign been always in an attitude of hostility towards the papal see, was now dead and had been succeeded by justin this man a soldier of fortune who had as a lad tramped down from the macedonian highlands into the capital with a wallet of biscuit over his shoulder for his only property had risen by his soldierly qualities to the position of count of the guardsmen and by a judicious distribution of gold among the soldiers gold which was not his own but had been entrusted to him for safe keeping he won for himself the diadem and for his nephew as it turned out the opportunity of making his name forever memorable in history justin was absolutely illiterate the story about the stenciled signature is told of him as well as of theodoric but he was strictly orthodox and his heart was set on a reconciliation with the roman see this measure was also viewed with favour by the majority of the populace of Constantinople, with whom the heterodoxy of Anastasius had become decidedly unpopular. Thus the negotiations for a settlement of the dispute went prosperously forward. The anathemas which were insisted upon by the Roman pontiff were soon conceded. The names of Zeno, of Anastasius, and of five patriarchs of Constantinople, who had dared to dissent from the Roman see, were struck out of the diptychs, or lists of those men, living or dead, whom the church regarded as belonging to her communion. And thus the first great schism between the eastern and western churches, a schism which had lasted for thirty-five years, was ended it was probably foreseen by the statesmen of ravenna that this reconciliation between pope and emperor a reconciliation which had been celebrated by the enthusiastic shout of the multitude in the great church of the divine wisdom at constantinople would sooner or later bring trouble to theodoric's arian fellow worshippers in point of fact however an interval of nearly six years elapsed before any actual persecution of the arians of the empire was attempted the first cause of the alienation between the Ostrogothic king and his Catholic subjects seems to have arisen in connection with the Jews. Theodoric, on account of some fear of invasion by the barbarians beyond the Alps, was dwelling at Verona. That city, the scene of his most desperate battle with Odovacar, commanding as it does the valley of the adige and the road by the brenner pass into the tyrol was probably looked upon by theodoric as the key of northeastern italy and when there was any danger of invasion rather than in the safer but less convenient ravenna there too he may probably have often received the ambassadors of the northern nations who went back to their homes with those stories of the might and majesty of the ostrogothic king which made dietrich of bern theodoric of verona a name of wonder and a theme of romance to many generations of german minstrels while theodoric was dwelling in the city of the adige tidings came to him apparently from his son-in-law eutharic whom he had left in charge at ravenna that the whole city was in an uproar the jews of whom there was evidently a considerable number were accused of having made sport of the christian rite of baptism by throwing one another into one of the two muddy rivers of ravenna and also in some way not described to us to have mocked at the supper of the lord 
the christian populace of the city were excited to such madness by these rumours that they broke out into rioting which neither the gothic vice-regent eutheric nor their own bishop peter the third was able to quell and which did not cease till all the jewish synagogues of the city were laid in ashes when tidings of these events were brought to verona by the grand chamberlain trivan or triguila who as an arian was suspected of favouring the jews and when the hebrews came themselves to invoke the justice of the king theodoric's righteous indignation was kindled against these flagrant violations of civilitas it was not indeed the first time that his intervention had been claimed on behalf of the persecuted children of israel at milan and at genoa they had already appealed to him against the vexations of their neighbours and at rome the mob excited by some idle story of harsh punishments inflicted by the jews on their christian servants had burned their synagogue in the trastevere to the ground the protection claimed had always been freely conceded theodoric while expressing or permitting cassiodorus to express his pious wonder that a race which wilfully shut itself out from the eternal rest of heaven should care for quietness on earth was strong in declaring that for the sake of civilitas justice was to be secured even for the wanderers from the right religious path and that no one should be forced to believe in christianity against his will nor was this willingness to protect the jews from popular fanaticism peculiar to theodoric always so long as the goths either the western or eastern branch remained arian the jews found favour in their eyes and jacob had rest under the shadow of the sons of odin now therefore the king sent an edict addressed to eutheric and bishop peter ordaining that a pecuniary contribution should be levied on all the christian citizens of ravenna out of which the synagogues should be rebuilt and that those who were not able to pay their share of this contribution should be flogged through the streets the crier going behind them and in a loud voice proclaiming their offence the order was doubtless obeyed but from that day there was a secret spirit of rebellion in the hearts of the roman citizens of ravenna from this time onward occasions of difference between theodoric and his roman subjects were frequently arising for some reason which is not explained to us he ordered the catholic church of st stephen in the suburbs of verona to be destroyed then came suspicion the child of rancour an order was put forth forbidding the inhabitants of roman origin to wear any arms and this prohibition extended even to pocket knives in the excited state of men's minds earth and heaven seemed to them to be full of portents there were earthquakes there was a comet with a fiery tail which blazed for fifteen days a poor gothic woman lay down under a portico near theodoric's palace at ravenna and gave birth so we are assured to four dragons two of which having one head between them were captured while the other two sailing away eastward through the clouds were seen to fall headlong into the sea more important than these old wives fables was the changed attitude and the wavering loyalty of the roman senate from the remarks made in an earlier chapter it will be clear that a conscientious roman citizen might truly feel that he owed a divided allegiance to the ostrogoth his ruler de facto and to the augustus at constantinople his sovereign de jure through the years of religious schism this conflict of duties had slumbered but now with the enthusiastic reconciliation between the see of rome and the throne of constantinople it awoke and in that age when as has been already said religion was nationality an orthodox eastern emperor seemed a much more fitting object of homage than an arian italian king there were two men united by the ties of kindred who seemed marked out by character and position as the leaders of a patriotic party in the senate if such a party could be formed these men were boethius and his father-in-law symmachus both roman nobles of the great and ancient anician gens boethius whose name we have already met with as the skilful mechanic who was requested to construct a water clock and a sundial for the king of the burgundians was a man of great and varied accomplishments philosopher 
theologian, musician, and mathematician. He had translated thirty books of Aristotle into Latin for the benefit of his countrymen. His treatise on music was for many centuries the authoritative exposition of the science of harmony. He had held the high honour of the consulship in 510. Twelve years later, he had the yet higher honour of seeing his two sons, Symmachus and Boethius, though mere lads, arrayed in the trabea of the consul. Symmachus, the other leader of the patriotic party in the Roman Senate, had memories of illustrious ancestors behind him. A century before, another Symmachus had been the standard-bearer of the old pagan party and had delivered two great orations in order to prevent the Christian emperors from removing the venerable altar of victory from the Senate House. Now his descendant and namesake was an equally firm adherent of Christianity, a friend and counsellor of popes, a man who was willing to encounter obloquy and even death in behalf of Nicene orthodoxy. He had been consul so long ago as in the reign of Odovacar. He had been an illustrious prefect of the city under Theodoric. He was now patrician and chief of the senate, Caput Senatus. The last two titles conferred honour rather than power, the headship of the senate especially being generally held by the oldest, and if not by the oldest, by the most esteemed and venerated member of that body. Such was Symmachus, a man full of years and honours, a historian, an orator, and a generous contributor of some portion of his vast wealth for the adornment of his native city. Boethius, left an orphan in childhood, had enjoyed the wise training of his guardian Symmachus. When he came to man's estate, he married that guardian's daughter, Rusticiana. Though there was the difference of a generation between them, a close friendship united the old and the middle-aged senators, and the young consuls sprung from this alliance, who were the hope of their blended lines, bore, as we have seen, the names of both father and grandfather. Up to the year 523, Boethius appears to have enjoyed to the full the favour of Theodoric. From a chapter of his autobiography, we learn that he had already often opposed the ministers of the crown when he found them to be unjust and rapacious men. How often, says he, have I met the rush of Cunigast when coming open-mouthed to devour the substance of the poor? How often have I baffled the all but completed schemes of injustice prepared by the Chamberlain Triguila? How often have I interposed my influence to protect the unhappy men whom the unpunished avarice of the barbarians was worrying with infinite calumnies? Paulinus, a man of consular rank, whose wealth the hungry dogs of the palace had already devoured in fancy, I dragged, as it were, out of their very jaws. But all these acts of righteous remonstrance against official tyranny, though from the names given they seem to have been chiefly directed against Gothic ministers, had not forfeited for Boethius the favour of his sovereign. The proof of this is furnished by the almost unexampled honour conferred upon him, certainly with Theodoric's consent, by the elevation of his two sons to the consulship. The exultant father, from his place in the senate, expressed his thanks to Theodoric in an oration of panegyric which is now no longer extant, but was considered by contemporaries a masterpiece of brilliant rhetoric. So far, all had gone well with the fortunes of Boethius. But now, perhaps about the middle of 523, there came a great and calamitous change. We must revert for a few minutes to the family circumstances of Theodoric, in order to understand the influences which were embittering his spirit against his Catholic, that is to say, his Roman subjects. The year before, his grandson Segeric the Burgundian had been treacherously assassinated by order of his father, King Sigismund, who had become a convert to the Orthodox creed, and after the death of Theodoric's daughter, had married a Catholic woman of low origin. In the year 523 itself, 
Thrasamund, king of the Vandals, died and was succeeded by his cousin Hilderic, son of one of the most ferocious persecutors of the Catholic Church, but himself a convert to her creed. Notwithstanding an oath which Hilderic had sworn to his predecessor on his deathbed, never to use his royal power for the restoration of the churches to Catholics, Hilderic had recalled the bishops of the Orthodox party and was in all things reversing the bitter persecuting policy of his ancestors. Amala Frida, the sister of Theodoric and widow of Thrasamund, who had been for nearly twenty years queen of the Vandals, passionately resented this undoing of her dead husband's work and put herself at the head of a party of insurgents who called in the aid of Moorish barbarians, but who were, notwithstanding that aid, defeated by the soldiers of Hilderic at Capsa. Amala Frida herself was taken captive and shut up in prison, probably about the middle of 523. Thus everywhere the Aryan League, of which Theodoric had been the head and which had practically given him the hegemony of Teutonic Europe, was breaking down, and in its collapse disaster and violent death were coming upon the members of Theodoric's own family. If Eutheric himself, as seems probable, had died before this time and was no longer at the king's side to whisper distrust of the Catholics at every step and to put the worst construction on the actions of every patriotic Roman, yet even Eutheric's death increased the difficulties of Theodoric's position and his doubts as to the future fortunes of a dynasty which would be represented at his death by only a woman and a child and these difficulties and doubts bred in him not depression but an irascible and suspicious temper which had hitherto been altogether foreign to his calm and noble nature such was the state of things at the court of ravenna when in the summer or early autumn of five twenty three Cyprian, reporter in the king's court, accused the patrician Albinus of sending letters to the emperor Justin hostile to the royal rule of Theodoric. Of the character and history of Albinus, notwithstanding his eminent station, we know but little. He was not only patrician, but illustrious, that is, in modern phraseology, he had held an office of cabinet rank. On the occasion of some quarrel between the factions of the circus, Theodoric had graciously ordered him to assume the patronage of the green faction and to conduct the election of a pantomimic performer for that party. He had also received permission to erect workshops overlooking the forum on its northern side, on condition that his buildings did not in any way interfere with public convenience or the beauty of the city evidently he was a man of wealth and high position one of the great nobles of rome but perhaps one who up to this time had not taken any very prominent part in public affairs his accuser cyprian still apparently a young man was also a roman nobleman his father had been consul and he himself held at this time the post of referendarius or as i have translated it reporter in the king's court of appeal his ordinary duty was to ascertain from the suitor what was the nature of his plea to state it to the king and then to draw up the document which contained the king's judgment it was an arduous office to ascertain from the florid and often trembling suitor in the midst of the hubbub of the court the precise nature of his complaint and a responsible one to express the king's judgment neither less nor more in the written decree there was evidently great scope for corrupt conduct in both capacities if the referendarius was open to bribes and in the formula by which these officers were appointed some stress is laid on the necessity of their keeping a pure conscience in the exercise of their functions Cyprian seems to have been a man of nimble and subtle intellect, who excelled in his statement of a case. So well was this done by him, from the two opposite points of view, that plaintiff and defendant in turn were charmed to hear each his own version of the case so admirably presented to the king. Of later years, Theodoric, weary of sitting in state in the crowded hall of justice, had often tried his cases on horseback. 
riding forth into the forest he had ordered cyprian to accompany him and to state in his own lively and pleasing style the for and against of the various causes that came before him on appeal even we are told when theodoric was roused to anger by the manifest injustice of the plea that was thus presented he could not help being charmed by the graceful manner in which the young referendarius the temporary asserter of the claim brought it under his notice thus trained to subtle eloquence cyprian had been recently sent on an embassy to constantinople and had there shown himself in the word fence a match for the keenest of the greeks lately returned as it should seem from this embassy he came forward in the roman senate and accused the patrician albinus of outstepping the bounds of loyalty to the ostrogothic king in the letters which he had addressed to the byzantine emperor in this accusation was cyprian acting the part of an honest man or of a base informer the times were difficult the relations of a roman senator to emperor and king were as i have striven to show intricate and ill-defined it was hard even for good men to know on which side preponderated the obligations of loyalty of honour and of patriotism on the one hand cyprian may have been a true and faithful servant of theodoric who had in his embassy at constantinople discovered the threads of a treasonable intrigue and who would not see his master betrayed even by romans without denouncing their treason as a real patriot he may have seen that the days of purely roman rule in italy were over that there must be some sort of amalgamation with these new teutonic conquerors who evidently had the empire of the world before them that it would be better and happier and in a certain sense more truly roman for italy to be ruled by a heroic king of the goths and romans than for her to sink into a mere province ruled by exarchs and logothetes from corrupt and distant constantinople this is one possible view of cyprian's character and purposes on the other hand he may have been a slippery adventurer intent on carving out his own fortune by whatever means and willing to make the dead bodies of the noblest of his countrymen stepping-stones of his own ambition in his secret heart he may have cared nothing for the noble old goth his master with whom he had so often ridden in the pine wood nothing too for the great name of rome the city in which his father had once sat as consul long accustomed to state both sides of a case with equal dexterity and without any belief in either this nimble-tongued advocate who had already found that greece had nothing to teach him that was new may have had in his inmost soul no belief in god in country or in duty but in cyprian alone both views are possible we have before us only the passionate invectives of his foes and the stereotyped commendations of his virtues penned by his official superiors and i will not attempt to decide between them when cyprian brought his charge of disloyalty against albinus the accused patrician who was called into the presence of the king at once denied the accusation an angry debate probably followed in the course of which boethius claimed to speak the attention of all men was naturally fixed upon him for by the king's favour the same favour which in the preceding year had raised his two sons to the consulship he was now filling the great place of master of the offices false said boethius in loud impassioned tones is the accusation of cyprian but whatever albinus did i and the whole senate of rome with one purpose did the same the charge is false o king theodoric the interposition of boethius was due to a noble and generous impulse but it was not perhaps wise in view of all that had passed and without in any way helping albinus it involved boethius in his ruin cyprian thus challenged included the master of the offices in his accusation and certain persons not goths but romans and men of senatorial rank opilio the brother of cyprian basilius and gordentius came forward and laid information against boethius here the reader will naturally ask of what did these informers accuse him but to that question it is not possible to give a satisfactory answer 
he himself in his meditations on his trial says of what crime is it that i am accused i am said to have desired the safety of the senate in what way you may ask i am accused of having prevented an informer from producing certain documents in order to prove the senate guilty of high treason shall i deny the charge but i did wish for the safety of the senate and shall never cease to wish for it nor though they have abandoned me can i consider it a crime to have desired the safety of that venerable order that posterity may know the truth and the real sequence of events i have drawn up a written memorandum concerning the whole affair for as for these forged letters upon which is founded the accusation against me of having hoped for roman freedom why should i say anything about them their falsehood would have been made manifest if i could have used the confession of the informers themselves which in all such affairs is admitted to have the greatest weight as for roman freedom what hope is left to us of attaining that would that there were any such hope had the king questioned me i would have answered in the words of canius when he was questioned by the emperor caligula as to his complicity in a conspiracy formed against him if i said he had known thou shouldst never have known these words coupled with some bitter statements as to the tainted character of the informers against him men oppressed by debt and accused of peculation constitute the only statement of his case by boethius which is now available the memorandum so carefully prepared in the long hours of his imprisonment has not reached posterity would that it might even yet be found in the library of some monastery or lurking as a palimpsest under the dull commentary of some mediaeval divine it could hardly fail to throw a brilliant if not uncoloured light on the politics of italy in the sixth century but trying as we best may to spell out the truth of the affair from the passionate complaints of the prisoner i think we may discern that there had been some correspondence on political affairs between the senate and the emperor justin correspondence which was perfectly regular and proper if the emperor was still to them dominus noster our lord and master but which was kept from the knowledge of the king of the goths and romans and which when he heard of it he was sure to resent as an act of treachery to himself that boethius the master of the offices under theodoric should have connived at this correspondence naturally exasperated the master who had so lately heaped favours on this disloyal servant he used the power which he wielded as master of the offices that is head of the whole civil service of italy to prevent some documents which would have compromised the safety of the senate from coming to the knowledge of theodoric all this was dangerous and doubtful work and though we may find it hard to condemn boethius drawn as he was in opposite directions by the claims of historic patriotism and by those of official duty we can hardly wonder that theodoric who felt his throne and his dynasty menaced should have judged with some severity the minister who had thus betrayed his confidence the political charge against boethius was blended with one of another kind to us almost unintelligible a charge of sacrilege and necromancy at least this seems to be the only possible explanation of the following words written by him my accusers saw that the charge of desiring the safety of the senate was no crime but rather a merit and therefore in order to darken it by the mixture of some kind of wickedness they falsely declared that ambition for office had led me to pollute my conscience with sacrilege but philosophy had chased from my breast all desire of worldly greatness and under the eyes of her who had daily instilled into my mind the pythagorean maxim follow god there was no place for sacrilege nor was it likely that i should seek the guardianship of the meanest of spirits when divine philosophy had formed and moulded me into the likeness of god the friendship of my father-in-law the venerable simacus ought alone to have shielded me from the suspicion of such a crime but alas 
it was my very love for philosophy that exposed me to this accusation and they thought that i was of kin to sorcerers because i was steeped in philosophic teachings the only reasonable explanation that we can offer of these words is that medieval superstition was already beginning to cast her shadow over europe that already great mechanical skill such as boethius was reputed to possess when his king asked him to manufacture the water clock and the sundial caused its possessor to be suspected of unholy familiarity with the evil one perhaps also that astronomy which was evidently the favourite study of boethius was perilously near to astrology and that his zeal in its pursuit may have exposed him to some of the penalties which the theodosian code itself the law book of imperial rome denounced against the mathematicians this seems to be all that now can be done towards rewriting the lost indictment under which boethius was accused the trial was conducted with an outrageous disregard of the forms of justice it took place in the senate house at rome boethius was apparently languishing in prison at pavia where he had been arrested along with albinus thus at a distance of more than four hundred miles from his accusers and his judges was the life of this noble roman unheard and undefended sworn away on obscure and preposterous charges by a process which was the mere mockery of a trial he was sentenced to death and the confiscation of his property and the judges whose trembling lips pronounced the monstrous sentence were the very senators whose cause he had tried to serve this thought the remembrance of this base ingratitude planted the sharpest sting of all in the breast of the condemned patriot it is evident that the senate themselves were in desperate fear of the newly awakened wrath of theodoric and the fact that they found boethius guilty cannot be considered as in any degree increasing the probability of the truth of the charges made against him but it does perhaps somewhat lessen his reputation for far-seeing statesmanship since it shows how thoroughly base and worthless was the body for whose sake he sacrificed his loyalty to the new dynasty how utterly unfit the senate would have been to take its old place as ruler of italy if byzantine emperor and ostrogothic king could have been blotted out of the political firmament boethius seems to have spent some months in prison after his trial and was perhaps transferred from pavia to the agere calventianus a few miles from milan there at any rate he was confined when the messenger of death sent by theodoric found him there is some doubt as to the mode of execution adopted one pretty good contemporary authority says that he was beheaded but the writer whom i have chiefly followed who was almost a contemporary but a credulous one says that torture was applied that a cord was twisted round his forehead till his eyes started from their sockets and that finally in the midst of his torments he received the coup de grace from a club in the interval which elapsed between the condemnation and the death of this noble man who died verily as a martyr for the great memories of rome he had time to compose a book which exercised a powerful influence on many of the most heroic spirits of the middle ages this book the well-known if not now often read consolation of philosophy was translated into english by king alfred and by geoffrey chaucer was imitated by sir thomas moore whose history in some respects resembles that of boethius and was translated into every tongue and found in every convent library of medieval europe there is a great charm the charm of sadness about many of its pages and it may be considered from one point of view as the swan song of the dying roman world and the dying greek philosophy or from another as the book of job of the new medieval world which was to be born from the death of rome for like the book of job the consolation is chiefly occupied with a discussion of the eternal mystery why a righteous and almighty ruler of the world permits bad men to flourish and increase while the righteous are crushed beneath their feet and as in the book of job so here the question is not probably because it cannot be fully answered it is the consolation of philosophy not of religion 
or at any rate not of revealed religion which is here administered so marked is the silence of boethius on all those arguments which a discussion of this kind inevitably suggests to the mind of a believer in the crucified one that scholars long supposed that he was not even by profession a christian a manuscript which has been lately discovered seems to prove beyond a doubt that boethius was a christian and wrote orthodox treatises on disputed points of theology but for some reason or other he fell back on his early philosophical studies rather than on his formal and conventional christianity when he found himself in the deep waters of adversity and imminent death he represents himself in the consolation as lying on his dungeon couch sick in body and sad at heart and courting the muses as companions of his solitude they come at his call but are soon unceremoniously dismissed by one nobler than themselves who asserts an older and higher right to cheer her votary in the day of his calamity this is philosophy a woman of majestic stature whose head seems to touch the skies and who has undying youth and venerable age mysteriously blended in her countenance having dismissed the muses she sits by the bedside of boethius and looks with sad and earnest eyes into his face she invites him to pour out his complaints she sings to him songs first of pity and reproof then of fortitude and hope she reasons with him as to the instability of the gifts of fortune and strives to lead him to the contemplation of the summum bonum which is god himself the knowledge of whom is the highest happiness then in order a little to lighten his difficulties as to the permission of evil by the all-wise and almighty one she enters into a discussion of the relation between divine foreknowledge and human free will but this discussion a thorny and difficult one is not ended when the book comes to an abrupt conclusion being probably interrupted by the arrival of the messengers of theodoric who brought the warrant for the writer's execution the consolation of philosophy is partly in prose partly in verse the prose is generally strong clear and comparatively pure in style wonderfully superior to the vapid diffusiveness of cassiodorus and most writers of the age the interspersed poems are sometimes in hexameters but more often in the shorter lines and more varied metres of horace and are to some extent founded upon the tragic choruses of seneca it is of course impossible in this place to give any adequate account of so important a work and one of such far-reaching influence as the consolation but the following translation of one of the poems in which the prisoner makes his moan to the almighty may give the reader some little idea of the style and matter of the treatise the harmony of the natural world the discord of the moral world o thou who hast made this starry whole who has fixed on high thy throne who biddest the blue above us roll and who sway the planet's own at thy bidding she turns the changing moon to her brother her full-fed fire dimming the stars with her light which soon wanes as she draws to him nigher thou givest the word and the westering star the hesper who watched o'er night's upspringing changing his course shines eastward far phosphor now for the sun's inbringing when the leaves fall fast neath autumn's blast thou shortenest the reign of light in radiant june thou scatterest soon the fast-flown hours of night the leaves which fled from the cruel north are with zephyr's breath returning and from seeds which the bear saw dropped in earth springs the corn for the dog-stars burning thus all stands fast by thine old decree nothing wavers in nature's plan in all her changes she bows to thee yea all stands fast but man o oh, why is the wheel of fortune rolled while guilt thy vengeance shuns why sit the bad on their thrones of gold and trample thine holy ones why doth virtue skulk where none may see in the great world's corners dim and the just man mark the knave go free while the penalty falls on him no storm the perjurer's soul o'erwhelms serene the false one stands 
he flatters and kings of mighty realms are as clay in his moulding hands o ruler look on these lives of ours thus dashed on fortune's sea thou rulest the calm eternal powers but thine handiwork too are we ah quell these waves with their tossings high let them own thy bound and ban and as thou rulest the starry sky rule also the world of man End of chapter 13